the end times revealed like never before. The opening of end time scriptures revealed, updated August 7, 2024, from Genesis to Revelation. All rights reserved. Reproduction and use of this book is limited to those expressed by the author noted on the permission given page. Please reference these permissions for use, reproduction, and distribution. Because of the dynamic nature of the internet, any web addresses or links contained in this book may have changed since publication and may no longer be valid. All scripture quoted in this work are from the King James Version. Scripture quotations from the authorized King James Version. Rights in the authorized version in the United Kingdom are vested in the Crown. Reproduced by permission of the Crown's patentee, Cambridge University Press. Permission given. I believe this book is going to be crucial to those who will have been left behind. Which is why I say to all those reading this before the tribulation has begun, that if you can, send copies to family, friends, and churches. Whether it be in a physical book form, ebook, or PDF printed, you have my permission to get and make copies, but never to make changes to it or make any money from it. Our purpose for placing it on Amazon is for a wider global audience that our ministry on its own may otherwise never have reached. The more people are made aware of this information, the more will be able to prepare themselves and help others. Dedication. First and foremost, not only this book, but also the ministry that began about 3.5 years ago, is dedicated to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, by the will of the Father and the leading of the Holy Spirit. Use it, Lord, for your will. I love you and thank you. To my very patient, loving and beautiful wife, Winnie, or Win. We often hear about how the supporting spouse was strong and patient. You absolutely were and are. However, it went beyond just this book to be completed over a period of three weeks, which in itself is incredible. It all goes back to the beginning when we met and were married 20 years ago. You are the love of my life. Within minutes of meeting you for the first time, I knew I was going to marry you. It was most certainly another spirit-led moment in my life. Thank you, babe. I love you. To my two kind, loving, and beautiful children in the Lord, my son, Ocean, and daughter, Elena, thank you for being such good and easy kids. You have not only been a blessing in our lives, but in your goodness have made our job as parents easier. I love you both very much. To my mother, Lise, I love you very much and thank you for everything, especially your prayers. To my sister, Mona, I love you and thank you for being there when needed. A special thanks to my brother in Christ, Jimmy, without his last minute prompting to get this important book done for the world to have access to, as well as his artistic skills in designing it it truly would never have happened. The Lord knows we often work better when the pressure is on. This was most certainly demonstrated in having finished everything within three weeks, never having written or designed a book before. Thank you for all the work you did for the Lord on the website as well. It has been a great blessing to tens of thousands of people worldwide. Love you, brother. To my dear sister in Christ, Pietra. If it was not for the fact that we knew you were a writer, because of your books we share on the website, I feel we would have been dead in the water upon trying to begin. As you now know, I am a terrible writer, but with your God-given skills we were able to make this happen. I may know how to say and show the words, but you certainly made them readable for the world. I love you and thank you. To another sister in Christ, Trisha. Thank you for your finishing touches to help us get it out to the world as quickly as possible upon completion. The timing was crucial for the time we are in. Much love to you always. And finally, to all you 14ers around the world. Those I know and those I have never met, you have all had a part in making this happen. Whether in prayers for the ministry, some incredible intercessions along the way, support that helped keep it going, or sharing what you have come to understand in the revelations with others. Thank you all from the bottom of my heart. I love you and pray for you and your families. I look forward to meeting you all very soon. God bless. Sincerely, Alain Dubrol. Introduction, A New Journey of Revelation. Prior to the spring of 2017, I had not yet made any videos, and from that point to when everything changed, I had only made a few that were simply from a desire to be part of doing something for the kingdom of God, to hopefully help others come to know our Lord and Savior. 
But where this ministry officially started for me was on September 8, 2017. It was during a video I was making when the Spirit arrested my attention with some scriptures that made me question my end-time understanding. On that day, everything changed, and a whole new journey of revelation followed. Once I finished that video, things started to slot in their proper place, and that which did not make sense before started to make perfect sense. Scriptures, never before truly understood in relation to the end-time understanding, began to reveal themselves to me, just as Daniel 12 or 4 said would happen, that the books were sealed until the time of the end. I can now say, the books have opened. Scripture after scripture, with answers to questions I did not even know were questions, right from Genesis to Revelation, and it kept on revealing the end-time plan and the glory of God. This truly is a revealing ministry by the grace of God, and all the glory and honor goes to the Most High God. I would like to mention that all scriptures quoted in this book are the King James Version. Now, let me begin with what I'm going to call a statement of understanding, and the reason for it is important. It is the understanding of the 70th year. You are going to see it mentioned on many pages throughout this book, not because of the same verse being repeated over and over, but because it is everywhere in Scripture when talking about the end times. For a very long time, there had been teachings about when the 70 years of Israel would come, the end times would be upon the world. But the 70th year, according to most biblical scholars' understanding, has come and gone. It is believed by the world to have been May 2018. And yet it hasn't begun? Daniel 9.2 in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years, whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish seventy years in the desolations of Jerusalem, 2 Chronicles 36, 21, first, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath, to fulfill threescore and ten years. However, the Lord's counting is not our counting when it comes to His land. There has been a very important piece of Scripture that has been missed by just about all who have taught on end times, and is the reason none of them mention the importance of the 70th year in their talks anymore. They have not yet understood how the Lord God counts it. But He does tell us, Leviticus 19, 23-24, 23, And when ye shall come into the land, and shall have planted all manner of trees for food, then ye shall count the fruit thereof as uncircumcised. Three years shall it be as uncircumcised unto you, it shall not be eaten of. But in the fourth year all the fruit thereof shall be holy to praise the Lord withal. And in the fifth year shall ye eat of the fruit thereof, that it may yield unto you the increase thereof. I am the Lord your God. The answer is revealed in these verses. However, it's not quite complete. You'll understand when I address this a little later on in full in the chapter on Daniel. As Proverbs 25, 2 says, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. I would like to start with a prayer for the readers of this book before we embark on this journey together. This book is not just for the purpose of informing you of the things that you can expect to happen in their seasons but also about knowing that there is a hope even in the midst of tribulation. God is using this time as a judgment on the sleeping church and the world to bring them back to Him because of His desire for all His children to come home. And because He is holy, He expects us to live in obedience to Him and to love Him with all our heart, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Sadly, as quoted, it sometimes takes tribulation for the church to be the church as God intended. If you are one of those left behind, know that it is often in His judgment that He extends His mercy. When you call out to Him, He promised that He will hear your cry and answer you. This book will also, when given to others to read, wake up the church not only to the judgment on sin and this world, but also to let them know that He will be back to gather His children and that they should have their garments ready. I encourage you to share this book as much as possible. Father, I ask and pray that the anointing of your Spirit will be on each reader and all who will hear the words being taught, that you will give them wisdom, knowledge, understanding, 
and discernment. Let them know that this book is a gift because of your mercy and love for them. Let the truth of the Lord's end-time words being revealed in this book be received as a blessing in love. I pray that they will search your word and not be quick to dismiss what is written. You promise that your Spirit will guide them in all truth and that he will remind them of all Jesus has said. Thank you that you will do this for them. I pray that you will lift the veil from their understanding with hearts ready to receive that which you personally want to reveal to them, not just about the end times, which is also you, but about all of you, because to know you is eternal life. May they see you in the pages and be drawn closer to you. Amen. This book has been designed to allow you space to make notes as you study, because you'll need it. Chapter 1. Who the Gospels are speaking to. In this chapter, we will show the comparisons between each gospel to give the supporting evidence of the truth being revealed. The introduction to who the gospels are speaking to was the first great revelation that began on September 8, 2017, and it has continued to reveal itself ever since. You will begin to understand once and for all the mystery of who the synoptic gospels truly speak to in the end times and why it matters more than ever, especially in this present time. Having been taught the end times from mainly the Gospel of Matthew's perspective has unfortunately hindered our greater understanding of the end of days, causing us to have literally missed half of the tribulation time frame. As you read the first three Gospels, you will likely see countless similarities. However, a closer reading reveals some differences in the details. Are these differences the same as contradictions, and what would be the reason for them being there? Are the Gospels reliable if certain details are different from each other? God's Word is perfect. There can be no contradiction. God cannot lie. Everything the Scriptures say is completely true. While Christians recognize this truth, we also understand that if you put the four Gospels side by side, you would discover incongruities, which we cannot deny. A perceptive reader might ask, what is going on here? Did it happen that way or that way? The reason for the differences and apparent contradictions are in fact that the Synoptic Gospels are speaking to different people groups. A brief summary of the Gospels of Luke, Mark, and Matthew. Luke, the Gospel of Luke, or simply Luke, tells of the origins, birth, ministry, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. Together with the Acts of the Apostles, it makes up a two-volume work which scholars call Luke, Acts, and together they account for 27.5% of the New Testament. Most modern scholars agree that the traditional view is that it was Luke, the evangelist and companion of Paul, who was the author of the Gospel of Luke. Written to a Greek-speaking audience, but directing his attention specifically to Christian concerns rather than to the Greco-Roman world at large. A very important verse is found in the third verse of the first chapter that lays the foundation of the importance of why the Gospel of Luke is so important. Luke 1 3. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. This verse states that Luke had perfect understanding, which I am sure you will agree is quite a bold statement. He also says that he is writing in order. This should cause us to take note of what is said and in what order. Mark. The Gospel of Mark is the second of the four canonical Gospels and of the three synoptic Gospels. Mark was the companion of the Apostle Peter. Most scholars date it to just after 70 CE when Titus, a Roman general and subsequently emperor, destroyed the temple. It was written in Greek for a Gentile audience, written to strengthen the faith of those who already believed, not to convert unbelievers. Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. Matthew seems to emphasize that the Jewish tradition should not be lost in a church that was increasingly becoming Gentile. He wrote his Gospel to convince fellow Jews that Jesus was the Messiah foretold in the Old Testament, written from a Jewish viewpoint for a Jewish audience. The internal evidence of this is so overwhelming that it is often called the Gospel for the Jews. It uses the distinctly Hebraic formula, Kingdom of Heaven, where the other books in the New Testament speak only of the Kingdom of God. It is very important to note that even though the Gospel of Matthew was written for the Jews, 
almost all the pastors base their theology and eschatology on the Gospel of Matthew, leaving out of consideration the role the Gospels of Mark and Luke play. Almost as if they have no real relevance to the end times and are more like a side note, but in actual fact, taking all the synoptic Gospels into consideration makes all the difference to our end-time understanding. This is probably a good scripture to start this off with. Matthew 20, 16. So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. This is literally letting us know that in the end, those who were first shall be last, and those who were last shall be first. So with this in mind, out of the synoptic Gospels, who would then be first? Luke, followed by Mark, and finally Matthew. Without trying to say too much here, and causing you to scratch your head with questions before we even begin, let me explain it in one simple sentence, so that you begin to get into the mindset of the Revelation. And then let all the evidence that follows prove it to you. Luke was written to the Gentile bride, Mark to the left-behind church, and Matthew to the Jews. With that in mind, you will now begin to understand what follows and see how Luke's group is removed before the tribulation even begins. Leaving both Mark and Matthew's groups, as you will see, to endure portions of the tribulation. This brings us back to what I said a moment ago, how having been taught from Matthew's point of view for the end times has caused half of the tribulation to be missed in its understanding. Isaiah 46, 10 declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. I debated whether I should put this next piece right here at the start or not. But as you can see, I did, and the reason I did was to again help set your thoughts for the revelation of these Gospels you are about to understand. Because with just about everyone who is going to be reading this, it will be the first time, after a lifetime, of having been taught everything from Matthew's perspective. Matthew comes last, not first. This means that you have, without knowing it, been taught the end times from the end. I promise you that what you are about to understand here in this book, and especially from this chapter, is going to reveal to you mysteries of the end times that you have been trying to understand for a very long time. Questions will be answered, and even if not all your questions are answered, you will now have understanding to seek them out yourself. And this is to whom the Gospels are speaking. Luke, escape of the Bride of Christ, pre-trib, before the seals begin. Mark, rapture of the left behind, great multitude, mid-trib, end of seals. Matthew, second coming, Jews, post-trib, Jacob's trouble, trumpets. Redemption, tribulation, and great tribulation in Scripture. The Word of God is full of clues that we often miss, especially if we do not know even where to begin. But Father has provided various means to search out His Word and individual words much easier now by means of the internet. The blueletterbible.org site and eSword free app are very good sources to grasp a deeper understanding of what individual words mean with the use of the Strong's Concordance word definitions and to get a panoramic view of scripture. In these studies, you will see how great these tools have been in helping us reveal, in many cases, what a word actually means, especially compared to what we simply thought it meant as we read it. Let's get started with these important words, redemption, salvation, tribulation, and great tribulation, and see specifically where they are used in relation to the three synoptic gospels, which is the focus of this chapter. Redemption. Redemption is G629, which means ransom in full, that is, figuratively, riddance, or specifically, Christian salvation, deliverance, redemption. When you search the word redemption, G629, or redeem G385, as well as the word salvation, G4991, you will see that it is found only in the Gospel of Luke and not even once in Mark or Matthew. Luke 21 28. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Romans 8 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption, G629, of our body. Those with the first fruits of the Spirit are the bride of Christ. She is the first fruits of the wheat harvest of the feasts of weeks. Luke 168, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. Luke 238, 
And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord, and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption, G3D5, in Jerusalem. Luke 1.69, And hath raised up an horn of salvation, G4991, for us in the house of his servant David, that we should be saved, G4991, from our enemies, and from the hand of all that hate us. Luke 1.77, To give knowledge of salvation, G401, unto his people by the remission of their sins. Not one word in the Bible is placed there by accident or for no reason. There is a reason why the words redemption and salvation are not found in Mark and Matthew. And the reason for this is that it shows us that the bride, Luke, will be redeemed from what is to come, whereas the left-behind church, Mark, and Jews, Matthew, will have to face tribulation. Tribulation. Tribulation, G2347, means tribulation, affliction, trouble, anguish, persecution, burdened, and to be afflicted, with G1519. When you search the word tribulation, G2347, on blueletterbible.org, it appears in the Olivet Discourses of Mark and Matthew. And the Olivet Discourses, which are only found in the Synoptic Gospels, are the literal conversations about the end times that Jesus had with his disciples after they had asked him about what the signs of his coming would be. However, not only is this word not found in Luke's Olivet Discourse, it is not found anywhere in Luke's Gospel, Mark 13, 19. For in those days shall be affliction, G2347, such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created unto this time, neither shall be, Mark 13, 24. But in those days, after that tribulation, G2347, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. Matthew 24, verse 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Matthew 24. Immediately after the tribulation, 2047, of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Great tribulation. And the term great tribulation is only found once anywhere in any gospel. Matthew 24, 21. For then shall be great tribulation, G2347, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. The word tribulation in Mark is a representation during the years of seals, and the term great tribulation only in Matthew is represented during the years of trumpets, or, as many have come to know it, Jacob's trouble. In conclusion, the words redemption, redeemed, and salvation are found only in the synoptic gospel of Luke, while the words tribulation and great tribulation are found in both Mark and Matthew. This begins to shed a little light that there appears to be something more going on with the gospels and that they may be written to different people groups. So hold on tight because from here on, it really gets detailed and interesting. Revealed in the Robe Jesus' Garment During the Crucifixion This is one of my favorites. Many of us have used this one as a way to bring up in conversation with other believers regarding the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to. It was something that had essentially gone unnoticed or certainly put on the back shelf because it was not understood. I know I had never heard of a single conversation about it until we saw it. In fact, many here, part of the online ministry, had asked their pastors about it and not one could answer them. In fact, I do not even recall hearing of one that had even noticed in their 20, 30, and some even in their 40 years of ministry that there even were different colors. You will see it right away once it is brought to your attention. But there is even more revealed to us, again in the description of the meaning of the word, for each color. You are about to understand that those colors are very descriptive as to who the Gospels are speaking to. Luke, Luke 23, 11. And Herod with his men of war set him at naught, and mocked him, and arrayed him in a gorgeous one robe, and sent him again to Pilate. Gorgeous G29886 means radiant, by analogy limpid, figuratively magnificent or sumptuous in appearance, bright, clear, gay, goodly, gorgeous, white. Notice that it is white in the same way that we expect a wedding dress to be. White also happens to be the meaning of the name Luke, G322. Lefkos, Lukos, Leokos, from Leaky, Luke, Light, White, Mart. Mark 15, 17. And they clothed him with purple, G4209, 
and plaited a crown of thorns and put it about his head. Purple G429 is of Latin origin, the purple muscle, that is, by implication, the red-blue color itself, and finally, a garment dyed with it, purple. As a side note, when we fall or have been hit or run into something, we get bruised and it turns a red-blue color or purple and it leaves a mark. Matthew 27, 28. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. Scarlet G47 is from G2848, from the kernel shape of the insect. Crimson colored, scarlet, color, colored. Now, as much as I said this is about the synoptic gospels of Luke, Mark, and Matthew, this time there is an exception. And that is because John's gospel reveals a great piece of revelation for the end times as well. John John 19, 5. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple G4210 robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. Purple G4210 is from G4209, purpureal, that is bluish red, purple. This purple G4210 in John is different from the purple G4209 in Mark. But what makes this so amazing is we see that the purple G4210 of John comes from the purple G4209 of Mark. And what makes that so interesting, you ask? In Revelation 7, after the seal judgments from chapter 6, the 144,000 are being sealed. They come from the group that is about to get raptured right after them, in the same chapter. And that group, as I explained earlier, is the great multitude. They are the rapture group of Mark at the time of the end of seals. Hence the representation of John here in this type and shadow being revealed in the robes as those having been chosen out of Mark to work during the following time of trumpets, the 44,000. Let's bring this to a close by getting back to the purple G4209 color of Mark and the scarlet G2847 color of Matthew. As we read the book of Revelation, we see the very same colors found during the tribulation period of seals and trumpets in the following scripture, further proving that these people groups will be here during the tribulation, but again, not the gorgeous G2986 of the Bride of Christ represented in Luke. Revelation 17.4 And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet 2847, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. The gorgeous white color of Jesus' robe in the Gospel of Luke is not found in the tribulation. With the evidence thus far, it is clear that both the people groups of Mark and Matthew will be here during the tribulation. The final words, spoken by Jesus on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We all know the well-known last words of Jesus on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But did you know that the word forsaken means left behind? Once again, you will find the contrast in the three synoptic gospels that shows the distinction of the three people groups of Luke, Mark, and Matthew. Luke, Luke 23, 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Jesus commended his spirit in Luke's account, which means to place alongside. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is, being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken 450 me? And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Forsaken G1459 is from G7222 and G2641, to leave behind. In both Mark and Matthew, Jesus cries out, Father, why have you left me behind? Was Jesus left behind? No. So what was the purpose of him crying out left behind in those two accounts, but yet again, not in Luke's? It clearly was not for him. And of course, in Luke, the representation of the Bride of Christ, Jesus says, Father, place me along your side. This revelation is clear and easy to grasp. So what picture are we seeing to this point? The Gentile bride, who is dearly loved and ready with her gorgeous white robe to be placed alongside the bridegroom as one would do for a wedding. And Mark and Matthew's groups are being left behind to endure their portions of judgment during the seals and trumpets, not because they have been cast away, but because they were not ready and watching for the bridegroom.
With one last effort, the Lord, in His great mercy and love for all, will use this time to wake up those left behind, so that they may understand and realize that without Him there is nothing that can save them, that they will fall on their knees and cry out to Jesus as their Lord and Savior before it is too late. The Final Instructions Given by Jesus Jesus' final instructions to His disciples to go out and do is found in the last chapter of each Gospel. There is a lot of great detail in these last chapters that reveal a lot more than what I am relaying here. However, I will go into this in a bit more detail in a later chapter. It is a great revelation and will be worth waiting for. This revelation will once again make the point of who the Gospels are speaking to. We see in the Gospels of Luke and Mark that he is instructing his disciples to go out and preach. However, in Matthew we see he does not instruct them to preach, but to teach. There is a reason for this difference, and it is once again revealed in the end-time understanding. Luke 24, 47-49 And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached, G 27, A4, in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Mark 16, 15 to 16 and 20. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach, G 2074, the gospel to every creature. 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And they went forth and preached, 20s, everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Matthew 28, 18, 20. 18. And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore, and teach three all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Twen teaching, teaching, them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. The word in Luke and Mark is preached, G2784, to herald, as a public crier, especially divine truth, the gospel. Preach, proclaim, publish. This means to proclaim, preach the gospel, which means go and tell everyone about the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. However, in Matthew, we have a very different story. He does not tell them to go out and preach, but to go and teach the world whatsoever he has commanded them. Teach, G3100, intransitively to become a pupil, transitively to disciple, that is, enroll as scholar. Be disciple, instruct, teach. Teaching, Gene 321, to learn, to teach in the same broad application. Teach. Why the change from preach to teach? As stated a moment ago, there is a lot more detail here. I will give you some of it to make this point clear. The reason he only instructs to teach here is because of the timing of Matthew, which is that he has returned feet down on the Mount of Olives. This is the reason I added verse 18 there for you as well which tells us that now all power has been given to him in heaven and on earth, as we read happens at the seventh trumpet. Revelation 11, 15, 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord, and of his Christ, and he shall reign for ever and ever. But there is more. Let's read verse 20 more closely. He tells them to teach the world the things they are to observe about him, and then goes on to tell them, And I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Why? Because he has returned. As we now know, at the seventh trumpet, Jesus will have returned and there will be no more need for preaching, because the whole world will have seen his coming when all power in heaven and earth will now be his, and he will be here reigning for the one thousand years until the end of the world. None of this is spoken about in Luke or Mark. In fact, in both of their Gospels, he is either carried up or received up into heaven. Let me briefly show you that next. Carried up, received up, returned, and staying. We see here in these last chapters, Jesus is being taken to heaven, or at least he is being taken to heaven in two of the three Gospels. Carried up, Luke 24, 51. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. Carried up, which means bear, bring, carry, lead, up. And like a bride, they are carried up over the threshold. Escape, received up, Mark 16, verse 19. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up, G3-3, into heaven 
and sat on the right hand of God. Received up, G3, which means to take up, receive up, take in unto up. And like guests who are invited to a wedding, they are received up to the banquet. Rapture, returned and staying. Matthew 28, 20, 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Jesus is here representing the people group of both Luke and Mark, who will both be taken to heaven in their portions on time. Pre-tribulation before seals, Luke, and mid-tribulation end of seals, Mark. Whereas in Matthew, there is none of this conversation, and so he is not representing a people group, it is simply him returning feet down on the Mount of Olives at the end. I am not done yet. I want to be sure you are understanding how to see and read his revelation of the end times hidden within his word for such a time as this. The abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet. The abomination of desolation, spoken of in the Olivet Discourse of Matthew 24, is a very famous scripture and prophecy, but like many other parts has been misunderstood considering its timing. You are going to see why we also find this conversation in Mark and why it is never spoken about, as well as why Luke does not mention it at all. As a refresher, I want to remind you that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. In the end times, it will be Luke, Mark, Matthew. So let's have a look at where we find it and where we do not. In Luke's discourse, we read nothing of it, but instead it tells us in the same section, Luke 21, 20, 20. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Jesus tells them here about seeing Jerusalem surrounded and to know that when they see this, Jerusalem is about to be attacked and destroyed. Desolation, G2050, from G2049, despoliation, desolation. To lay waste, literally or figuratively, bring to make desolate, come to naught. In other words, completely destroyed. But when is he telling them this? That was part of the mystery. The revelation is that it is during the Son of Man's 40 days warning, as we will read in the following section about, called the sign of Jonah. So why is the abomination not found here? Because Luke's discussion is about a short period of time, right before the tribulation years literally begin, called the 40 days of the Son of Man, after which they will have not heeded the warning and Jerusalem will be attacked. And this will now begin the tribulation. Mark 13, 14. But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand, you will see where it ought not is very different from what Matthew says. And here again the churches have simply ignored this difference in Mark. But there is another incredible revelation hidden in it. The word standing also means place, which would read to place where it ought not. And during the time of seals, it is about the sleeping church, which is still a reference to the body that we know as the temple of Christ. Making this the abomination being spoken of in Mark, the reference to the mark of the beast spoken about in Revelation 13, 16 to 17. 16. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. This mark of the beast is to be avoided at all cost, even unto death if necessary. And just as this mark will be around the time of the middle of seals, so will the mark group still be here who were left behind. And right around this time, I would say a little earlier, is when the Antichrist figure, who so many have heard about, will be given greater power to continue for 42 months, as we read in Revelation 13, verse 5. But how is it that we are told it is spoken of by Daniel? Yet both Mark and Matthew then have a reference. The answer is that Daniel speaks about it twice. It was simply never understood. Here is the one that speaks to Mark's reference. Daniel 11, 31 to 32. 31, and arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. You will note that as you read this chapter in Daniel, 
that there is all building up to this he coming who will corrupt people with flatteries and will then go on to speak terrible things against God. Daniel 11.36 And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods. This is the Antichrist when he comes into that great power. But it is very important to note that he does not claim to be God. He only magnifies himself above the little g or lowercase g gods, and he only speaks blasphemous words against God. Again, never claiming he is the uppercase g God. We read this also in Revelation 13 about him, and this is because his abomination of desolation against mankind is this coming mark of the beast everyone will be required to have in order to get food or work, as well as to have everyone worship him. But now this brings us to Matthew's version, and why, as you will see, he says, stand in the holy place. Matthew 24, 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. It certainly may sound similar, but you are about to understand it is undoubtedly not the same. Let us not forget that we are reading from Matthew's gospel and that the time of the sleeping church has ended and the rapture has already happened. We are now in the time of trumpets, and remember who had come down on Mount Zion at the end of seals. In an upcoming chapter called The Revelation of Daniel 9, you will come to understand that there will be a point when the Lord on Mount Zion will leave, because Satan will have finally lost his battle in heaven against Michael, as we read in Revelation 12, verse 7 to 9, 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought, and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. Nine, and the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent, called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. This period of time is about mid-trumpet's time. The confusion taught on all of this is also rooted in the fact that it has been taught to us that the Antichrist is Satan, when in fact he is not. However, they work together hand in hand, and the Antichrist gets his power from him. However, if they were one, why does Revelation tell us about all three, including the false prophet who will be working with the Antichrist during seals? Have each of them spirits like until frogs come out of them? I will go into more detail into this in the chapter called Revealing Revelation. Revelation 16, 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. This brings us back to how Matthew can have another version, and this one being the one that will stand in the holy place. You will also understand in the chapter about Daniel 9 that during the first half of Trumpets, the city, streets, and temple will get rebuilt in Jerusalem only after the land has rested during the time of seals. Making this Matthew portion, which is to the Jews, the point at which the temple will have been built and Satan being cast down at the time frame of the fifth trumpet, at which time he will stand in the holy place, the actual temple that had been rebuilt, causing the second abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel in chapter 12. Daniel 12, 11. 11. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days, which now also confirms to us what it says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. These are not the same words or actions as the Antichrist's, nor will the Antichrist have a physical third temple to step into during the seals. Clearly once more revealing to us two separate periods of time, seals and trumpets, for two different groups of people. The sign of Jonah is not the same in each gospel. This is another one of those revelations where there is much more to this teaching than what we will discuss here, especially the first portion of 40 days. One of the many great revelations that has been revealed through the differences in the three synoptic gospels is the 40 days warning of the Son of Man. There will be a chapter dedicated to this topic 
specifically called the 40 days of the Son of Man. This portion is to highlight the differences in the three Gospels of when Jesus spoke regarding as Jonah was. All of the stories you have read thus far are clearly revealing the purpose of these differences in the Gospels. It was all done with an insight of giving us the what is to come. And not only is this one also going to prove that, more than that, it will bring greater clarity as to what Jesus did or did not yet do. It will also clear up what many people have pointed to as a clear contradiction in the Gospels. One of which is that out of the three Gospels mentioning the sign of Jonah, in Mark, Jesus says no sign will be given and leaves. I am not really sure how anyone had explained it before without the revelation of any real end-time understanding, just like so many other parts of Scripture that had us scratching our heads for generations. The 40 Days Warning in Luke Luke 11, 20, 30, 29 And there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of Jonas the prophet. For as Jonas was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. For context about what is spoken here, Jonah was sent by God to a place called Nineveh to give them a warning that destruction was coming in forty days should they not repent. Jesus tells them that as Jonah did, so shall also the Son of Man do, which is another name for Jesus. Not that he would be going to the same place, but that he, the Son of Man, would also at some point give a forty-day warning as Jonah did. Now many, if not all, have been taught that Jesus fulfilled this particular scripture already after his resurrection when he remained for forty days. But he did not. We do not have a single conversation of him during his forty days on earth after his resurrection, giving any warning to any nations to come to repentance or be destroyed after forty days. Here is what we are told in Acts 1. Acts 1, 2-4 To until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. 3. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. 4. And, being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. There is not a single warning to them or anyone to repent or suffer destruction after his forty days. For years we have been told that this scripture was only about his forty days after his resurrection and nothing more. But how are we to understand the wording that he would do as Jonah did? We have also been told that it was represented as forty years. And you will see in some of the other teachings in this book that days in Scripture can most certainly have a clear representation as years. However, we still have an issue with this because we can and have proven that Jesus truly did get crucified and resurrected at Passover of 33 AD. So if you use the days as years count for the warning, how does 33 AD plus 40 years equal when Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD? It does not. The answer to this mystery is that it has not yet been fulfilled. Each account of this story in the Gospels is prophecy, is to come. No sign in Mark, Mark 8, 12-13, And he sighed deeply in his spirit, and saith, Why doth this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, There shall no sign be given unto this generation. And he left them, and entering into the ship again departed to the other side. Looking at this, we can understand why there would be apparent valid comments defining this as a contradiction. The incredible answer to this is found in each of the three Gospels right before the story of the Mount of Transfiguration. I will touch on it here just briefly to make the point. Mark 9, 1 And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here, which shall not taste of death, till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. This scripture is also found in Luke and Matthew, and also right before the Transfiguration story, but each once again varies in the language. My focus here is on Mark. The other Gospels will be discussed in another chapter called The Differences and the Truth. In Mark's version, the language is past tense, have seen, meaning they will have seen the kingdom of God come, but will not be going to it right away at the seeing of it coming. Now remember, we are in Mark's Gospel. 
and we have been explaining that Mark is the left-behind church that would go through seals before the mid-tribulation rapture, after seal judgments. So let's go have a look at the seal judgments in the book of Revelation, starting with the last seal, the sixth seal. Revelation 6, 16-17, 16, And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. 17. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Telling us that people everywhere will see his coming and will be terrified, but not raptured right away. Now as an important side note, do not confuse this coming with his feet down on the Mount of Olives. You will understand this a little further on into the book, but for a heads up, this is him coming in the clouds on Mount Zion. Then in chapter 7 of Revelation, we see a group called the 144,000 who are being sealed first before anything else happens. After this, the Mark group, who we know as the Rapture group, called the Great Multitude before the Lord. Revelation 7, 9-10 After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Ten and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. It is clear that the Mark group of the great multitude, at mid-tribulation after the seal judgments, are now raptured, standing before the throne, after they have seen him coming with power, bringing home the point that the Mark people group will not be given any sign. I said I would also touch on the Mount of Transfiguration story here as well to make the point for Mark's time. It is going to have you saying, wait, what are you saying about the years? But fear not, you will fully understand this question in the next chapter when the years just don't add up. Mark 9, 2. And after six days Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John and leadeth them up into an high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And a few verses later we see Jesus finally coming down the mountain, Think Mount Zion we just spoke about, after the events that took place on it, and look who is right there. Mark 9, 14-15 And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed, and running to him saluted him. The same type and shadow story of having been on a mountain with a group of people first then a great multitude gathering to him in great joy. But there was something more to this. Did you notice how it said after six days? If you recall, days can also represent in prophecy years. Now you might think six seals, six days. However, what is really being given to us here, as well as in the other two Gospels, in the same story, is a major clue to the revelation of the true time frame of the whole tribulation. This will be revealed in greater detail as mentioned in the next chapter, when the years just don't add up. But the clue here is, six days are prophetic as years. Meaning, after six years of the six judgments of seals, they will then see the Lord coming on heavenly Mount Zion in the clouds, and the great multitude will be raptured into the seventh year or the Sabbath year before the trumpet judgments begin. Wow, I know that is a lot to take in, but it will become increasingly clear shortly. Three days and three nights in Matthew. Matthew 12, 40. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. We can see here again in Matthew's version that it is different. And this is one we have also been taught in the churches, that it was fulfilled by Jesus at his death and resurrection. But you will see and understand for yourselves that it was not. It was prophetic and not yet fulfilled. I am sure for many of you, all of this is causing a bit of an overload. There is so much that has already been revealed that needs time to be processed. I understand. As you take the time to seek these things for yourselves and pray for the Holy Spirit to guide you and reveal them to you, He will. Now let me show you how Scripture shows it was not possible that Jesus had fulfilled this. Luke 9, 22, 22 saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be slain, and be raised the third day. 
This conversation took place while these two men were walking with Jesus and didn't realize it was him having resurrected. Luke 24, 20 21 20, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Luke 24, 46, 46, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Matthew 17, 22, 23. And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and the third day he shall be raised again. And they were exceedingly sorry. Matthew 20, 19. And shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him, and the third day he shall rise again. Are you seeing the wording? Not once are we being told he would be resurrected after three days and three nights. Every single occasion tells us he resurrected on the third day. However, after three days and three nights would mean day four. This has caused such a tremendous amount of confusion in the church for those who have questioned and tried to understand how could he have then resurrected in 33 AD on the Sunday. Of course, this is another revelation in itself. But I will give you the quick answer. When you study the wording of his death and resurrection, you will find out he said it began from when he would be taken into the hands of sinful men, then crucified, then resurrected, and that those three events together consist of his resurrection on the third day. Which, for those of you still wondering, the third day means about two and a half days. He resurrected on the third day early in the morning, which means during the early daylight of the third day. Hence, the Jonah prophecy has still to be fulfilled sometime at the end of tribulation. The church has been teaching all their understanding from the perspective of Matthew. And as you have come to see, Matthew is not for the bride or church, but for the Jews. I am not coming against all pastors and teachers who have taught this. I am simply making the point that their perspective on having taught it this way has been similar to what the chief priests and Pharisees taught. That is something no pastor or teacher ever wants to be a part of. Matthew 27, 62-62 Now the next day, that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, While he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. He did not say after three days, he said the third day. And that one time where he said the Son of Man would be as Jonah was, that he would be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, was prophetic. Just as he said about the forty days of the Son of Man, prophecy for the end times, preparing the Passover. This revelation is more focused on what is being said in Luke and Mark than in Matthew. But you are also going to see another revelation built into this that will become fully revealed to you when you get to the chapter called, The Books Have Opened. If you thought all this was amazing, wait until you get to that chapter. I am boasting in the Lord's faithfulness. You will understand why we called it, The Books Have Opened. But let's not get too ahead of ourselves. I mean me. I get a little excited about teaching on all these things, sometimes bouncing from one place to another. Let's start with Luke. Luke 22, 10-12. 10, and he said unto them, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. And ye shall say unto the goodman of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber, where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room, G508, furnished, there make ready. Mark 14, 13 to 15. And he sendeth forth two of his disciples, and saith unto them, Go ye into the city, and there shall meet you a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him. And wheresoever he shall go in, say ye to the goodman of the house. The master saith, Where is the guest chamber, where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, G508, furnished and prepared, G2092. There make ready for us. Room, G508, means above the ground, that is, properly, the second floor of a building, used for a dome or a balcony, 
on the upper story. Upper room. Total KJV occurrences, too. What is even more telling of this word room that is being used here is that it is only used twice in the Bible. And just as we read a little earlier about the groups of people being represented in Luke and Mark being taken to heaven, this upper room being discussed is yet another type and shadow of both these groups going to the large upper room for them in heaven. You will also notice there is an extra word added to Mark's version, prepared. Prepared, G2092, that is, ready, prepared, made, readiness, to our hand. Now at first, this word simply seems obvious and would otherwise hold no other value than what it says. But knowing what you have begun to understand, you may now say, yes, that is strange. Why there in Mark and not in Luke? Questions like this are what bring about revelation to those that seek them out. I began this topic by also telling you there was more to this revelation based on what I called the the books have opened, and part of that applies to this word prepared. Now, without getting detailed here, I am going to share with you an incredible revelation that is found in the Gospel of John. I know our focus is the Synoptic Gospels, and it still is. However, I wanted to show you this to make a point here as to why Mark has this word. But in doing so, if I only share where it is in John, you will not have the context of why it is there in that specific chapter of John. And that is that the Gospel of John has built into it what I call the chapters to years. You will understand more as you come to that chapter in the book. As you know, John has 21 chapters, so a chapter to year would mean 21 years. And the way to begin to wrap your mind around it is to think of the story of Jacob and the years of work he did for Leah and Rachel and then the cattle. John's hidden end-time revelation is based on those working of years. So would make the first seven chapters slash years of John the type and shadow of the first seven years Jacob worked for his first bride. We know he expected Rachel after the first seven years, but ended up getting Leah, which is also an end-time story unto itself. It tells us in Genesis 29 that those first seven years flew by because he loved her so. So now if you look at what happens after the first seven chapters of John, chapter 8 begins with a woman caught in adultery. Jesus is bent over as the crowd asks him what he thinks they should do with her. And as many know, the story goes on to say, Jesus said, He who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And they left convicted within themselves, knowing they had all sinned. Then Jesus bends over again to write in the sand. And when he looked up again, all those that had been accusing her were now gone. And it then says, John 8, 9, 10, 9, And they, which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. 10. When Jesus had lifted up himself, and saw none but the woman, who does this Gentile woman caught in adultery represent? And Jesus, having been bent down on the ground, looks up and sees no other but her standing before him. What does this sound like to you? Kind of like a wedding proposal? bent down on one knee, looking up and only seeing her. You are probably asking yourself, what does this have to do with Mark's version having the word prepared? You would be right in asking that question, because it has nothing to do with it. It was Luke's Gentile bride representation that comes first. And I felt I needed to lay a little groundwork for you, and like I said earlier, not just say, here is John 14 for Mark, and this is what it means. It will also help you with a little understanding so that once you get to the chapter about all this in greater detail, you will already have a head start. So now after Jacob has finished his first seven years and gets Leah as his first bride, he is told for Rachel, the one he really wanted, that he could have her too, but that he would need to complete another seven years. So if we follow along in John now to chapter 14, we find John 14, 1 through 3. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a plenty a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. From G2092, to prepare, prepare, provide, make ready. It comes from the root word G2092. The word prepared, from G2092,
from Mark's version. It's simply that the tense of the word of one is letting them know he is going to prepare it. It just so happens it was in that chapter of John where he was speaking to a group of people, letting them know he would come again for them with this place prepared. Since we have come this far in the Jacob to John, years to chapters, and have shown Luke and Mark's time represented in the type and shadow of pre-trib, escape of the bride, and rapture of the left-behind church, why not bring it to the end with Matthew's representation? Matthew 26, 17-19 Now the first day of the feast of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to such a man, and say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand, I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. The conversation here is not the same as Luke or Mark's version, not the same description of the man, nor any mention of an upper room, neither furnished nor prepared. Well, if you recall, only Luke and Mark's groups go to heaven. Matthew's group remains on earth, for the kingdom of heaven on earth at the return of Christ, feet down for the following 1,000-year reign, not as the other two who are in the kingdom of God, what we call the heaven. So that covers why there is no mention of any upper room here. But for the timing of Matthew's version, let's continue in Jacob's story to John's chapter to years. Next, in Jacob's story we read, He then worked six more years for the cattle, and at the end of those years we read in Genesis 31 that he has completed working for his father-in-law a total of twenty years. Seven easy ones received Leah Luke, seven more for Rachel Mark, and final six for cattle, Matthew. And so, if we now go to John chapter 20, we find it is the resurrection of Jesus and his final instructions to his disciples. John 20, 19-21. 19 Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. 20 And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you the literal type and shadow of his return feet down at the end of the six years of trumpets. And did you notice? In all the synoptic gospels, the story of Jesus' return at the resurrection is found in the last chapter of their books with the final instructions Jesus gives them. However, in John, it is in the second last chapter of his book. It is the end of the story. Even though there is one chapter left in John, more on why in the coming chapters, this is all a representation of him having returned after 20 years. Now, what should be on your minds at this point is, what on earth is he talking about after 20 years? Or why seven easy years to Luke's group, leaving 13 more years, of which seven are for Mark's group, and the last six for Matthew's group? And why does John then still have one more chapter slash year? These are all great questions, and they will all be answered in what awaits you in the next great revelation that began to be received after who the Gospels are speaking to. That is why I saved this Jacob to John story last. Leading you into those questions, and take you into chapter 2. Chapter 2, along with this first one, are what I have termed the two keys of end-time understanding. I pray this has begun to bless you, and that the following chapter will bring even greater levels of end-time understanding and clarity to you. God's Harvest Model I would like to just quickly draw your attention to the harvest model found in Scripture that is applicable to Luke, Mark, and Matthew and the 14-year tribulation timeline. We read about this harvest model in Leviticus 23 and 19. Leviticus 23, 20 soup 22. And when ye reap the harvest of your land, Thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest, neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 19, 9-10 9. And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corners of thy field, neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of thy harvest. 10. And thou shalt not glean thy vineyard, neither shalt thou gather every grape of thy vineyard. 
Thou shalt leave them for the poor and stranger. I am the Lord your God. There are three specific harvest models in Scripture. One, the barley harvest. Two, the wheat harvest. Three, the grape harvest. And the harvest model of each consists of three parts. One, the first fruits. Two, the main harvest. Three, the corners or gleanings. The barley harvest is the harvest that Jesus represented as the first fruits brought in, of which the main harvest were the believers during Christ's period, and those spoken of in Matthew 27, 52-53, who were raised from the dead. The corners gleanings are those few remaining who come to believe at the very end of this cycle. The wheat harvest is also divided into a first fruits, which is the bride of Christ, that will have escaped all these things coming. The main harvest is the left behind, or great multitude, that we read of standing before the Lamb in Revelation 7, 9 through 11, that have gone through the seal's judgment, having been raptured. And the corners, gleanings, are again those few remaining who come in at the very end of this harvest cycle. We then have the grape harvest, which is that of the Jews slash Judah, of which the first fruits are the 144,000, as we read in Revelation 14.1. The main harvest is the Jews Judah that will return unto their Messiah at his coming feet down, having gone through trumpets, and the corners gleanings are again those few towards the very end of the cycle when the Lord's seventh year comes to an end. For an easy reference, please see the two harvest models in the appendix. I want to close out this chapter with an encouraging parable Jesus gives us in Luke that I really enjoy reading and sharing. Luke 18, 1-8 And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. 2, saying, There was in a city a judge, which feared not God, neither regarded man. 3, And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. 7. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Chapter 2. When the Years Just Don't Add Up Have you ever thought to yourself that you just cannot see how everything we have been told could fit into seven years? Many have been struggling with this thought. In this chapter, we would like to present some examples in Scripture and some research, of which there are plenty more, that clearly confirms that the tribulation will actually be two sets of seven years for a total of fourteen years, and not the seven years we have been taught. I will also be showing you the Strong's Concordance, meaning that comes with each word we will be discussing. Every word in Scripture is assigned a number which either has an H, Hebrew, or G, Greek, meaning for our clarification and understanding. This has been a great source of help in having been able to open the end-time understanding. For example, H7103 or G7103. Fourteen years spoken of by Paul, I had just recently started to understand who the Gospels were speaking to when I came across this scripture written by Paul. I realized I had never heard anyone give any explanation for it in any end-time teaching, and as you are about to understand, there is a good reason for that. How could these verses ever be explained in only a seven-year understanding? 2 Corinthians 12, 2-4 and 14 Seku, I knew a man in Christ above fourteen years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. For, how that he was caught up into paradise, and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. And when we get down to verse 14, we find out he is speaking in this chapter, as now coming the third time. For behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours but you, for the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. The first group. Bride, you will note in verse 2 that it says such an one, which is the word G5108, as well as the words caught up, which is G7226, to the third heaven, 
G5108 means of this sort or like, meaning this first event is like a caught up. G726 means harpazo, harpazo, from a derivative of G138, to seize in various applications, catch away up, pluck, pull, take by force. Or as most have come to understand it, rapture. So verse 2 reads as, Above 14 years ago, one was like a rapture taken to the third heaven. When we refer to the bride of Christ being raptured, we in this ministry use the word escape, which comes from Luke 21, 36. Luke 21, 36, Watch ye therefore, and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. This escape from all things that shall come to pass is the like a rapture to the third heaven where they will be standing before the Son of Man. That was only verse 2 speaking of the first event. But as we continue reading through verse 3 and 4, we see Paul then telling us of another event, the second group Mark left behind. In verses 3 to 4 of 2 Corinthians 12, you will note the words, and I knew such a man, how that he was caught up, G726, into paradise. This second group is not defined as the first, being like, but is clearly telling us this one, was caught up, G726 harpazo, harpadzo, from a derivative of G138, to seize in various applications, catch, away, up, pluck, pull, take by force. Again, as most have come to understand it, raptured. However, this time not to the third heaven as per verse 2, but to paradise. Now that is pretty clear. It tells us that the first one was like a rapture harpazo, and the second one was a rapture harpazo. We find greater clarity of this exact wording, was caught up, in Revelation 12.5, which also helps us understand this timing. Revelation 12.5, And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up up unto God into his throne. I am certain many of you have heard that this verse is speaking to what is known as the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. However, this clearly must be questioned now. Because according to the understanding by Paul, this was caught up is not the first rapture-like event. It is the second. And we can prove this out more. Let's go to Isaiah 66, verse 7. Before she travailed, H. 2342, she brought forth, before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. Many have used this verse to prove that the pre-tribulation will happen first. The key here is before she travails, which is H2342 and means to writhe in pain, travail with pain, be in pain, bear, make to bring forth. I think you get the picture. So this is telling us before she begins travailing in pain, she brings forth. There was a birth. This before truly is the pre-tribulation rapture, or as we call it, escape and this escape will be that of the Bride of Christ. However, we have an issue here with what the churches have taught. Because if the was caught up we read about in Rever 12.5 is to be the pre-tribulation rapture, why is it happening after the travailing in birth pains and the birth following those travailing pains from verses 2-5? to 5? The answer is that this was caught up in Revelation 12.5 is not Isaiah 66.7's pre-tribulation rapture. It is Paul's second event called Was Caught Up of 2 Corinthians 12, 3-4. And Paul's first event, like Caught Up, is Isaiah 66.7's But She Travailed pre-tribulation escape rapture. This explains why the one goes to the third heaven and the other to paradise. In other words, escape, 2 Corinthians 12.2, goes with Isaiah 66.7. Rapture, 2 Corinthians 12, 3 to 4 goes with Revelation 12, verse 5. But Paul is not done yet. Remember in verse 14, he goes on to tell us, the third time, we have just covered the pre-tribulation escape to Luke, which is above 14 years. We have also covered the second event as the mid-tribulation rapture of Mark, which will be the seventh year, rest of seals. Who is left? The third and final group, of course, is Matthew. And this is the group in the end time type and shadow that this whole conversation is being spoken to. He is recounting to them the events that have happened prior to his coming the third time. The third group, Matthew, Jew, 2 Corinthians 12, 14. 14, behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. 
Paul in this chapter is the type of Christ, and we saw that the first and second time it was a taking away to another place. Yet this third time he says he is coming to them. And what do we know this means at the end? The Lord is returning feet down on the Mount of Olives, and the promised millennial reign will soon begin with each tribe finally receiving their land inheritance. The order of events will be, 1. The first group escape, Luke the bride, above before the 14 years begin. 2. Followed by the second group that will be the rapture, Mark left behind, in the seventh year of rest toward the end of seals. 3. Finally, the third group that will see him coming down to them, Matthew Jews, at the end of 13 years, to fulfill the 14th and final year. On the Mount of Transfiguration, I am purposely discussing the Mount of Transfiguration first before the story of Jacob. It is a great place for us to begin in order for you to see the bigger picture of the year counts, of which the first portion of years are nearing their end as I write this. This first portion is what you have heard me call the escape of the Bride of Christ, which will be one of the greatest events in all of human history. However, in this section, I'm only going to share the revelation of the Mount of Transfiguration regarding the end time years count. The greater revelation of the rest of this transfiguration story is found in the chapter, The Differences and the Truth. Luke 9, 28. And it came to pass about an eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. Mark 9, 2. And after six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John and leadeth them up into an high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. Matthew 17, 1. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart. As mentioned earlier, days can and are very often translated or seen in the end-time revelation as years. And this is a great example. When this was revealed to me, I was at that point becoming very well versed in the revelation of the 14 years of the end times. The easiest parts that caught my attention instantly were the after six days in both Mark and Matthew, the first half of the 14 years for seals, which is Mark, the sleeping church, and the second half of the 14 years for trumpets, which is Matthew, the Jews, also known as Jacob's trouble. So it was easy to understand these two right away. This particular verse in Mark is a reference to the Lord coming at the end of or after the sixth seal, which is after six years of seals and the start of the seventh year Sabbath. This is also the reason why we see him coming at the end of the sixth seal. God's law has never changed. It has always been six and the seventh rest. Matthew's verse of after six days is a reference to the Lord coming at the end of or after the sixth trumpet, which is after six years of trumpets and the start of the seventh year, Sabbath. This is exactly when we see him return, feet down on the Mount of Olives, further confirmed in Revelation 11:15 that everything is now his, including all the kingdoms of the earth and reigning forever. P.S. A good side note here. Just because there are six seals over six years and six trumpets over six years does not mean that the one seal or trumpet will only open up once the one before it has been completed, until all has been fulfilled. Some will happen close together, while others will happen in their time. Some will overlap, but have their biggest portion in their own time. And this also does not mean the seal judgments will overlap with trumpets either. Seals will be during their time, and trumpets will be during their time. We actually see this spoken about in the apocryphal book Baruch 2. Luke's portion, however, still remained a mystery to me for about a year, after having understood the other two of after six days. I wanted to know why was Luke telling us about an eight days? I was so excited when the Spirit revealed this mystery to me. It was perfect. This about was letting us know that it was not quite the eighth day year, but it was close. And so, if you recall what you just read in the last section, you will get the answer. 2 Corinthians 12, 2. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. I knew the 14 years were those of seals and trumpets to Mark and Matthew, but there was this mysterious portion of time called above, as we discussed earlier. 
The answer to this was the revelation of Luke's about an eight days. And just as Mark and Matthew's portions were coming at the end portion of seals and trumpets, this portion was then too coming after a period of time. And it either meant this portion of time was a little before the eight-day year or a little after it. But I already knew the tribulation was seven total years for seals and seven total years for trumpets. It had to mean this was a portion of time before the 14 years. Just as Paul was telling us in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 2, this meant a portion of time in the seventh day year before the eighth began. We have also understood that the eighth day to God is also the first day of the week, of the next week. This would make that eighth day year the first year of the seven total years of seals, again confirming that it was before the first year that begins seals, which is about an eighth day. It turned out to be exactly correct. This conversation in Luke's transfiguration account with the about was the type and shadow of the period of time when the Son of Man will be coming for the 40-day warning after the escape of the Bride of Christ has happened. As you will have read in the chapter, who are the gospel speaking to? You will find greater understanding with regard to these 40 days when you come to the chapter, The 40 Days of the Son of Man. The big picture given in the story of Jacob, Genesis 31, 41. Thus have I been 20 years in thy house. I serve thee 14 years for thy two daughters and six years for thy cattle, and thou hast changed my wages 10 times. That is the end of the story. So let's back up a little to get the details of this story where Jacob worked for two daughters and cattle. In Genesis 29, 18, we see Jacob loved Rachel and says he will work seven years for her. Then in Genesis 29, 20, and Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had to her. The reason for the first seven years that seemed unto him but a few days was because of his love for her. So it is telling us that it was not really very hard on him because he was excited. Time flew by. This is not the representation of the first seven years of the 14, as some might be thinking. This first, what we have called easy seven years, are the seven years that the Holy Spirit has been working hard at preparing the Bride of Christ. These are the seven years that comes before the 14 years of tribulation begins, meaning by the end of this first set of seven years, the Bride of Christ will be taken. As we continue, we see in Genesis 29, 25, 25, And it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, What is this thou hast done unto me? Did not I serve with thee for Rachel? Wherefore then hast thou beguiled me? Jacob, having completed seven years, was expecting to get Rachel, the one he thought he was working for. However, he woke up the next morning to find out he was given the older sister, Leah, first. This is the type and shadow of when Jesus came in the New Testament, and he said that he came, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, written in Matthew 15, 23, 24. In this story of Jacob, the Gentile type and shadow is Leah, Matthew 15, 23 through 28, 23. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As the story continues, we see this Gentile woman being referenced as a dog. This was at that time as a Gentile reference. But then we see that because of her great faith, her daughter is healed. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. We see that just as Jacob, Jesus had come for the one he really wanted, but the one he ended up getting were the Gentiles, the Gentiles who are grafted in for their faith in him, while the vast majority of those he came for were not yet ready to accept or receive him. As we read in Romans 11, 11 and 22, 24, 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell 
severity, but toward thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree which is wild by nature, and wert grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Just as Jacob received the one he did not work come for first, so did Christ. However, it was all, of course, according to God's perfect plan. It was by design that the Gentiles would be grafted in, too. And this now brings us to the next part of this story. Genesis 29, 26, 27. And Laban said, It must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Fulfill her week, and we will give thee this also, for the service which thou shalt serve with me yet seven other years. We next see, after he has realized that he received the other daughter, he goes to his father-in-law to confront him, who essentially says, Too bad. Our tradition is the older one must be married off first, and then goes on to tell him, Fulfill her week. This is a very special piece of scripture for the Luke group as the bride of Christ. It is the representation of the Gentile wedding that will follow immediately the escape before the seven years of seals begins. But the group Jesus had originally come for, the house of Israel, the lost sheep that had been left behind as Mark's group, he will have to wait seven years for. Jacob had to work the next seven years to then fulfill her time. As we read at the end of verse 27, for the service which thou shalt serve with me yet seven more years, leaving the final years where Jacob remained to work for the cattle. As we read at the end of Genesis 31, Genesis 31, verse 41. And six years for thy cattle, and thou hast changed my wages ten times. These six years form the final years of his total twenty years. They are the representation of the final six years of trumpets, or, as most know it, Jacob's trouble, which brings us to a final piece of information in this story. Genesis 31, 44. Now, therefore, come thou, let us make a covenant, I and thou, and let it be for a witness between me and thee. Chapter 3. The Forty Days of the Son of Man This is a revelation of great importance. Even though you may possibly be reading this after it has happened, it will help protect you from the enemy who is to follow once you understand this. I will make it as clear as I can for those it may reach now and for those it will reach during that time. This period of time is not for the Bride of Christ. Luke's group the Bride of Christ, will have already been taken out of the earth, as per Acts 15, 14. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Only days before this time of the Son of Man begins. It is not an easy subject to share, because most have never understood that there is more than one event relating to the Lord in the end times. You will see that there is much more involved than him simply returning feet down on the Mount of Olives at the end. And it will start with this. It all begins with a portion of time that our brother Paul tells us about in 2 Corinthians 12, 2. 2. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. We are looking at what this above portion Paul is referring to. First of all, it must be less than 15 years, or he would have said above 15 years. The mystery of it is how much above the 14 years and what takes place during that time. And in fact, you will see wording a little later on that shows Jesus knew this would not be widely understood about him at this time. But why is it so crazy or difficult to believe when it is repeatedly spoken about in Scripture from Noah to Jonah to the Lord himself? The understanding will come from all three of the Synoptic Gospels. And yet, whenever we discuss this, most instantly see us as heretical and twisting Scripture. When we are actually comparing Scripture with Scripture as the Word tells us to do, having read and begun to understand who the Gospels are speaking to, you can now do the same with much more clarity. You are about to understand for yourself that it is a downright fact. The Son of Man is coming for 40 days, first or above before the 14 years begin. I know many may right now say, but Jesus told us not to believe people that would be saying they are Christ coming in his name, quoting these scriptures below. Matthew 24, 5, 5, 
For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Or how about Mark 13, 6? For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And how about Luke 21, 8? And he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. What do they all have in common? Shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. Let me ask you, when Christ was here before and after his resurrection, did he go around telling everyone he was the Christ? No, he did not. Here are a couple of examples. Luke 9, 18 to 19. And it came to pass, as he was alone praying, his disciples were with him, and he asked them, saying, Whom say the people that I am? They answering said, John the Baptist, but some say Elias, and others say that one of the old prophets is risen again. Matthew 16, verse 15 to 17. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. In both of these cases, as the others found in Scripture, he never went around telling them he was the Christ. Clearly in Luke's account here, if he had, he would not have asked the question. More to the point, they obviously did not know by all the answers he got. In fact, in Matthew's account, we see the only way any of them could have known Bone. He really was the Christ, was if it was the will of the Father in heaven that they were given to understand it. Not because he told them. People came to believe he was, but never do we read of Jesus going around to groups of people telling them he was the Christ. The declaring in itself is the very difference that brings us clarity, proving that all who have declared to be in the past and all who will in the future are not the Christ. He did not and will not be going around telling everyone he is the Christ. It is important to remember this. Saying and proving that he will be here for 40 days is not contradicting those scriptures. It is bringing clarity to what they really mean. What sign is Jonah and when? For generations, people have argued that there are contradictions in the scriptures. This is one of those they debate. It is the story of Jonah given to us in the Gospels. Let's have a look. Luke 11, 29 to 30, 29, they seek a sign, and there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of Jonas the prophet. For as Jonas was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. Mark, Mark 8, 12 to 13, 12, why doth this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, there shall no sign be given unto this generation. And he left them, and entering into the ship again departed to the other side. Matthew, Matthew 12, 39 to 30. And there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. 40. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Right away we can clearly see where the argument is for the contradiction, especially in Mark, the one debated most. How is it that Jesus said he would be as Jonah in Luke and Matthew, Yet in Mark tells them, no sign will be given, and gets in a ship and leaves. It is not just that Mark is told nothing. There is more going on here. There is also that Luke is told one portion, and Matthew another portion. And exactly what did he mean in Luke by, he will be a sign as Jonah was? We have all heard the term, was and is and is to come being taught. Was, as the scripture history of it, is, as the life lessons for us to take from scripture, and the is to come as it would apply to the end times. However, there is even more to this than what we have been taught all along with regard to the subject of the Son of Man being here for 40 days. Luke's version in this case will represent the was, pre-tribulation or before the 14 years, but after the escape. Mark, the is, mid-tribulation rapture, and Matthew, the is to come, post-tribulation feet down. The way we have always been taught to understand it was Matthew's portion represented the three days after his crucifixion to his resurrection, and that the 40 days after his resurrection was Luke's portion. However, Jesus told us in Luke's version that he would be as Jonah was. What did Jonah do during his 40 days? He gave them a warning of what was about to happen to them if they did not heed his words and repent. 
so that would mean Jesus did not yet do as Jonah did his first time around. Sure, he had a 40-day event, but he did not do as Jonah did, like he said he would in Luke 11. And now you can begin to understand that he still actually has to fulfill a 40-day warning. The focus of this chapter is the 40 days of the Son of Man. However, I feel like I would be leaving you hanging without at least touching on the understanding of why Mark and Matthew's versions speak differently of their Jonah story. So I'm going to try and cover just the main points of them. Let's start with Mark and the reason he is told no sign. As we have come to understand, the end of Mark's portion is after the six years of seals, and what or who do we see coming at the end of the sixth seal? Revelation 6 verse 16, And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. What can we understand from this? That there was no warning or no sign given before his sudden appearing. This is the understanding of the end of Mark's time, and it is in the exact place in the end times it should be to relate to Mark's no sign. Matthew's portion of three days and three nights could be a big discussion, because it is a huge revelation, but I will keep it short. We have all been told that Jesus was three days and three nights in the grave. Many of you may know this has caused a lot of confusion in the church as to how could Jesus have then risen early in the morning on the first day of the week after a Passover crucifixion, and it be after three days and three nights? The answer is, it could not have. And this opens another very big discussion. Seeing that it clearly shows that it is not, how is it we have all been taught this for generations? The short answer is that we have all been taught from the perspective of Matthew's Gospel and only used Mark and Luke's Gospels as a backup support to build on the view from Matthew instead of incorporating and dividing the word, comparing Scripture with Scripture. As you have come to understand, they are not just another perspective, but completely different groups of people spoken to. Now, there are many verses I can use to show that it was not after three days and three nights, but here is three. Luke 24, 46. 46. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day. 1 Corinthians 15, 3-4. 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. 4. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Matthew 17, 22-23. And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and the third day he shall be raised again. And they were exceeding sorry. Clearly, if it was after three days and three nights, he would have had to rise from the dead on the fourth day. Yet not one of them tells us this, and there are many more scriptures that say the same thing. So where did this come from? In one place in Matthew's Gospel, the Jonah story, even though every other scripture told us he rose on the third day and not after. So this leaves the question, why did Jesus say he would be as Jonah was for three days and three nights? Well, just as Luke and Mark were speaking prophetically of something that was in the is to come, so too was Matthew's Jonah account. When you read carefully the Matthew verses above, you will see what was really being told to us about the time of his death and resurrection. It tells us from when he will be betrayed into the hands of men, which would be the beginning of the count. Then it goes on to say they will kill him, and finally, on the third day, he will be raised. This is how he was able to rise on the first day of the week, early in the morning, and still have it be on the third day. It was never the total time in the grave at his death and resurrection. It began from when he was taken, Hence, clearly, he was not, nor could have been in the grave for three days and three nights, let alone also count the time of his crucifixion. Leaving one truth is to come. The details to that discussion will not be happening in this book. Now moving back into the 40-day conversation. Let's look at a very telling piece of scripture that will again not only shed more light on the 40 days, but also give more about Mark and Matthew's times. Luke 17, 24, 30, 24. For as the lightning that lighteneth out of the one part under heaven 
shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. But first must he suffer many things, and be rejected of this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came, and destroyed them all. Likewise, also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. 29. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven, and destroyed them all. 30. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Now again, the Mark and Matthew portions are not the point of this teaching. However, I am going to quickly show them to you. Then move into Luke's 40-day portion and show you where it leads us to from there. In Luke 17 verse 24, you will notice he starts by telling them the end when he will return feet down on the Mount of Olives as lighting from one end to the other, which we now understand is the end of the sixth trumpet time. And how do we know? He tells them his day will be like lightning from one part of heaven to the other. This is Matthew's portion. This is also the scripture people quote to say that there will not be a secret escape because the whole world will see him when he comes. But as you have also now come to understand, they say this only because they are seeing it from a Matthew perspective and have not understood Mark or Luke's perspective. So how can we know how this is to the end at his feet down return? Remember Matthew's portion is trumpets time to the end. Matthew 24, 27, 27. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. You will also remember that in 2 Corinthians 12, 14, Paul, as a type and shadow of Jesus Christ, says that it is the third time and that he will be coming to them. Now, if we skip to Luke 17, 28, because I want to show Mark's portion before getting to Luke's, you will notice some very interesting words. They bought, they sold. Interesting how that wording is found in that portion. Remember, a big focus during the tribulation of seals is going to be having or not having the ability to buy or sell due to the mark of the beast. When you continue down to verse 30, you will notice it says, When the Son of Man is revealed. This is not the forty days, nor his return, feet down on the Mount of Olives, but the time when he will come after the sixth seal. As we read in Revelation 6, 16, 7, 16, And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. 17. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? This is when he will be seen coming on Mount Zion as the great stone that will become a mountain, seen here. Daniel 2, 34-35 Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, and filled the whole earth. The end of Mark's time of tribulation. This is when Lord will destroy the beast and his system shortly before the coming rapture of Mark's group. So in verse 24, it is the end of trumpets, Matthew's time, which he tells them about first, and verse 28, it is the end of seals, Mark's. Now we will look at Luke's time, the 40 days of the Son of Man. Let me add a little context to rightly divide these few verses. The context of these verses in Luke 17 is about his coming kingdom. They are asking him, is it now? How will we know? And he goes on to tell them about it. He tells them what it is going to be like when the end is approaching. He is not telling them anything about the time they are presently in. He is clearly giving them prophecy, because that was not yet the time of his kingdom. Now you will notice in Luke 17 verse 25, after he has told them the Matthew portion, when he will come as lightning in his day, says some very important words, but first, which means before. He is saying, before these things I have just told you about, when he will come as lightning in his day, I am going to have to suffer many things and be rejected. And so what is this but first? 
In verse 26, he says that his days will be as the days of Noah. In verse 24, the Matthew section, it was his day singular, but here in verse 26, it is plural. The question is, which days could those be? First, it confirms the fact that this is another portion of time besides the obvious but first. And he is also telling us in verse 27 that his deus that he will be here for relate to Noah. He gives us a clue with the reference to Noah, which tells us exactly how many days they are by telling us it was until Noah got in the ark and the flood came. And how long was this time? You got it, 40 days. Let's go to the story itself and see what he is referring to. Also remembering that the end time context we are looking at is a portion of time called above the 14 years, which simply means before the tribulation actually starts. As a side note, this does not mean that it will not be a crazy time that has begun on the earth. It most certainly will be. However, it will not yet be the beginning of the 14 years quite yet until after the above or before portion has ended. This story of Noah and the ark is given to us in Genesis 7 and 8. We see God telling Noah in Genesis 7, 4, For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights. And we see he starts gathering in his family and the animals. By verse 10, the seven days have passed, and the flood has begun. Genesis 7, 10, 10. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. At this point, the forty days have started. Now let's go to the main part of this story that Jesus is referring us to from Luke 17 to understand his connection to the 40 days being before or above 14 years and right before the tribulation begins. Genesis 8, 6, 13. 6. And it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. And he sent forth a raven, which went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth. Also he sent forth a dove from him, to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. 9. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot, and she returned unto him into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand, and took her, and pulled her in unto him into the ark. And he stayed yet other seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came into him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. And he stayed yet other seven days, and sent forth the dove, which returned not again unto him any more. And it came to pass in the six hundredth and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark. As you by now know, the tribulation time of seals and trumpets is 14 years. And did you notice that after the 40 days, we read in verses 10 and 12, seven days and seven days? Let's look at Mark's portion first. You will notice this first seven days, as a type and shadow of years, has passed in verse 10, when the dove returns, except only this time it has an olive leaf branch plucked off. This is the representation of the end of Mark's portion at the end of seals, rapture. Let's see what the meaning of the word rapture is, or more specifically for this one we read in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 4, was caught up. It is the Greek word G726 harpazo, meaning catch, away, up, pluck, or plucked as we just saw after the first seven, after the 40 days. Fitting is it not? And consider also that we are told the Gentiles were grafted in as a wild olive branch into the true olive tree. The dove came back with a plucked off olive leaf, H5929. And to be sure, let's see what this word leaf means. Leaf, H5929, a leaf as coming up on a tree, collectively foliage, branch, leaf. Here is what Romans tells us about this branch. Romans 11:17. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, wert grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree. So you can see why the dove, after this first seven days' years, has the olive leaf branch plucked off. It represents the end of seals and the church age at Mark's mid-tribulation rapture. As for Matthew's portion, we read in verse 12 that the dove goes out again after its second seven, and it returns no more, showing us clearly that this is now the end of tribulation. 
the 14 days last years are over, being the end of Matthew's portion. So let's go see what the last chapter of Matthew tells us. Matthew 28, 18 to 2018. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. He will now remain on earth with them until the end of it, which is at the end of trumpets, to the end of the world, at the end of the one thousand year reign. Where do we find the forty days going back to the beginning of this story? Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 12, 2, above, fourteen years ago. Just like Jesus clearly tells us in Luke 17, 25, but first, telling us that his day s will be forty as Noah's, that they will come first and will be before the fourteen years of tribulation, and during those forty days he will do as Jonah did, warn the people. Unfortunately, he then also tells us that during this time he will be rejected. Let's continue to build on the dove and its type and shadow in the Noah story. We find the first account of the Holy Ghost dove in the New Testament in Acts 2. This was after the forty days of the Son of Man has just ended from Acts 1, after his resurrection. In the Old Testament, the first place the dove shows up is in Genesis 8.8, 8, and we just showed how it is representing the same type and shadow of the Pentecost story, which is the time frame of the Holy Ghost after the forty days of the flood portion, to the dove. So let's look closer to see what this storyline from the New Testament tells us. Old Testament, Noah's flood, family saved forty days, short time to sending out the dove, fiftieth day. Then the dove returns to ark. Seven days years, dove goes and returns with plucked leaf branch. Seven days years, dove sent out and never returns. End times, escape of the bride, Luke. Forty days of the Son of Man, Luke 24 after his resurrection. Short time to sending out the Holy Ghost dove, fiftieth day. Then Holy Ghost returns to heaven, Acts 2. Tribulation begins with the first seven years, seals and then rapture of the grafted in branch, Mark. Second seven years, Trumpets, and the Lord returns never leaving again, Matthew. Please see for easy reference the 14-year timeline chart in the appendix at the back of the book. The Resurrection On a final note in the Synoptic Gospels, I want to show you one last beautiful type and shadow of the Lord's bride, his body, that yet again lets us know she is taken before the forty days of the Son of Man's warning, and that it truly is Luke that is representing her in his Gospel, here in the resurrection story, you see very different and specific wording in Luke than you do in the other two. Luke, Luke 24, 3 to 4. 3 And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Mark, Mark 16, 5. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment and they were affrighted. Matthew, Matthew 28, 2-3 And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. You will notice it was only Luke's gospel that said, His body was not found. Considering everything being revealed in connection to his coming forty days, and that the Bride of Christ, his body, must be removed before his forty days begin, you can see why the body was not found, and what followed and will follow the resurrection of the Bride this time. You got it. The Son of Man's Forty Days In this next portion, called a word of caution, the caution is not the understanding of the forty days, but to caution because of the source. It is not from Scripture, However, it is so relevant, I felt I had no choice but to share it with you and explain it. A word of caution that gives greater evidence. As great a place that might have been to end this topic, I want to put forth one more piece of evidence. It is not from the Bible. It comes from one of the enemy's playbooks. I like to share this whenever I talk about the 40 days of the Son of Man because it is quite eye-opening. Some will even say, why is it in one of the enemy's books and not given so clearly in our own? The answer is, 
the Bible has clearly told us, as you have just read. However, the issue it will always come back to as to why it was not until now is we have all been taught to understand from the perspective of Matthew's Gospel, and it has caused us to miss more than half of the understanding in the end time story. As for my answer to your question, why so clearly in the enemy's books? I believe the enemy has told them ahead of time in the hopes that he does not lose any to the truth when the Son of Man does come and is performing many incredible miracles during those days. Remember what Jesus said in Luke 17.25 about this time. Let's go to Jesus' own words again in Luke 17.25. 25 But first, must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation? So what evidence do we have from one of the enemy's books that I like to share? It is the story of the coming of the Dajjal. The Muslims call the Dajjal the Christian Antichrist. And from what I have just explained about the Son of Man coming for 40 days and how people are still holding on to those scriptures that say many will come in my name, it is easy to see how Jesus will in fact be rejected of this generation. As you will see, he clearly is not the Christian Antichrist, but most will not understand, because the sleeping church, left behind, was taught that Antichrist comes first. How can we know for sure that this really is not the Antichrist? The easy answer is that it is in one of their books for starters, and they are calling him the Antichrist. First, let me share with you the main points of this person compared to their two guys coming after him. They say this Dajjal person will be here for 40 days. We asked, how long will he remain on the earth? He replied, 40 days, and that he will be doing so many incredible miracles, which include such as healing the sick, raising the dead, although only when supported by his demonic followers, it seems, causing the earth to grow vegetation, causing livestock to prosper and to die, and stopping the sun's movement. His miracles resemble those performed by Jesus. The relation between the two is obscure. This is all literally written about this Dajjal person found in one of their books. This information is from atn1enwikipedia.org slash Dajjal. Wikipedia Dajjal page. The Bestingling. They say he will be doing such incredible miracles that it will be hard to distinguish between what Jesus did when he was here and what this person will do. Christians have been taught to believe that the Antichrist will come first, when in fact Jesus as the Son of Man will be here first for 40 days. And they go on to say that their two people who will come after will be the real Jesus but in reality will be the biblical false prophet, and the other will be their Mahdi, who will be the actual Antichrist. They say their real Jesus will go after this Dajjal person, our Jesus Messiah, and get rid of him, and then their Mahdi will rule for either six, seven, or nine years. We know here that this rule will be more like six years during the seals portion before the rapture of Mark's group in the seventh year Sabbath of seals, are you now seeing why the Son of Man will be rejected? The Left Behind Church has no idea who he will be, and sadly, most of them will reject him too. Now, you see how confused the church is and why this is so important. Everyone out there is saying that it is seven years and the Antichrist will come first. Although the Antichrist does show up around the start of the 14 years, he does not come first. I cannot stress enough how important it is that we understand this revelation of Jesus in Luke 17 and Luke 11. He, Jesus as the Son of Man, will be here for 40 days to warn the people, even in the midst of rejection again, before the Antichrist comes on the scene. Please note that although he will be rejected, there will be some that come to him believing and knowing who he is. They will become his apostles and disciples. These will be those who will receive the end time Acts 2.0, as we call it, the Holy Ghost anointing on the 50th day to lead the great end time revival during the tribulation of seals. Now is the time to seek him and take comfort in him, knowing that his bride will not take part in any of this. For those reading this shortly after his bride has been taken, tens of millions of people having vanished, know that the first person on the scene giving warning and doing incredible miracles is the Son of Man, fulfilling his 40 days warning. And for those after this period of time, when the Son of Man is gone, know and understand that the two who will shortly after come on the scene are the Antichrist Mahdi 
and the false prophet, who they will call Jesus. Do not follow them at any cost. Call out to Jesus Christ, repent, and ask him to forgive you all your sins and to guide you in this time in his will. I promise he will hear you. Psalm 38, 1. O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Two, for thine arrows stick fast in me, and thy hand presseth me sore. Three, there is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger, neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. For mine iniquities are gone over mine head, as in heavy burden they are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. Six, I am troubled, I am bowed down greatly, I go mourning all the day long. For my loins are filled with a loathsome disease, and there is no soundness in my flesh. Eight, I am feeble and sore broken, I have roared by reason of the disquietness of my heart. Lord, all my desire is before thee, and my groaning is not hid from thee. Ten, my heart panteth, my strength faileth me, as for the light of mine eyes, it also is gone from me. My lovers and my friends stand aloof from my sore, and my kinsmen stand afar off. They also that seek after my life lay snares for me, and they that seek my hurt speak mischievous things, and imagine deceits all the day long. But I, as a deaf man, heard not, and I was as a dumb man that openeth not his mouth. Thus I was as a man that heareth not, and in whose mouth are no reproofs. For in thee, O Lord, do I hope, thou wilt hear, O Lord my God. For I said, Hear me, lest otherwise they should rejoice over me. When my foot slippeth, they magnify themselves against me. For I am ready to halt, and my sorrow is continually before me. For I will declare mine iniquity, I will be sorry for my sin. 19. But mine enemies are lively, and they are strong, and they that hate me wrongfully are multiplied. They also that render evil for good are mine adversaries, because I follow the thing that good is. Forsake me not, O Lord, O my God, be not far from me, to make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. Chapter 4, The Revelation of Daniel 9 I would like to start out by saying I am not going to be speaking about what was, meaning I am not proving out the count of Daniel 9 to when Jesus came the first time, even though it was incomplete. This study is the revelation of the is to come, and you will see the confusion and misunderstanding in the wording that has been taught by churches for so long, including that famous verse 27 everyone likes to go to. This has been something that truly needed clarifying. We are not going to go into detail on all of Daniel 9. Our focus will be on the very famous portion, Daniel 9, 24 to 27. Let's start by first reading it all. Daniel 9, 24 to 27. 24. Seventy weeks, H7620, are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment, H1697, to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks, the street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. I do not want to get too caught up in the understanding or revelation of the seventy-seventy weeks that starts verse 24. However, there is great importance in truly understanding where the end of seventy years is according to the Lord God. Throughout Scripture, from Daniel to Jeremiah to Zechariah and many more, all tell us of the 70 years. That is why I do need to make a couple points regarding it, because we need this understanding to form the foundation of what is to follow. This is that Israel came into the land that the Lord gave them again almost 2,000 years later, in May of 1948, which means that the 70th year of Israel having been in the land 
came to an end in May of 2018. For a while, many have spoken about the 70th year of Israel being a sure sign to look for the coming of the Lord. However, as you know, Israel's 70th year has come and gone. Did God make a mistake? No. What many failed to see and understand was that there were two very important factors in Scripture to understand. The first was the discovery by Valerius Kuch of Belgium, when he showed why the counting of the years in the reigns of the kings of Israel and Judah had never equaled what the Scripture told us. He discovered this was due to what he called non-accession, an accession of the kings. The northern tribes of Israel's kings began their counts of kings from the spring. When a king had died and the new one would take his place, he was considered to have been in his first year from the moment he started his reign, which meant it didn't matter if he had one month or 11 months, for example, before spring. That portion of time was called his first year, and at spring he began the second year of his reign. This is called non-accession. However, in the southern tribes of Judah's kings, they began their counts of kings from the fall. And when their king died and the new one would take his place, he was not yet in his first year as king, but rather was in his accession, which meant in their case, whether he had taken over one month or 11 months, for example, before fall. He hadn't actually started his first year until the fall, which helped us add to the understanding of the 70-year count today. Because though Israel came into the land in May 1948, they aren't the house of Israel. They are the Jews of the house of Judah, which means their count didn't actually begin until the fall. But there's one more piece to complete this revelation, and that is found in Leviticus 19, 23-25, God tells us that they were not to begin from the day they came into the land. Leviticus 19, 23-25 23, And when ye shall come into the land, and shall have planted all manner of trees for food, then ye shall count the fruit thereof as uncircumcised. Three years shall it be as uncircumcised unto you, it shall not be eaten of. But in the fourth year all the fruit thereof shall be holy to praise the Lord withal. And in the fifth year shall ye eat of the fruit thereof, that it may yield unto you the increase thereof. I am the Lord your God. According to this scripture, when they came into the land in May 1948, it was not only about coming into the land, but in verse 23, he also told them they had to plant trees as part of the process that would begin their time in the land. And this did not happen until February 14, 1949, on the New Year of Trees for them which meant, once that had happened, they could begin their count in the land. But now recall accession and non-accession. This is the house of Judah in the land now, which means the count God gives them next goes from fall to fall, or more specifically, from the Feast of Trumpets to the Feast of Trumpets. And continuing in verse 23, he tells them they were not to take from the land for three years. This would then have been from September 1949 plus three years equals September 1952, in which the three years would then have been completed. Then verse 4 tells us the fourth year belongs to him, September 1952 to September 1953. And final verse 5 in the fifth year, it was theirs to eat from, September 1953 to September 1954. Now, their 70-year count begins. The Feast of Trumpets 1954 to the Feast of Trumpets 2024 is 70 years. With that clear up, let us continue on to the second point on the word weeks. When reading this in the end time understanding, we cannot look at it as time seven to seven weeks count as it was understood to be the first time Jesus came. The churches have tried to carry forward this way of counting it into the end times understanding, but it cannot be done. It has only brought confusion. Remember, we are not looking at what was, but what is to come. At a closer look at the word weeks, we see it means Shabua, which represents the Feast of Weeks, or as most of us know it by Pentecost, just as we read in Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23, 15-17 And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering. Seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number fifty days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. 17. Ye shall bring out of your habitations 
two wave loaves of two tenth deals. They shall be of fine flour. They shall be bacon with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. We get the understanding here, but we are missing the word definition for feast of weeks. For that we will have go to Exodus 34, 22. And thou shalt observe the feast of weeks, H7620, of the first fruits of wheat harvest, and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. H7620, Shabua, Shabua, or Shabua, also feminine, Shabua, properly passive participle of H7650 as a denominative of H7651, literally sevened, i.e. a week, specifically of years. Seven, week. This is telling us the Feast of Weeks is Shabua. Let me emphasize that we are not looking at this to say times seven. We are reading it for what it is directly saying, and that is 70 Feast of Weeks. What is to happen after these 70 Feasts of Weeks, Pentecost years have come to an end? The answer lies in verses 25 to 27. Daniel 9, 25, 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment, H16, 9, 7, to restore and to build Jerusalem, we see in this verse that there is a commandment given to start to restore, rebuild Jerusalem. From this, we can see that Israel will be attacked and destroyed first in order to be rebuilt, which as mentioned earlier, is explained in the middle verses of the chapter. An important question we should ask is, who makes this commandment decree declaration, H. 1697? For that, 2 Chronicles 36, 21 to 23, 21, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill threescore and ten years. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and put it also in writing, saying, 23, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him an house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord his God be with him, and let him go up. We see here the seventy years again, as the threescore and ten years, and that the land is going to lay desolate for a period of time, so that the land enjoyed her Sabbaths. These words of the land enjoyed her Sabbaths are very important to our end-time understanding. And finally we see that Cyrus is the one who made the decree commandment to rebuild. What is this period of time for Sabbath rest that she is to enjoy? And why? Remember, we are looking at this and how it relates to this period of the end times that is just about to begin on the earth. Let's consider the now of it. Since Israel has captured Jerusalem, it has been a little over 50 years. And in that time, has Israel ever once allowed the land to rest? The answer is no. This rest was commanded and written in God's law. Leviticus 25, 3-5-3 Six years thou shalt sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field, nor prune thy vineyard. That which groweth of its own accord of thy harvest thou shalt not reap, neither gather the grapes of thy vine undressed, for it is a year of rest unto the land. This is telling us that every seventh year was to be a time of rest for the land, and they were not to plant or harvest it. They were to rely on God that he would provide their needs in obedience. This was to continue every seventh year they were in the land, in particular Jerusalem. They are told in the following verses that they were to continue doing this every seventh year, for seven years for a total of forty-nine years. The fiftieth year would be a special time called the Jubilee year. Leviticus 25, 8-10, 8 And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years, and the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. In the day of atonement shall ye make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. And ye shall hallow the fiftieth year, and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you. And ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family. 
Again, this is not something they have observed since capturing Jerusalem. Is God only going to shrug his shoulders and say, oh well, to this disobedience? They of all people should have known better. God does not change. Judgment comes to the house of the Lord first. The Lord commanded the land to rest. Now that we know what was required of them concerning the land, what does Scripture tell us would happen should they not be obedient in this commandment? Leviticus 26, 32-35, 32. And I will bring the land into desolation, and your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished at it. And I will scatter you among the heathen, and will draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate, and your cities waste. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths, as long as it lieth desolate, and ye be in your enemy's land, even then shall the land rest, and enjoy her Sabbaths. As long as it lieth desolate, it shall rest, because it did not rest in your Sabbaths when ye dwelt upon it. How much more clear does it have to be? Also remember that Second Chronicles 36 verse 21 told us this period was related to 70 years, and that Cyrus would come to power and be the one to make this decree. When we go back to Daniel 9.25, we can see and understand why what follows the decree is a portion of time called Seven Weeks Feast of Weeks, or as we now know, Seven Years, is mentioned. It has to do with their failure to have observed the Sabbath years once every seven years since having Jerusalem. Now the land will take her rest as per God's law, only through judgment by destroying the land. We have heard countless reports that Israel is about to build the third temple, but from what we have just read and come to understand, God cannot allow it to be built on his land until the land has had her appointed rest for seven years. The second part of verse 25 tells us, Daniel 9, 20, 25, and three score and two weeks, the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. We notice that there is a separation between the seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. This separation with a comma and the word and tells us that these are not part of the same period of time, but are added together, making it seven weeks years plus threescore and two weeks. This period of threescore and two weeks refers to a period of 3.5 years. I know and understand that some will say, how? I will answer you shortly. Let's keep looking at what is happening during this portion of time. This time is the period where the rebuilding will actually take place, which as we know, can only happen after the land has rested for seven weeks years. This rebuilding will go on for about 3.5 years. What happens after these 3.5 years? Daniel 9.26 and after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, proving to us that this period of rebuilding will not be during the first seven-week years portion, but clearly taking place during the next 3.5-year portion of time. Once this time is over, Messiah would be cut off. This brings me to where I said I would answer your question about the 3.5 years. We discussed Psalm 90 verse 10 in chapter 2, but we now need to consider it to understand Daniel's count. Psalm 90 verse 10, 10. The days of our years are threescore years and ten, our seventy years we were looking at again. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, eighty years, yet is their strength labor, H299, and sorrow, H25, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Meaning from seventy to eighty years is labor, H599, miserable, seri, pain, perverseness, sorrow, toil, travail, trouble, wearisome, wickedness, and sorrow, H5, trouble, vanity, wickedness, specifically an idol, affliction, evil, false, idol, iniquity, mischief, mourners, ng, naught, sorrow, unjust, unrighteous, vain, vanity, wickedness. Then a short period of time called soon, or about six months, so we have from 70 to 80 plus 0.5 years equals 10.5 years to cut off. So far, we have had seven years land at rest, plus 3.5 years rebuilding equals 10.5 years to Messiah cut off in Daniel 9. To complete the picture of the evidence in Psalm 90 verse 10, we next have, we fly away. This period of time is the 3.5 years given us in Revelation 12, 14, that says she will fly away on eagle's wings to a place protected for a time, and times, and half a time, or 3.5 years, which brings the completed picture of Psalm 90, 10 to 14 years. And this is now where the rest of Daniel 9 gets very revealing and in greater detail. 
we just read that Messiah was cut off. This portion of time was not the first seven years. This tells us that Messiah must be the one here during this next period of 3.5 years during the rebuilding, since he is the one being cut off. So after the seven years of the land taking her rest, which is the six years of seals judgments and the seventh year rest period, the next 3.5 years, the Lord is here to watch over the rebuilding of Jerusalem before being cut off. So can we prove this is actually the Messiah and not just a reference of some anointed person? For one, we see him coming at the end of the sixth seal. Revelation 6, 16 to 17, 16. And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. 17. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Also in Revelation 14, 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. He is coming at the end of the sixth seal, or end of the first six of the seven years. And next we read in Revelation 7 that the 144,000 are being sealed for their upcoming work during trumpets. In Revelation 14, we see him standing on Mount Zion with the 144,000. In the second half of Revelation 7, Mark's group has been raptured. Remember, the rebuilding cannot yet begin until the seven years are completed. You may have asked yourself, what is he doing standing on Mount Zion? I will not go into all the details here. However, you can make a mental note of it as you will see it mentioned in other parts of the books as well. Let me show you another place that connects this timing on Mount Zion to this period of him being here when the rebuilding is to begin. It is truly incredible. Zechariah 8, 3. 3 Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. A few verses later, in the same chapter, he goes on to tell us they will now begin to rebuild, and that before this time there was no one to rebuild, because it was affliction time, and everyone was set against their neighbor, referring to the tribulation of seals happening. Zechariah 8, 9-10 Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Let your hands be strong, Ye that hear in these days these words by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid, that the temple might be built. For before these days there was no hire for man, nor any hire for beast, neither was there any peace to him that went out or came in because of the affliction, for I set all men, every one against his neighbor. These are clearly showing us the Lord will be here on Mount Zion at the time the rebuilding will begin, after the first seven years are completed. And in the chapter called, The Books Have Opened, you will see this incredible connection as to why this is spoken of in Zechariah 8 of all chapters. But now, why or how could Messiah be cut off? Looking at what follows 10.5 years, 7 years plus 3.5 years in the 14-year revelation, we see that it puts us at mid-trumpet's time frame, or at the first woe of the fifth trumpet, which is when Satan will have been cast down, having lost his battle against Michael, as we read in Revelation 12. Revelation 12, 7-9, 7, 7, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought, and his angels ate, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Which is then followed by telling us the time frame that this happens. Revelation 12, 12 to 15. 12 Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe, this is the first woe, to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time, and times, and half a time, from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her 
to be carried away from the flood. We see this is the same 3.5 year reference we showed for Psalm 90 verse 10 after the 10.5 years, the we fly away, which was also the reference to Daniel 9.26's 10.5 year point to the cutoff. This would tell us the reason for Messiah's cutoff because Satan has now been cast down to the earth. So continuing with the rest of Daniel 9, Daniel 9, 26, 26, And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Now we can understand who this lowercase p prince is. With Messiah cut off, we can understand how it is that they will be able to destroy some of the city and sanctuary that has been rebuilt over the last 3.5 years. The next question is, what is this with a flood telling us? After Satan has been cast down to the earth, he will go after them with a flood. However, we read in verse 16 that the Lord will open the earth and swallow the flood Satan sends after them. As we continue in Daniel 9.26, we read, Unto the end of the war meaning there is a coming of an end to a war that started around the time Satan was cast down to the earth and went after the women with a flood. It turns out we have that war revealed to us in Revelation 11. Revelation 11, 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the two witnesses, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. The beast ascending out of the bottomless pit is when Satan will be cast down and the pit opened at the fifth trumpet, the first woe. Many think Satan will kill the two witnesses right away after being cast down as they finish their 1200 and 160 days of testimony, which will happen during the first half of trumpets while the rebuilding was taking place. If that were the case, why would scripture tell us he makes war against them? It would have simply said, he then kills them. We are told in the same chapter when they will be killed. This is only days before the end of the sixth trumpet time. This war will last for 2.5 years before they are killed. Let me prove this 2.5 years more clearly. First, we have understood that to the point of the cutoff of Messiah was 10.5 years of the total 14 years, leaving us only 3.5 years to go. We then saw in Revelation 12:14 that the ones taken to safety will be taken to safety until the end of the 14 years, because it told us time and times and half a time, which was explained earlier, the comma and the word and is a separation and addition. This is then 1 plus 0.5 or 3.5 years to the end of the total of 14 years. However, that last portion of Daniel 9.26 does not go to the very end of the story. We find the answer in Daniel 12 to how long it is. Daniel 12, 6 to 7. 6. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth for ever, that it shall be for a time, times, and an half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. He is told this final portion will be for a time, times, and in half. This is not the same as time, and times, and half a time. The difference is one year. This description of time does not have the and as an addition between time times, which means it is not adding the two, but simply counting one two, then plus 0 0.5 equals 2.5 years, which gives us our answer as to how long Satan brings chaos and will reign on earth for. In Daniel 12, 7, we read that at the end of that time, all these things shall be finished. The same as we read in Revelation 10. Revelation 10, verse 7, 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Up to this point in Daniel 9 to the end of verse 26, we have seven years land at rest, which is tribulation of seals happening, 3.5 years city and the temple being rebuilt until Messiah is cut off, 2.5 years Satan takes his reign at the time of the first woe of the fifth trumpet to the end of the sixth trumpet, equals 13 years, leaving us one year to go and one verse. Daniel 9, 27. 
and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So now who is the he that will confirm the covenant? It is Messiah Jesus coming back, feet down on the Mount of Olives, after Satan's 2.5 years, when all these things shall be finished. It was the Lord who made the covenant at the time of the end of seals, which is the beginning of trumpets. He then broke the covenant because Satan was cast down and the pit opened. As we read of this covenant in Zechariah 11, Zechariah 11, 10 to 11, 10, And I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder, that I might break my covenant, which I had made with all the people. 11 And it was broken in that day. I will bring greater understanding in context as to why this is found in Zechariah 11, of all places. In the chapter, the books have opened. So when he then returns feet down once and for all, he will confirm, exceed, confirm, be great, be mighty, prevail, put to more, strengthen, be stronger, be valiant. He will thus confirm that covenant he broke when Satan was cast down, which will be in that final one-week year. Look closely at the wording in verse 27. He is going to make the sacrifices end, and because of the abominations, he is going to make it desolate, H8074, that is, devastate, make desolate, ion, places, be destitute, destroy self, lay, lie, make, waste. Many have taught that this he is Satan, but why would Satan who is causing the overspreading of abominations and the sacrifices be the one that is going to destroy what he was actually doing. It is clear that the H.E. who is going to make desolate at the end is not Satan, but Jesus Messiah, putting an end to Satan's reign, and we read this again in Zechariah. Zechariah 14, 4, 4, And his feet shall stand on that day upon the Mount of Olives, not Mount Zion this time, final time, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst. And a few verses later we read about this destruction. He, Jesus, is going to bring against all those who came against Jerusalem. Zechariah 14 verse 12 And this shall be the plague, wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. Just as what we read next in Dan 9.27, even until the consummation, H367. Consummation, H67, a completion, adverbially completely, also destruction, altogether, be, utterly, consume, consummation. For generations, the church has believed that Daniel 9.27's one week is about the Antichrist. How or why could this thinking have been possible for so long? The answer is that the books had been sealed until the time of the end, as we were told in Daniel 12.4. The revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to was so vital to our understanding of rightly dividing the word in truth. The revelation of the final two sets of seven, or as we say 14 years, was the key to opening the end-time books. Once this was understood, the books began to reveal themselves one after another, and the end-time picture became more and more clear than it had ever been in all of history. Not because I did anything special, but because it was time. In summary, Daniel 9.24-27 is giving us another clear image with greater detail of the 14 years. Seven years starting with Jerusalem having been attacked, causing the land to enjoy her Sabbath rest, which is during the time of seals. 3.5 years when Messiah having come down on Mount Zion is overseeing the rebuilding of Jerusalem during the first 3.5 years of trumpets until cut off at the casting down of Satan to the earth. 2.5 years, which is the beginning of the first woe at the opening of the pit, which is at the fifth trumpet beginning the second half of trumpets, right up until the end of the sixth trumpet. One year, which is the seventh trumpet, when Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives and destroys all who came against Jerusalem, equals 14 years. Chapter 5. The Differences and the Truth In this chapter, we will discuss the differences between the pre-, mid-, and post-tribulation beliefs. For those new to this wording, it means the difference between the belief in a group taken away in what is called the rapture, either pre-, before the tribulation begins, 
mid, of course, the halfway point, or post at the end. This is important that we unravel the mystery of the differences of opinions that have been around for hundreds of years that has been causing so much division in the church. The reality is that there is plenty of scripture to support all three beliefs. I can speak for myself when I say, before the books began to open, I bounced back and forth a few times between believing it was pre compared to mid. The reason being that the scriptures that were being presented by those in their position of pre and mid were convincing to support their position. However, as the books began to open, and I understood that the Gospels were speaking to different groups in their end-time understanding, and the 14 years began to reveal itself, I could clearly see the truth, which is exactly what we are going to show you here in this chapter. They are all true. The only way to see and understand it is with the understanding of who the Gospels are speaking to and the 14 years. That is why the first two chapters of this book are so vital to understand the rest of the revealing of the open books. Also, the reason why I call those first two revelations the two keys to end-time understanding. This is no light task to reveal, considering it is something that has been debated for hundreds of years. Innumerable books have been written on the topic. However, I am going to reveal it to you in a chapter. Not because it could not have its own book, but because the keys to truly seeing and understanding it have already been given to you in the first two chapters. Once you see it, you will not be able to unsee the understanding, having the two keys as a foundation as to who the Gospels are speaking to and the 14 years. So let's first begin with why the Church for generations has only believed the Tribulation was only a single seven-year period, and what are the different ways in which they teach it. Daniel 9, 27, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. This one verse has been the main cause of all of the differences on the surface. I will get to that on the surface in a moment. So why this one verse? Because what has been taught is that the one week means seven years, and the midst of the week is the midpoint of tribulation when the enemy will break the covenant that he will have made with many. The reason for this view of one week equaling seven years is because of one of the descriptions in the understanding of the word week. This word means days in a week, and has been taught as meaning seven days in a week, which must be seven years. In this thinking, the teaching says, the first portion of verses 24 to 26 have already been fulfilled when Jesus came the first time. Thus, they no longer have anything to do with the end times, only verse 27 to their understanding. This has been the teaching for the past several generations. However, if you have read our Daniel 9 chapter, you will have already understood with clarity that this thinking is completely inaccurate. It has brought even more confusion and unanswerable questions. Daniel 9 also revealed to us that one week in the end times revelation is literally to be understood as one year. Exactly as the 70 weeks, 7 weeks, etc., they are all to be understood as years. Now, as I mentioned, there is more to why they have this thinking. The on-the-surface part of it is their understanding of 7 years. Why they think 7 years only has a much deeper reason. I would say it is subconsciously. The reason for this bend towards 7 years is that all of it goes back to being taught from Matthew. You might be thinking, what? What does the Gospel of Matthew have to do with them only seeing seven years for the tribulation? Let me explain. You have just come to understand who the Gospels are speaking to, and that Luke is speaking to the Bride of Christ, Mark is to the sleeping church who will go through the seal's judgment, and Matthew is to the Jews, Judah, during the trumpet judgments. You have also understood that the tribulation of seals and trumpets is two sets of seven years. What has caused them to see or understand only seven years in the first place is the fact that the entire church has been teaching eschatology from a foundation in Matthew. They base it from Matthew's discourse in chapter 24, meaning their perspective and the perspective they have been teaching everyone from is that of the Jews, Judah. 
and what portion of time during the tribulation is to Matthew's group. The last seven years of trumpets. Most of the church at this point, with the exception of those who have come to understand these revelations, believe that there will only be a seven-year tribulation. There are two ways that their pre-tribulation teaching will play out. The general belief is that it's going to be 3.5 years of seals and 3.5 years of trumpets. And within this thinking, there are those who are pre, mid, and post, and each believes that at their point, the rapture will happen. Now there is something else that they have missed in their teachings as well. According to God's law, it is always six and the seventh is rest, as we discussed in When the Years Just Don't Add Up. Leviticus 23, 3, 3, six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and holy convocation. Leviticus 25, verse 3 to 4. Three, six years thou shalt sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. For but in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field, nor prune thy vineyard. It applies to days of a week, as well as to a seven-year cycle, in which the seventh year is called the Shemitah year of release for the land and debts. Right off the bat, there is an issue in saying, the tribulation is going to be seven years. Let me share what to me is the most telling and revealing of how this Matthew foundation has caused all of the first seven-year portion of Mark to have been missed in this first view of their pre-tribulation rapture. In this thinking, they teach that the whole church is going to be going in the pre-rapture. Anyone who has simply said, I believe in Jesus, gets to go. What a shock and devastation they are in for. Because you see, with a Matthew perspective and believing you go before Matthew's tribulation begins, it would mean you are at the end of Mark's time and the end of Mark's portion is the end of seals. Just as we read here about the great multitude now standing before the Lord after the seals' judgments. Revelation 7, 9-10 After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Ten cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. This great multitude, which no man can number before the throne, is the rapture of the whole church. The issue, though, is that it is not pre, it is mid. Are you seeing how this Matthew foundation has completely confused all end-time teachings? They are teaching a pre because they can see it in Scripture, but they are teaching it from a mid perspective. In reality, what they say follows the pre is in fact mid. This is when the Antichrist will show up and settle the confusion and devastation due to a billion and a half people having vanished off the earth, bringing about a peace deal that will then allow Israel to rebuild their third temple. At the middle point of their seven years, the Antichrist is going to break that peace deal he made and step into the temple and declare himself to be God, which is the Matthew 24, abomination of desolation, that will take place. Then the trumpet's judgment will begin and go to the end of the seven years, which they see as the next half of the seven years, being 3.5 years to go. Depending how far along you are into this book, you will realize that they are confused and are actually seeing the seven years of trumpets. What do we know happens at the end of the first seven years of seals? The Lord has come down on Mount Zion, the was caught up rapture takes place, and it is the Lord himself who will make the covenant with all people. He will allow the rebuilding of destroyed Jerusalem and the temple to begin, not the Antichrist. The Antichrist's portion of time will have come to an end at the end of the sixth seal, as we have shown. What happens at the middle of trumpets is not the Antichrist breaking the covenant, but Christ breaking the covenant he made with all people. He is breaking it because this is the point when Satan is cast down and will open the pit, etc. So we can see how they are seeing part of it, but unfortunately completely mixing it up with portions that had already happened during the seal's judgment. So their pre-teaching view is that everyone goes. However, it is going to be a devastating shock to the 90% of the church who will end up remaining through to the end of seals. Those who have been taught this view and had not readied themselves for the Lord, thinking all they needed was to believe in him 
and they would get to go before it all begins, will be confounded and very livid with the church and pastors. They will be overwhelmed with absolute confusion and devastation. And by the way, this view, as well as the others in this seven-year-only belief, tell us that the Antichrist and Satan are the same. Make no mistake, they are of the same spirit, and Satan gives him his power and authority, but this does not make them the same. Otherwise, Scripture would not have told us this the following. Revelation 16, And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. How could there be seen three come out from the beast? Antichrist, false prophet and dragon Satan. This is because the Antichrist and Satan are two. But the reason these groups tell us they are one is because, again, they cannot see that they have missed half the tribulation and cannot account as to where the other would be if they were separate. Now, here is another view that believes the same seven years as 3.5 years for seals and 3.5 years for trumpets. However, where they differ is they believe the rapture is mid and they see it as being at the end of seals, which is good in the sense of the actual rapture of the whole church. Yet not a good thing when you realize they are telling everyone it will be about 3.5 years into the tribulation that they could expect to be raptured. And the reason this is not good either is because as they are telling everyone the rapture is coming and that the Lord is about to get them at this time, the one who is actually showing up around about this time of the middle of seal's judgment is the Antichrist, around the point of getting his power to continue 42 months. Now you might say, why would they still be thinking the rapture is still coming in 3.5 years? The answer is, very few will believe that the group taken at the beginning, the Luke group, was the pre-tribulation rapture. They will say the number of people who vanished was too few to have been the rapture, and many of them will say, because I am still here. Are you seeing how devastating this Matthew Foundation is to those who will still be here to the end? They are not seeing and understanding that the scriptures of Revelation 7 are clearly telling us the rapture of the church is going to happen at the end of seals. They have properly seen the rapture as mid, although very importantly in the wrong year count. However, they have not understood that the pre is not the rapture as it has come to have been understood, what we know as the escape. What they have done is point to everything that is fairly easy to understand as proving the rapture in mid, like Revelation 12 of 5's was caught up, which is clearly after devastation has already begun in the first few verses, and in Revelation 7 seeing it after the seal's judgments. What they have missed is the portion that has told us before it all begins. Or, before she travails, she brings forth. There is a group that is being taken out pre that is not the rapture, and many have come to understand this from the famous verse people like to point to as pre and are correct in doing so. Isaiah 66, 7. 7. Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child meaning before the tribulation, or we would say pre-tribulation. If we go to Revelation 12, we can see where this pre must happen before her travail has begun. Revelation 12, 1 through 2. 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. 2. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. I love it when scripture is so clear in what it is telling us. This was the beginning, as I mentioned, when the books began to open to me. The realization that the first group must go before verse 2 of Revelation 12, and not as we were being taught as being the one from verse 5. Revelation 12, 3-5, 3, 3. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads, Four, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. This is clearly after much devastation has taken place, 
mentioning her travailing in pain of verse 2 and a third of the stars being cast down to the earth in verse 4. Proving that this was caught up is the rapture they all speak about, yet it is at the end of seals. So where else can we understand this other pre that is not the rapture, but is like a rapture? We have covered it in the chapter revealing the 14 years. But I love sharing this one, so let me remind you of it. 2 Corinthians 12, 2-4 Second, I knew a man in Christ above fourteen years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such in one, the wording means like, similar, caught up rapture to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up, here you find the same wording from Revelation 12.5, into paradise, mid, and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Here is another view, however. I do not need to spend much time on it, except to tell you how they count it. They see the seven years of seals and trumpets as overlapping each other. People have come up with all sorts of ways to try and make sense of it all in a seven-year period. And within this group, you still have the same pre, mid and post thinking, and the pre in the similar sense of the whole church going at the start. There are many out there who believe in pre, but how they understand it will play out is where all the confusion begins. They are aware of Scripture clearly telling them not all will go first. Yet, they are also seeing Scripture that tells them the rapture is after some tribulation, as we read in Revelation 12, 1-5. And then they try to understand what they are seeing in the paradigm of only seven years with their foundation, unbeknownst to them, still stuck in Matthew. And we wonder why the confusion and so many struggling to see what we are sharing. This was and is the reason the first revelations that need to be understood are who the Gospels are speaking to, and then the 14 years, the two keys to end time understanding. As for those in the post tribulation thinking, they too have a piece that is correct yet in complete misunderstanding of it. They believe it will be at the end of seven years their view of the end of the tribulation. They do not believe that there is any pre or mid that will happen, but that it will only be when the Lord returns. And in their thinking, they would tell you that it is when the Lord will return at the end of seals and trumpets, feet down on the Mount of Olives, all in seven years. Yet as we have come to realize, the end of that time frame of seven years will not be when the Lord will return feet down on the Mount of Olives, but at the end of seals, when he will return on Mount Zion, that mountain carved without hands, when the actual rapture of the whole church will take place, not after trumpets, but after seals. So in their post-tribulation beliefs of when, being after seven years, which they think is the end of it all, they are actually incorrect in their understanding because their view is unbeknownst to them about the time frame of the rapture of the church. Again, even in this line of thinking, the issue goes back to their foundation being in the understanding from Matthew. So in summary of these groups, the pre has the understanding of the escape like a rapture and not the rapture. That is to say the difference as discussed in 2 Corinthians 12, 2-4, but are confusing it with the time when the whole remaining church will be taken, which is in reality at the end of seal's judgment. The mid are seeing it as the rapture in the right place as the church as a whole, except they missed seeing the escape of the pre, and they believe it is going to be after only 3.5 years into the tribulation to reach the end of seals. Unfortunately, this will only be about halfway through during the Antichrist time frame, and not yet the end of the seals' judgment. And the post, of course, miss the escape, but are seeing the rapture in the right year time frame, however, when that time actually is and what they are expecting, will not yet be the end of it all, but only the end of seals. And finally, let me end with this viewpoint that is also out there. Now, if the Lord has not revealed the open books, I believe this would have been the category I would have been a part of. This group believes in pre, but they believe we are at the end of the seals' judgments and right now waiting for the sixth seal to happen. Then the Lord will come and seal those 144,000 and rapture the whole church. After that, it will be the seven years of tribulation, 
but that it will be all trumpets. This actually would make the most sense in a seven-year, thinking when believing the whole church gets raptured pre, and that what follows is only for Judah, or what is known as Jacob's trouble. The only issue is, they have skipped the seal's judgment as being part of the tribulation time and chalked them up to events that have happened on earth over the past 2,000 years since Christ's resurrection. Apparent good thinking when your foundation is in Matthew, except there is a big problem that still puts them at the end of Mark's gospel time frame that they have missed, including seals. They had to explain the seals somehow. Why? Because like all the other views, they are still stuck in seven years and a foundation set in Matthew. The answer is given to us in 2 Corinthians 12. Pre, Luke's group, escape of the bride, like a rapture, to the third heaven, above before. The 14 years begin. Mid, Mark's group, the rapture of the church, to paradise, after the seal's judgments, in the seventh year. Post, Matthew's group, Jews Judah, no one being taken, return of the Lord feet down on the Mount of Olives, after the six years of trumpets' judgments and thirteen total years are complete, he will fulfill the fourteenth year in the judgment of all who came against Jerusalem. Originally I was not going to add this chapter to the book because of a very tight time frame to get the book done. I did not think we would get the chance. But I am happy I was able to with the help of the Holy Spirit's leading and the help I have received from those involved in the producing this book. I believe it is a very important chapter to help bring about the understanding as to why there has been these differences. How was this all so misunderstood for so long? The answer, brothers and sisters, is that it simply was not yet the time for the books to have opened. God's plan will be completed perfectly according to His Word, but the decision as to whether you will be in the pre or mid group is still up to you until the pre has been removed. This is great news for all who have been praying for family and friends who have not yet given their lives to Christ as their Lord and Savior. They will still have a chance to go to paradise in the rapture. So do not stop praying for them and be sure to leave this book for them to find and send to others while you still can. Chapter 6, The End Time 7, Churches This is an awesome revelation, one that has also been a mystery for a long time. As I have been writing and considering just the number of revelations that have been written in this book, I am almost brought to tears again. This one, at the time of writing, is still pretty fresh and only came to be understood a few months ago. I had begun to understand a couple of the churches written in revelations in their portion of the end times. Like everyone else, it just was not clear to be able to say that we fully get it until I came across a similar chart to the one below while online doing a search on the church ages. Within minutes of reading this, they all clicked and made sense in their end time time frame. What was interesting is the site where I found it was using it to show church historians' beliefs that can be seen in the seven churches during the church age that is playing out. They themselves did not believe it was the case and simply wanted to show the other side's view by sharing the chart. I am grateful they did, because now I can show you that the understanding of the type and shadow that is played out over the 2,000 years of church history is indeed correct. I will also further prove what is coming in their end time, revealing as scriptures tell us. Ecclesiastes 199, The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. This is an important scripture as the truth of it is seen in what we have discussed in this book with regard to the future, specifically the end times. This will also apply to the seven churches. To bring it into even greater clarity, I would say it more like this, was, is, and is to come. Now at first, that would not appear to make much sense because there was no church in the was or before Christ. Church did not begin until the is that we would be considered in the tail end of right now which started at Pentecost. You may have heard pastors talk about this in the past. They would say we are in the Laodicea church age now, the last one, saying that this is why there has been so much falling away that has taken place over the past few decades. And they were right in what they were saying. So what do these two first portions mean? If you go to the chart below in the column named 
Israel's history typified, you will see that these are the events before Christ in Israel's history that had their significance in the was that tied into the is of current church history since Christ. What church historians and theologians discovered is that there was an association between the two over similar periods of time on both sides of Christ. Seven Stages of Church History Church Ephesus, the Apostolic Church, 30-100 to AD, the Day of Israel's Espousals, Exodus, Revelation 2, 1-7. Smyrna, the Church of the Roman Persecution, 100-313 to AD, the Period of Israel's Wanderings, Numbers, Revelation 2, 5-11. Pergamum, the Church of the Age of Constantine, 313-600 to AD, the Wilderness Period, Numbers, Revelation 2, 12-17. Thyatira, the Church of the Dark Ages, 600 to 1517 AD, the Wilderness Period, Numbers, Revelation 2, 18 to 29. Sardis, the Church of the Reformation, 1517 to 1648 AD, the Period of Israel's Kings, 1st and 2nd Kings, Revelation 3, 1 to 6. Philadelphia, the Church of the Great Missionary Movement, 1648 to 1900 AD, the Period of Israel's Removal, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Revelation 3, 7 to 13. Laodicea, the Church of the Apostasy, 1900 AD to present day, the period of Judah's kings, 2 Chronicles, Revelation 3, 14 to 22. So, for example, the first church, Ephesus, in the was of the history of Israel that they associated it with, was the day of Israel's espousals, or the Exodus. And in the is, it was the apostolic age after Christ was taken to heaven. The corresponding years in the is are from AD 30 to 100 approximately. People like to debate the years, but that has nothing to do with what we are revealing here. The approximate years are fine and will prove the revelation regardless. The point is the reference of all of them in their period of time that is just astounding. It is not difficult to see, but I will share another to make the point. Let's look at Sardis. The was they associated with the period of Israel's kings, and in the is of church history, it was the time of the Reformation in the years corresponding to A.D. 1577 to 1648. And why these events for each were associated with these years was based on the wording given to us in the seven churches of Revelation 2 and 3 to what was happening in those times. This is precisely how we're going to do it in the is to come. I am sure you have gotten the picture by now that without the keys, this too could never have been understood. Unlike the is of the past, almost 2,000 years, they had to be looked at in hindsight to understand where we are. But it was an incredible understanding. So much so that if those before had not discovered it, I could not have stood on their shoulders to see this is to come revelation. So now let me show you this is to come for all seven churches. Be sure to keep the 14 years in your thoughts and where Messiah was shown to be cut off at the middle of trumpets or 10.5 years into seals and trumpets judgment. At this point, one of the first questions people ask is, what about the Luke group that escapes everything before the tribulation? They have been taken already, as this is the beginning that represents the start of the tribulation of 14 years. They were the overcomers from among all these churches accounted worthy to escape all these things. These are the remaining who were not ready. Another question people ask is when the time represented for one church in its portion is past. Does that mean that the church that it represented is gone? The answer is no. The type and shadow is simply their representation in the time period they are found. Kind of like what we spoke about with the seals. Each will have its time that it will represent, while another may also be happening at the same time, but have its greater effect during its appointed time. The seven churches are all still here in one way or another in the is, yet as of this writing we are considered to be in the last one, Laodicea, so it does not mean that they are no longer around. The Church of Ephesus, Revelation 2, 1-2, 7-1, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. 
To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. We can see Ephesus has a relation to apostles and is the clue to the timing of the first end-time church period. In the end, this first period, as revealed earlier in the book, is going to be a period many call the coming greatest apostolic revival in all human history. It is going to begin after the Son of Man has left and the Holy Ghost will have come at what I earlier referred to as Acts 2.0. This is that period represented here as the Apostolic Church. It is this group chosen by the Lord while here to bring this revival about. And when the Lord comes on Mount Zion at the end of the sixth seal, this group will go where the rapture group will be taken, which is paradise. The fact that they will be here until the end of seals shows us that their work will not simply end after this church age ends, but will continue to the rapture to paradise. As in history with the Exodus, this represents the escape having happened right as this time is about to begin. The Church of Smyrna. Revelation 2, 8-11 And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Smyrna is loaded with information, but we are not going to go into each part. They are not told to repent. Out of all the seven churches, only they and Philadelphia are told not to repent. This is because those in Smyrna are those that will die for their faith during the tribulation. You see the connection to church history as persecution having begun, and in Israel's history, we see this is the time of the wanderings. This persecution is what we would call the early stages of persecution. However, the persecution coming against them will not stop. It will only get worse as we understand where we are in the tribulation. At this point, we are in the first 2.5 years of seals, and there will be persecution unto death during the greatest revival. We can also understand that these are those who, as persecution becomes worse, are found under the altar in Revelation 6-9 at the fifth seal. We see at the fifth seal they appear to have been there for a little while as they are crying out for God to avenge them. This group in Smyrna is then told they would not be hurt by the second death. What does that mean? The answer is found in Revelation 20 verse 4-6. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. 5. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. The ones from under the altar who died, or you could say, put their necks on the line for their faith in Christ. They are going to be resurrected at his return feet down, and the second death will not hurt them after their one thousand years with the Lord. Wow, what an honor this group will be given. The Church of Pergamum, Revelation 2, 12-14, 16-17-12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. 13. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. 16. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, 
let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. In this scripture it tells us where Satan's seat is and dwells, as the type of Antichrist in his place. Then there is a doctrine of Balaam, or a false belief being taught, which of course will be of the Antichrist as the Savior. If we go to church history, we see it was the time of Constantine coming to power, and he was a type of Antichrist as well. When we look at Israel's history, we see this equals the time of the wilderness. Well, how fitting is that? This is the period at which the Antichrist will be given his power to continue 42 months, the exact same period of time found in Mark 13's discourse, where we explained his abomination of desolation would begin at the time of his being given the power to continue 42 months and the time of the mark of the beast coming. Christians will be hunted, and also the reason why they will now at this point no longer try to understand but will now be fleeing into the wilderness, as Mark 13 told us at this time. When we look at the last verse for this church, we see the Lord told them he would give them of the hidden manna. And it just so happens, this is the group represented in its time as being the ones hiding in the wilderness. They will need to rely on the Lord's provision of manna while there. Next is the last church in chapter 2, and there is a good reason for that too. God is great. As I was about to add what this church tells us, I had to laugh at just how telling and awesome all this revealing is. The Church of Thyatira, Revelation 2, 18, 22, 25, 28, 18. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Twining, behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. But that which ye have already hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh, and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. 28. And I will give him the morning star. Going back to the chart, we see that church history tells us it was the Dark Ages, and what do you think will relate to this time in the second half of seals, the period during which the Antichrist is ruling? Looking at Israel's history, it tells us that it is still a time of being in the wilderness, exactly what this period will still be until the end of the sixth seal. Can you see why he now says, those who do not repent at this point will be going into the great tribulation, which would mean the trumpet's judgments that will follow. Then we read, till I come, and unto the end. That is because this will bring it to the end of the seal's judgment, which means the end of the sixth seal year when he comes. We are also given the words, with a rod of iron and the morning star. Where do we read about this rod of iron? Revelation 12, 5. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And what time have we understood this to represent? The end of the sixth seals, as the Lord, the morning star, will have come on Mount Zion and will rule with the rod of iron, which is followed by the rapture, as those caught up in the seventh year. It becomes so incredibly clear. And finally, let's not forget, I mentioned there was a reason why chapter 2 ended with this church. Are you seeing it now? It is because it is the end of the seals' judgment after the sixth seal years and the coming of the Lord on Mount Zion. So now with the Lord having come on Mount Zion, what have we come to understand comes next? The final seventh year of seals. The Church of Sardis. Revelation 3, 1, 3 to 5, 1. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. 5. He that overcometh, 
The same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Here we see that church history tells us it is related to the time of the Reformation, the period in which the Bible began to get translated into English, the main language people understood instead of what Rome was reading, Latin, that fewer and fewer understood and simply had to accept what was being said. This is also when the Bible started to come into the hands of the people and not just the clergy. Greater truths from the scriptures came to light. It was also when Martin Luther in 1517 wrote his 95 Theses, denouncing much of what the Catholic Church had been doing and posted the Theses on the door of the Castle Church in Wittenberg, marking the start of the Protestant Reformation. Do you realize how this period of church history proves out in the is to come to have been so very important? To the point that in the description of this church is what brings us to the end of the true church age, that equals the year of the rapture in the seventh year of seals. Consider what it is telling us in Israel's history. It is saying that it is the period of Israel's kings. Do you get it? The Lord is here on Mount Zion and will be Israel's king. This is what we see in Daniel 7 that we have spoken about in a previous chapter. Daniel 7, 13-14 I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion, and glory, and a kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. And according to the wording of this church, we see those who were watching would be ready when he would come suddenly, as that thief in the night but those not watching would not be. Remember this is coming to the end of Mark's group time, and the two very last verses in Mark's discourse tell us, Mark 13, 36 to 36, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping, and what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. We also read within this church that they will be those who will walk with him in white. This is exactly what we read will happen as we read in the scriptures regarding the first half of the seventh year of seals, when this will happen. Revelation 7, 9-10 Nine after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Ten and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. The Church of Philadelphia, Revelation 3, 7, 9 to 10, verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. Nine behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep, G53, thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God and I will write upon him my new name. Many have thought this church was to the Gentile bride of Christ. One of the reasons for that was that he would keep them from the hour of temptation, but that word does not mean he would remove them from it. Keep, G583, a watch, perhaps akin to G2334, to guard from loss or injury, properly by keeping the eye upon. He will be watching over them, protecting them from loss, and not be taking them out of it and clearly in the writing of the name of God on them, we can most certainly understand this as being those 144,000 who were sealed, having the Father's name written in their foreheads, as we also read in Revelation 14, verse 1. And if we follow the flow, the seals in the first seven years have now come to an end, bringing us to the beginning of trumpets and the Lord on Mount Zion as Israel's king. 
sending out the 144,000 who are going to be the evangelists during the first half of Trumpets. Just as we read, was the period that followed in church history as the great missionary movement. They are the ones we spoke about in Luke 10, who Jesus sent out, and when they returned to him, they were so excited by what they had been able to do in his name. Before he left them, if you recall, he said, I beheld Satan fall like lightning, and gave them greater power to tread serpents and scorpions, etc. This represents the middle of trumpets when Satan is cast to the earth. At the end of this period, when Messiah is going to be cut off, the city, walls, and temple will have been rebuilt. It will also be the time when Messiah will break the covenant in one day, which he had made with all people, because Satan is cast down. When we look at Israel's history for this church period, we see it is referred to as Israel's removal. I call this crystal clear revelation. And this brings us to the final of the seven churches of the end times, the church of Laodicea. The revelation of this church in the end will not disappoint in what it reveals to us either. Revelation 3, 14, 16, 20 to 21. 14, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. 15. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. First let us take account of where we are at. Of course, having been at the point where Messiah was being cut off, that put us at the middle of trumpets, or three five years into trumpets, or ten five years total. So with this in mind, let's see what church history has to tell us. It says that this church period represents the apostasy church. Well, let us have a look at what the scriptures tell us about the time of apostasy. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3-4 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away. First, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Falling away, G646, defection from truth, properly the state, apostasy, falling away, forsake. The meaning of falling away means apostasy. Look at who this time is connected to. It will be the time when the son of perdition is revealed and when he will sit in the temple, which means it was rebuilt, exactly when he will declare himself to be God. We know when the temple was finished, so that timing is correct. But how about the son of perdition? When do we know his time is? You will remember we covered this as well when I shared he was, then is not, and shall be, when the pit is opened. Revelation 17, 8. 8. The beast that thou sawest was, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life, from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. Once again proving this same period of time is the middle of trumpets when Satan has been cast down and the pit is opened, the time of the apostasy or great falling away. Concerning Israel's history, it tells us it was the period of Judah's king and this apostasy who will be sitting in the temple claiming to be God, Satan. So this period of Judah's kings, or in this reference as one of them, is Satan. Jesus is the one who told us. John 8:39 to 44 39 They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. 40 But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication, we have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? 44. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. 
He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. And the devil, the father of lies, is the exact one here during this period. Looking at the wording for this church, we read that God is standing at the door about to come. The reason is that once this portion of Satan's reign ends after 2.5 years, it will be the end of this church's portion. The Lord will return feet down on the Mount of Olives, having been at the door ready to return. And finally he says to this church, to those who overcome this period, will I grant to sit with me in my throne. This will bring us to the end of the sixth trumpet, or six years of trumpets, which was Matthew group's portion. It would be interesting to read about this in Matthew. So, let's have a look. Matthew 19, 28 to 29. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. Regeneration, G3824, rebirth, the state or the act, that is, figuratively, spiritual renovation, specifically, messianic restoration, meaning when the Lord will have returned, in a type of rebirth, in the messianic restoration of all things, they will be sitting on thrones given to them with the Lord himself. Over and over again, book after book, portion after portion, not one jot or tittle out of place, all revealing the same thing. The books have opened, the understanding is true, and the time period is 14 years. I pray this will have blessed you in understanding him more, as it has me and many others. Another mystery revealed for a time of understanding such as this. Chapter 7. The Books Have Opened. This chapter is what I have come to call the chapters to years. It will not be the complete revelation of each and every chapter to year in the revelation. That on its own would be a very large book. But we are going to focus on several I believe are of greater importance to understand. This will at the same time teach you how to look at all the other books that have opened. You will be able to discern some of the events that will be coming on the earth during their appointed times in the end being prepared and not being caught off guard or deceived. See the one-page chart of all these opened books to their years in the appendix at the end of this book for an easy reference. These books can only be understood in this light with what we call end-time eyes, which is why this chapter is found later in this book. Prayerfully, you have come into those eyes in understanding the previous revelations we have discussed. My focus will be on some of the main points to prove to you that indeed the books have opened and are speaking in a revelation of chapters to years. There are no coincidences in the Word of God, meaning they are revealing information within each chapter about events we have come to understand that will happen during specific years, some even in the same chapter number. All these revelations began to open up once the two most important pieces had been revealed. Those were found in chapter 1 and 2 with regard to whom the Gospels are speaking to and the 14 years. Without those two keys, the door to understanding the end times with greater clarity could have never happened. Now let's have a look at this chart that we call the chapters to years. You will notice along the top of the chart 10 books listed from the Bible. It did not start with all of them right away when this first started to be revealed to me. It has been a process that I was only able to unfold as the 14 years became more and more clear. You will also notice there are two rows to the left for 22 years and another for 15 years. I will start by first briefly explaining the 22-year connection, as it has already been covered in great detail in Chapter 2 about the 14 years when the years just don't add up. Everything will be over and restored including the final jubilee, which is the 22nd year, or the same as saying the 15th year, as you will see at the bottom of both their rows. This is the big picture. These 22 years are connected to the Hebrew alphabet, which has 22 letters. The beginning of the story from year 1 is given to us in Genesis 29:31. The story of Jacob working for his two wives and cattle 
as discussed in chapter 2. In Genesis 29, we see he worked seven years before he received anything. This first seven years I call the working for the bride years, during which the Holy Spirit prepares the bride to be ready for the escape. The moment Jacob had completed his first seven years, not a day before, but immediately after, he went to his father-in-law for his bride. Once the wedding celebration was over, his father-in-law also gave him his second daughter, Rachel, who he really wanted in the first place. However, he was told he had to work still another seven years before she would officially be his. The start of this second set of seven years would have been the eighth year through to the end of the fourteenth year. When looking at the chart, you will notice that the end of the first seven years is directly in line with the time frame right before the 14 years begin, which is when Jacob got his first wife. You will notice the eighth year, or year one, is when the 14 years begin. From the start of the eighth year to the end of the 14th year in Jacob's story is giving us a type and shadow of the time frame of the first seven years of seals. After this, Jesus will get the ones he came for in the first place, just as Jacob did, having completed his second set of seven years. Finally, Jacob worked six more years for the cattle, which brings us to the end of 20 years, or on the 14-year portion of the chart, which we can also see as the end of the 13th year, both equaling the same time frame. At the end of this time, his father-in-law makes a covenant with him. This is where his story ends. Remember how it ended with a covenant after 2013 years? This will be a theme you will see connected to the time of the Lord's return, feet down on the Mount of Olives at the end of the sixth trumpet, the start of the seventh trumpet time frame. This will be the beginning of the 21st 14th year. Once the final year of trumpets ends, it will be the final year when all the tribes will return each to receive their lands in what will be called the final jubilee the 22nd, 15th year. And for those wondering, these final 777 years were the last three in the final jubilee count of 7 by 7, or 49 years and 50th jubilee. The end of the Lord, 2,000 years since his death and resurrection. I will try to be as detailed as I can after having laid some groundwork. Right along the top of the chart, you will see John, Genesis, and Judges as the only ones that cover the 21 years. Our focus will be on John and Genesis from chapters 1 to 21 to begin this incredible revelation. The beginning of it all from year 1 is the end-time connection of chapters to years for Genesis 1 1 and John 1 1, where both start by telling us, in the beginning, or in this case, the beginning of the end days when the first set of seven years began. Now let's see how this really proves itself out going forward. In the beginning was simply giving us the connection between Genesis and John. The first seven chapters slash years I call the easy years, referring to Jacob saying that the days went fast when he worked for the one he loved. This is the time where the Holy Spirit has been working hard to bring in and prepare the Gentile bride for the escape. So now if we go to chapter 7 into 8 of Genesis, we should then be able to see this type and shadow of someone that could represent the Gentile bride or Luke's group being protected or taken. Of course, what do we know about the conversation in those chapters? It is the story of Noah and the ark. Very fitting, isn't it? Genesis 7, 7 and 10, 7. And Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. When we get into chapter 8, we see the incredible connection explained in a previous chapter about the storyline of the 40 days coming to an end and the remaining two sets of seven days as years. Genesis 8, 6-9-6 And it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. And he sent forth a raven, which went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth. Also he sent forth a dove from him, to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot, and she returned unto him into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand, and took her, and pulled her in unto him into the ark. As you know by now, this represents the Son of Man's forty days, 
followed by the raven, H61 fate, which actually represents the Antichrist spirit going out after the Son of Man's time is over. Then the Holy Ghost, as the dove goes out at Pentecost, the 50th day, followed by the 14 years, raven H61 fate from H6150, a raven from its dusky hue, from 86150 Arab. And how does John 8 compare with a type and shadow of a Gentile bride being saved? John 8, 3 to 10. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, G 3430. And when they had set her in the midst, for they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself, and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? We have this woman standing in front of Jesus, and her accusers surrounding her, leaving one by one. Only Jesus remains, with her standing before him, still bent over having been writing on the ground, and as he lifts himself up, he sees no one but her. It does not get any more visual with words than that. Christ down on a knee, with his Gentile bride standing in the midst of him, and him seeing none but her as he rises. Now that is a very clear type and shadow. Some of you may be saying, but she is being called an adulterer? Let's look into the understanding of that word. Adultery. G3430 adultery. Adultery. Not much there, though, to help us understand how she could represent the Gentile bride or at least not on the surface. However, we do have a beautiful story in the Old Testament of a woman who was and is still called the Gentile Bride. Her name is Ruth. She even has her own book in the Bible. So let us go see if we can find a connection to her and this woman in John 8. Ruth 2, 10, 10, Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? H5237. Ruth, this Gentile bride-to-be of Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, calls herself a stranger. So let us see what this word means. Stranger, H5237, applications, foreign, non-relative, adulterous, different, wonderful, alien, foreigner, outlandish, strange, R, woman. This word adulterous, it turns out, is also a term used for a woman who is a foreigner, meaning Gentile. It sounds harsh to us but it is the same as when Jesus called the woman in Mark 7, a dog. An adulterer can and is also used to describe a Gentile woman. This is the type and shadow of John 8. At this point in the eighth day year, we are now at the first year of the 14 years of the tribulation about to begin. Let's have a look at some more books that equal this same time. We will start with Hosea and Zechariah and bring them into the big picture. You will notice first, that both of the books are exactly 14 chapters long, and they are the only ones in the Bible with 14 chapters. That was what first caught my attention, and then I realized that it was understood that one is written to the Gentiles and the other to the Jews, Judah. Let me start by showing with Scripture that Hosea is in fact the one written to the Gentiles. Once again, it does not get any clearer than this. We discussed this in the chapter called When the Years Just Don't Add Up, but I will just briefly refresh your memory. Romans 9, 24, 25, 24. Even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles, as he saith also in O.C. G. 5, 6, 7, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. O.C. Of Hebrew origin, Hosea, that is, Hosea, an Israelite, Hosea. Hosea, H. 1954, means deliverer, it tells us the book of Hosea is written to the Gentiles, but more than that, he will call her his beloved, who was not his beloved before. As discussed previously, Hosea is a type and shadow of Jesus as deliverer, exactly what Hosea's name means. 
So now what does Hosea, the deliverer, tell us in the beginning of his book that shows a Gentile bride being taken? Hosea 1 2 2. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take unto thee a wife of whoredoms. Recall the woman in John 8, the word means adultery, and children of whoredoms. For the land hath committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. This is the her beloved from Romans 9, that he said was not his beloved, but now she will be. Again, right at the start of 14 chapters, exactly where it should be in the understanding to make sense, and the exact same position of chapters to years as John 8 and Genesis 8. Jesus, the Deliverer, getting his Gentile bride. We also read as a further confirmation about this Gentile bride in the book of Acts. Without going into everything, the book of Acts shows us about all its chapters to years. Let's have a look at one in particular. Act 15, 14. 15, 14. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles, to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written. You can clearly see from the chart that the book of Acts has opened to us by dividing into two sets of 14 years' view. Chapter 15 is also in that first place again, as each of the others are. We see that God came to take out a group from among the Gentiles for himself. We are told the words of the prophets agree to this, and where was it just shown to you from? A prophet. How amazing is that? Here is a good place to let you also know that just because something happens in a chapter to any year, it does not always mean it is going to be at the start of that year. It could very well be the middle or even the end of the year that that discussion is referring to. It is the understanding of the end time scriptures that gives us the discernment. For example, in what we have discussed, it is easy to understand because we know the Gentile bride is removed right near the start of the 14 years. Here is another thing to consider as well. The end of a year and the start of another are essentially the same time as they are connected to each other, meaning where the one ends, the other begins. The same thing was happening here with these chapters. They are simply showing us the Gentile bride is taken right near the beginning. Now let's quickly turn our attention to Judah. As discussed before, just as Hosea was clearly written to the Gentiles for the end times, so is Zechariah and his 14 chapters to years written to the Jews Judah. We know that Israel Jerusalem will be attacked first, and then destroyed right around the start of the tribulation as well. Recall how we spoke in a previous chapter about the 50 years of having the land of Jerusalem. They have been disobedient, never having allowed the land to rest its Sabbath years, even once. That means it must be destroyed and then removed from the land because it must remain vacant of them for seven years before the Lord can allow the rebuilding to begin. And we know that time, as well as the end of the true 70th year, is literally just about up as I write this. You may even be reading this after it has happened. So knowing this for Israel Jerusalem, let's see what we read happens to them in their beginning, in Zechariah 1. Let me start with a little reminder we covered in Daniel 9. We read about an attack happening during the middle verses, before the 14 years began. If you recall, the 14 years will begin at Pentecost, or Feast of Weeks, as Daniel 9 verse 24 explained. We see how in Daniel 9 too, he told us that it would accomplish 70 years in the desolations. So let's have a read of Zechariah 1. Zechariah 1 12, 14 to 15 12. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah, against which thou hast had indignation these threescore and ten years? So the angel that communed with me said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. 15. And I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease, for I was but a little displeased, and they helped forward the affliction. H7451. Remember how God is angry with them for not allowing the land to rest during those Sabbaths? Look at what he says in verse 12. How long before you will have mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah? He is not speaking about the people. He is talking about the land, and he is about to remove them from it. There it is again. 
These, 73 score and 10 years, which means at some point in the 70th year, as we have been able to discern, we are right near the end of it. Affliction, H74 Fib 1, means evil, distress, sore, sorrow, trouble, vex, wicked, leanness, one, worst, wretchedness, wrong. This is the start of tribulation, war and destruction will begin in Israel. When you continue reading into verses 18 to 21, you see that they have all been scattered, all still in chapter 1. I have one more book I wanted to include in this chapter, and that is the book of Psalms. It was noticed, I believe, back in the 1980s to have had types and shadows of events to years within them and believed to have begun its count in 1900 or 1901. However, most believed it ended in the year 1999, while others still tried to say it kept going, but were having a hard time showing this same flow as earlier years. They would tell us it puts us in chapter 121 now, as we are in 2021 as of this writing. However, that is not accurate, as I will now show you. As the books began to open to me, this was one I really started to look at closely. I soon realized it was not happening in line with the years. Meaning, just because it was 118 did not mean it was 2018. I realized that there was a dual grouping like we saw in the book of Acts earlier, and that it started with chapter 18 and 118. Now when you read chapter 18, you realize this is a major event that has not yet taken place, and that 118 was similar in its wording. Psalm 118, however, did skip the details of the major event on earth, and also spoke about something else happening at that time. I soon realized chapter 18 was speaking to the event that was going to begin right before the 14 years of seals and trumpets started, which then made Psalms 19, 119 to 32, 132 the end time chapters to years, and made 33, 133 the final jubilee year, as you have come to understand as the 22nd, 15th year at the end. See the chart and how Psalms has two columns, starting with 18 and 118. You will notice that the first two fall in line with before the tribulation begins. After having taught on this for a few months, I received an email from someone who shared with me that there was this grouping of psalms called Song of Ascents, a title given to 15 of the psalms, 120 and 134, 119 and 133 in the Septuagint and the Vulgate. Now the 119 to 133 of course caught my attention. The Septuagint was in fact the correct one for us, as it was the original Hebrew to Greek translation. Back to their meaning, quoted from H. Tontine E. and Wikipedia, of course, Song of Ascents, these psalms were sung by worshippers as they ascended the road to Jerusalem to attend the three pilgrim festivals. It turned out they were an exact type and shadow, as these were sung at three ascents, or goings up to be with the Lord in Jerusalem. Or, you could say in the end times understanding, escape, rapture, return. What an incredible confirmation it was. So now let me show a little of what it says in the Psalms 18, which comes just before the 14 years begins. Psalms 18, 6 to 16, 19, 20. 6. In my distress I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him, even into his ears. 7. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken, because he was wroth. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils, and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also, and came down, and darkness was under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub, and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. At the brightness that was before him his thick clouds passed, hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the highest gave his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. Yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them, and he shot out lightnings and discomfited them. Then the channels of waters were seen, and the foundations of the world were discovered at thy rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of thy nostrils. He sent from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters. 19. He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands, 
H327, hath he recompensed me. Cleanness, H1252, from H1505, purity, cleanness, pureness. Hands, a hand, the open one, indicating power, means direction. You will see in a later chapter the reason I show these words for hands and cleanness here. They are not going to have the same meaning. Do you recall what Acts 15.14 told us a little earlier in the exact same place on the chart? How God did at first visit the Gentiles to take out a people for his name. Consider what is happening here amidst this chaos at his approach. I have to stop myself here for a moment because I have so many places I can go into to show how the end times are played out within all the different parts of all these open books listed on the chart. But I will stay on track with my plan for this chapter. So with that said, let's look forward to a few years slash chapters towards the end of the sixth seal time frame, as well as the seventh year Sabbath of seals and the first year of trumpets. These are the chapters to years on the chart of 13, 14 and 15 in the 22-year column, or 6, 7, and 8 in the 15-year column. I said earlier I would also show you more in Hosea. Remember, Hosea speaks to the Gentiles. And even though the bride was taken at the start, the bride was not the whole church, as we have discussed in the chapter of Who Are the Gospels Speaking To? Only the ready, watching, and praying were the bride. The rest of Hosea is still speaking to the sleeping church, the left-behind Mark group. In Hosea 6, we see what those having made it through six years of the seals are saying. Hosea 6, 1, 3, 1, Come, and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. They are saying that they have endured harsh tribulation. So let us return to him, which is the time of the end of the sixth year. So how is it they will return to him? Remember, they will have seen him coming on Mount Zion, and what soon follows will be the rapture. They are saying that after two days, or in reality, two thousand years, the Lord will bring them back after his return, feet down at the end and in three days, or three thousand years, which is when the one thousand years are finished, saying, We will be raised to life, and know whether we will go on to live with him forever. Let's have a quick look to see what we find in Psalms at this same period of time. Psalms 24, verse 1 to 4. Furna Psalm of David. The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. Two, for he hath founded it upon the seas, and established it upon the floods. Three, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean, fifth, hands, 709, and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. What comes at the end of the sixth year seal? The Lord coming on Mount Zion, the hill of the Lord. And when this happens, it will also be the end of the times of the Gentiles, which is also called the fullness of the Gentiles come in, or the coming end of Mark's group at the rapture. Who does it say at this time will be able to go up this hill of the Lord? Those with clean hands, let's compare them to the other two earlier. Clean, H5355, from H5352. Innocent, blameless, clean, clear, exempted from H5352, to be or make clean, literally or figuratively. So unlike the first group in chapter 18, this group had to be made or make themselves clean. And how did that happen? Through their enduring faith through much tribulation. And how about their hands? Hands, H3709, the hollow hand or palm, the leaves of a palm tree. Branch. The word in chapter 18 was a hand of power, whereas this one speaks of a hand holding a palm branch. This should ring a bell from the chapter The Forty Days of the Son of Man. We spoke about how the dove, when it goes out the second time in Genesis 8, 10 to 11, returns with a branch, in its mouth, plucked off, which was shown as a type and shadow of the rapture group. We are seeing the same thing here. Here it is a little more specific, in the sense that we are reading, it is about to happen, not that it has happened yet. This is why it says, who shall ascend, as if to say the time is just about at hand. Let me now show you this group with palms in their hands, having ascended, and now before him. It is found in Revelation 7, 
which is literally speaking to this same rapture group, but now having been raptured in the seventh year. Revelation 7, 9, 10, 14. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Ten cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed, washed their robes, and made them white, in the blood of the Lamb. As you can see, this is the group that has the have palms in their hands, and they made them white, to whiten, make white, whiten. This is that same group from Psalms 24 that is now before him, having washed themselves clean, and have palms in their hands. We are going to remain for the next few points in the same time frame as the seventh year of seals, with the Lord having come down on Mount Zion and Him gathering them to Him as we look at the other books. To start, we will keep in this Gentile line of thought, starting with John 14, which if you look at the chart again, you will see it is the seventh year of seals. John 14, 2, 3, Suku. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. This is a clear type and shadow reference to when he will come down on the mountain carved without hands, which is paradise, and will receive unto himself his rapture group into the place he has prepared, paradise. These chapters do not once fail to reveal in relation to an event or events during any of the end time years, as they should. Genesis 14, 18 to 20. And Melchizedek, H4442, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him, and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. 20. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. Here in the chapter to year for the seventh year of seals, we find for the first time in the Bible the name Melchizedek. If any of you reading have heard teaching about him before, you will know that he is a type and shadow of Jesus. Melchizedek, the high priest, is another name for Jesus, our high priest. The meaning of the name is Melchizedek, H4442, means king of right. And this chapter is telling us that God has delivered his enemies into his hand. How does that reference fit? When the Lord comes at the end of the sixth year of seals, he will destroy the Antichrist and false prophet system that had taken over the world with the mark of the beast spoken about in a previous chapter. It is the same reference from Daniel 2 about the stone that will crush the image and become a great mountain. This is speaking of the Lord on Mount Zion. At this point, let me show him to you in the book of Revelation, literally standing on it. Revelation 14, 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Now you can understand why the Lamb is standing on Mount Zion in this chapter. And the reason he is there with the hundred and forty-four thousand who were sealed from chapter 7 of Revelation is because they are about to begin their evangelizing at the start of trumpets. The Lord being there has caused many people to wonder for generations how this was possible when we have all been taught he does not return until feet down on the Mount of Olives, at the end of it all. A big mystery is what this coming on Mount Zion is going to look like. It is certainly going to be terrifying as we see people hiding in caves, crying out at the end of the sixth seal for the rocks and mountains to fall on them. Wow! Next, in Zechariah 7, we are given more understanding as to the timing in this place of the seventh seal. The Lord is rehashing why he scattered them back then throughout this chapter. He lets us know that the seven years that Jerusalem had to remain vacant is not over quite yet. Wait until we get into Zechariah 8 and forward. The conversation will then have strongly turned to the Jews Judah, which will begin their seven years after having been removed for the first seven years during Seal's judgment. Zechariah 7, 5, 7. 5. Speak unto all the people of the land and to the priests, saying, 
When ye fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even those seventy years, did ye at all fast unto me, even to me. And when ye did eat, and when ye did drink, did not ye eat for yourselves, and drink for yourselves? Seven, should ye not hear the words which the Lord hath cried by the former prophets, when Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity, and the cities thereof round about her, when men inhabited the south and the plain? It is all past tense, including those, and here it is again, seventy years, another one of those very clear pieces of end-time scriptures. This chapter represents the final seventh year of them having been removed. As we begin to close out this first set of seven years in the chapters to years, we are going to go with Psalms 25 and 125. Both of them have the same year representation on the chart, the seventh year of seals. The first will show you the same mountain again right in its place, but then the other, although in the same year, is a different message. Psalm 125, 1-2 They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people from henceforth even forever. Psalm 25, 10, 13 to 14. 10. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. 13. His soul shall dwell at ease, and his seed shall inherit the earth. 14. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. H. 1285. You will notice there is now this conversation about a covenant that he is about to make with them as they come into the land, which in the end time understanding is about to end the first seven years, when they are literally going to be coming back into the land with the Lord on Mount Zion. You will see this very clearly as we move into the next chapter to year. What is also interesting is that the seventh seal in Revelation 8 does not tell us too much, but it does tell us, for one, that it is a short period of time, which in heaven is called about half an hour. After all my studies and understanding of the end times in the open books, I believe this period of time on earth is going to be about six months. Now lining up with the first portion of the seventh year of seals, which was chapter 7 of Revelation, being about six months as well, this gives us a full year. Remember, as I stated earlier, it is not one seal per year. But there is more to this about six months of the seventh seal. That is that the word silence, G462, means silence or hush and comes from G4623, which also means be calm and to hold peace. I believe during this period of the seventh seal is when the Lord is going to be making his covenant with all, as you will understand and see much more clearly in a little bit. Covenant, H1285, a compact, confederacy, confeder eight. Covenant, League. This word for covenant found here in Psalms 25 is the same as seen in Genesis 15 18. Even though this word is used a number of times in Scripture, you must consider the context it is found in. In both of these cases, they are both speaking of the same thing at the same time in their chapter to year understanding. What are the odds of that? This is, when they will come into the land, the Lord will give them again. Now, as we move into the first year of trumpets on the chart, let's start with this Genesis 15 conversation to see what we are talking about. Genesis 15, 7, 18, 7. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. We see, he has in this chapter, to year now, brought them into the land and made the covenant, just as he will do when he comes on Mount Zion, and then in the first year of trumpets begin the rebuilding of Jerusalem. As I had mentioned, this is when everything for the Jews, Judah, really gets going again, because they had been removed and shattered for the first seven years during the time of the Gentiles. But that period is now over, it is their time again, known as Jacob's Trouble. We see right away in Zechariah 8 that it is the eighth year since the tribulation started, or the first year of trumpets time, as was Genesis 15. Zechariah 8 2 3. Sec thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I was jealous for her with great fury. 
Remember in chapter 1, the Lord said, I am, jealous, yet now it's I was, and the reason is because. Through thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion, and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts the holy mountain. He has returned on the mountain carved without hands, which became the holy Mount Zion, the mountain of the Lord, now established in Jerusalem, which is why we saw in Revelation 14, as mentioned earlier, the Lamb was on it with the 144,000 ready to be sent out. The Lord is now established at the beginning of trumpets in Jerusalem and will now remain there for the next 3.5 years or the first half of trumpets while the city, streets, wall, and temple are being rebuilt. But now let's see what else Zechariah 8 has to say to support this. Zechariah 8, 9-10 Nine thus saith the Lord of hosts, Let your hands be strong, ye that hear in these days these words by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid, that the temple might be built. Ten, for before these days there was no hire for man, nor any hire for beast, neither was there any peace to him that went out or came in, because of the affliction, H. 6862, for I set all men, every one, against his neighbor. Affliction, H6862, distress, enemy, flint, foe, narrow, small, sorrow, strait, tribulation, trouble. We see him telling them to be ready with strong hands because the rebuilding of the temple is about to begin. This is the same time we were reading in Daniel 9, 25-26 when the rebuilding for the next 3.5 years would begin with Messiah there. Listen to what he tells them. The reason was as to why they could not build the temple sooner. He tells them because peace was gone, the affliction, which literally means the tribulation had begun, and that at that time he set all men, everyone, against his neighbor. When do we know all men will be set against each other? Right at the beginning of tribulation. Just as we see in each of the Olivet Discourses in Luke, Mark, and Matthew. When it begins, it will be nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, which is the time of the great sword, brought about by the red horse rider of the second seal when peace is removed. Revelation 6, 4, 4. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. Pretty clear as to when it all began, when the Lord is telling them this in Zechariah 8:10. At the beginning of tribulation for the first seven years, in just these few, and there were quite a few, scriptures of the open books, Revelation, I have confirmed the following, all lining up in the chapters to years' understanding. The time frame of the escape of the Gentile bride, the beginning and end of the tribulation of seals, including the rapture, when the Lord is seen coming at the end of the sixth seal, that he first comes down on Mount Zion, the mountain carved without hands to receive his rapture group, as well as when he will make a new covenant, and Israel slash Jerusalem will begin to get rebuilt, including the temple. We have an awesome God. Let's go from the beginning of trumpets to the middle of trumpets. We understand during the first half of trumpets, things are getting rebuilt, and the 144,000 are out evangelizing. At this point, it is about to get even crazier than the earth has ever seen even compared to the seals that had recently passed with the time of World War III and the Antichrist. This is where it is going to get so unbelievably difficult that I have a hard time understanding who could endure this period, but we know some do. This period, again, is the very important halfway point of trumpets. The rebuilding will have happened and the temple will have been completed. This brings us to a total of 10.5 years to date since the tribulation began. We know this time well from a couple places like Revelation 12, 9, the point at which Satan will have lost his battle against Michael and his angels and be cast down to earth with his fallen angels, as well as the same time of Revelation 9, 1, the time of the fifth trumpet when the angel comes down and the pit is opened. We will cover these points in greater detail in the following chapter called Revealing Revelation. At this point, those 10.5 years should sound very familiar to you. You may recall them from the Daniel 9 chapter, the time frame referred to in Daniel 9 verse 26, where Messiah will be cut off, 
The only way Messiah could be cut off is if Satan was here. You will also recall this is the same year total from Psalms 90 verse 10 at the time of We Fly Away. I have just given four references to this period, but let me show you this time of him being cut off. In the chapters to years book that speaks to this time of the Jews Judah in Zechariah, for this to be in Zechariah reflected as 3.5 years into trumpets, it must be in chapter 11 and no other. And that is exactly where it is. Zechariah 11, 1, 2. Open thy doors, O Lebanon, that the fire may devour thy cedars. Howl, fir tree, for the cedar is fallen, because the mighty are spoiled. Howl, O ye oaks of Bashan, for the forest of the vintage is come down. Satan has lost his battle and has been cast down to earth. He is the vintage come down. Remember, there were giants before the flood and after that, according to Genesis 6. They were also referred to as cedar trees for their size. This is going to be a horrific period of time for any left on the earth. Let's continue reading in chapter 11. Zechariah 11, 9, 10. 9. Then said I, I will not feed you, that that dieth, let it die, and that that is to be cut off, let it be cut off, and let the rest eat every one the flesh of another, horrific as stated. 10. And I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder, that I might break my covenant, which I had made with all the people. This is where Messiah must break the covenant he made with many, because Satan has now been cast down to the earth. The Lord cannot keep his covenant going during this period. But do not forget, this is also the point now in Revelation 12, 14, when those who were there with the Lord will be protected, which is the remnant that fly away of Psalm 90, verse 10. Having flown into the wilderness on the wings of an eagle until all is past, right to the very end of all tribulation. You will recall in Daniel 9, this period of time with Satan's rule will last 2.5 years until the Lord returns once and for all as lightning from heaven after now a total of 13 years, or 20 years in the big picture, have passed. This final 14th year that Jesus comes at the beginning to fulfill himself has been detailed in a number of scriptures earlier in the book. Let me finish proving out these books in their chapters to years right to the end of the tribulation. Zechariah 14, 4, 12, 4. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And here is a little of what Jesus is going to do during this final year to all those who came against Jerusalem. 12. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. This is happening during the final seventh year of trumpets, or fourteenth year since the start of tribulation, or the twenty-first year of the big picture, while those who were taken into the wilderness with eagles' wings are still being kept until this year is over. John 20, 9. 9. For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. In each gospel, Jesus' resurrection is found in the last chapter. However, in John only is it found in the second last chapter. Why? Because the Lord would return again after 2,000 years and fulfill the final year himself. Just as we have been revealing with end time eyes in the understanding why John has 21 chapters, I mentioned the end of one year is the same time frame as the start of the next. That is exactly what applies here in John as well. In fact, the reason I came to understand the end of one or beginning of another is because it appears in some places more like he will actually return at the end of the sixth trumpet, which, for example, I believe is the reason for the great earthquake at that time. Yet we can clearly know he is here at the very beginning of the seventh trumpet. In the final fourteenth chapter of Hosea, we find the words spoken by the people back in chapter six, saying after two days, or two thousand, he would revive them. There it now is in the correct chapter to year, yet again. Hosea 14, 6, 7, 6, His branches shall spread, and his beauty shall be as the olive tree, and his smell as Lebanon. 7, 
They that dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall revive as the corn and grow as the vine. The scent thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon. Next, in Genesis 21, the same year period, we see the same connection right at the start. Genesis 21, 1, 5. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. Through an Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old as God had commanded him. Five and Abraham was an hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. The promise Isaac, who we also know is a type and shadow of Jesus, is born, or as we could say in our end-time understanding, is returned. Right on time. What makes this even more incredible is what we covered about this in the chapter when the years just don't add up. When Abraham had his first son, Ishmael, he was 86 years old, and now at the coming birth of Isaac, Abraham is now 100 years old, 14 years. When he comes at that final year, he will renew the covenant he made at the start of trumpets, which he then breaks, because of Satan having been cast down. Where can we find this? One, of course, was covered in Daniel 9.27, but let me show you another in the chapters to years. Psalm 132, 11-14, 11. The Lord hath sworn in truth unto David, he will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. 12. If thy children will keep my covenant and my testimony that I shall teach them, their children shall also sit upon thy throne forevermore. 13. For the Lord hath chosen Zion, he hath desired it for his habitation. 14. This is my rest forever, here will I dwell, for I have desired it. We see here that it is finished, and he is here to stay forever, right to the end of the earth, just as the last verse of Matthew 28 says. And finally, with the fourteen years completed and all tribulation is now over, only one thing remains. To bring those who had been protected in the wilderness for the final 3.5 years back to Jerusalem. Upon their return, it will be the final fiftieth year jubilee. As stated from the beginning, it will be the twenty-second year, or also referred to as the fifteenth from the tribulation years, as per the chapters to years chart. Let's wrap this all up by showing it to you in one of the books we did not go into yet. That is the book of Ezekiel. It starts in the very last portion of chapter 47 and runs through all of chapter 48, the end of the Jubilee year. Then we will end it all in Psalms one last time. Ezekiel 47, 13 to 15. Thus saith the Lord God, This shall be the border, whereby ye shall inherit the land according to the twelve tribes of Israel. Joseph shall have two portions. 14 and ye shall inherit it one as well as another, concerning the which I lifted up mine hand to give it unto your fathers, and this land shall fall unto you for inheritance. And this shall be the border of the land toward the north side, from the great sea, the way of Hethlon, as men go to Zedad, Ezekiel 48, verse 1 to 3, 35. Now these are the names of the tribes, from the north end to the coast of the way of Hethlon, as one goeth to Hamath, Hazarenan, the border of Damascus northward, to the coast of Hamath. For these are his sides east and west, a portion for Dan. And by the border of Dan, from the east side unto the west side, a portion for Asher. And by the border of Asher, from the east side even unto the west side, a portion for Naphtali. This continues with all the remaining tribes, then verse 35. 35, it was round about 18,000 measures, and the name of the city from that day shall be, The Lord is there. How awesome is that? And last but not least, Psalms 33, being at exactly the right place on the chart for the Jubilee, and we read, Psalm 33, 3-5, 8-3. Sing unto him a new song, play skillfully with a loud noise. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. 5. He loveth righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Psalm 133, 1, 3. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments, three as the dew of Hermon and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, 
for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. And now in these last several scriptures, I have confirmed the final set of seven years, including the Jubilee, in the understanding of the open books, chapters to years, perfectly aligned. Confirmed the time of Messiah's being cut off, the cutting off of the covenant he made with all, Satan being cast down to the earth, and his 2.5-year reign. When Christ will return feet down on the Mount of Olives, when he will renew his covenant, he cut off, and the final jubilee where each tribe is given their inheritance. Believe it or not, all these are but a few examples of the revelations of the open books, chapters to years. I had so much more I wanted to add, but these were chosen to reveal the understanding without going too far and to catch your attention to want to dig deeper into them for yourselves. Referring to this chart, to understand events in the coming years of tribulation, I believe will be a great tool for all making this book a great leave behind for family and friends you love and are concerned for. I pray this has blessed you with a greater understanding of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in his coming prophetic end of days. Chapter 8, Revealing Revelation In this chapter, I am going to cover the tribulation from the book of Revelation, chapters 6 through 13, as well as touching on a few after them. I advise you to not skip the chapters in this book before this, as it will be overwhelming without the necessary understanding. All of it will be in order, in a detailed breakdown which will cover many topics already discussed, all combined in one total picture of the whole tribulation of 14 years, a complete journey through seals and trumpets in great detail, once again showing not only is it impossible for all of this to have fit into a seven-year time frame, but also that it would have been impossible had the books not truly been opened. I encourage you to read this chapter with the Tribulation Timeline Chart in the appendix, as well as taking your Bible out and following along with me. The Seal's Judgment We are going to start in Revelation 6. Looking at the Tribulation Timeline Chart in the appendix, you will see right at the start the horsemen that will be released, which is the breaking of the seals. Our first thought is that each of these horsemen are the representation of the beast. For example, the lion as the white horse, the bear as red horse, the leopard as the black horse, and the fourth beast as the pale horse, as we have also read in Daniel 7. Daniel 7, 3-7-3, And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion, and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth, and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Five and behold another beast, a second, like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it, and they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and lo another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. However, there is more than one set of events taking place. Having come to understand Zechariah's book and its timing better, let's go have a look at it again in chapter 1 and see where there is more than one set of four. Zechariah 1.18-21 then lifted I up mine eyes, and saw, and behold, four horns. And I said unto the angel that talked with me, What be these? And he answered me, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. And the Lord showed me four carpenters. Then said I, What come these to do? And he spake, saying, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man did lift up his head. But these are come to fray them, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. Here we can see that there are two groups of four. These two groups are the difference between Daniel 7's four and Revelation 6's four. To add to this a little more, you can see in Daniel 7 that they came up from the sea, whereas Revelation 6, they are released from heaven. The other thing we can understand is that they are essentially sent out at about the same time. 
However, this will not happen at the same time, meaning some will do their greatest portion maybe a couple years or more later while yet still part of one of the others. They will overlap their portion with another while maybe one ends its portion. So although it may at times appear that it is one seal per year, it is not. They also do not all come just near the beginning and leave either. It is all over a period of time until their time is fulfilled. What is the first that we see happening in Revelation? First of all, it is the Lamb, Jesus, who is opening the seals. This means his 40 days as the Son of Man on earth have ended. We have established that from the end of the Son of Man's time there is still a portion of time to Pentecost when the Holy Ghost, in what we call Acts 2.0, will baptize those who the Lord has chosen to work for him during the seal's judgments. Once that has happened, it will begin the 14 years. The often debated question has been who the white horse rider will represent. For this we have to go back to the chapter, the Revelation of Daniel 9, about 2 Chronicles 36, 22-23. After the first attack in the Middle East with major destruction in Israel, it will be followed by this modern-day Cyrus character. He will come on the scene and be the one to make the declaration decree to allow Israel to rebuild, just as we covered in the Daniel 9 study. This explains to me as well why we read how the white horse rider conquers having only a bow yet no arrows and has a crown. He will not do it by war, but by peace. Revelation 6, 1, 2, 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, G515, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. G515, a bow, apparently as the simplest fabric, bow. As we can see, it is not a weapon, but simple fabric, very possibly like paper for this decree of peace to rebuild, to be written on. Although the two sets of four go out very close to each other, they do the greater part of work at their appropriate times. We see that this peace declaration decree will be short-lived. In Daniel 9.25, we read what follows the decree. The first seven weeks slash years, which represented the seven years Jerusalem would then remain vacant, and the beginning of the whole 14 years. So the question is, what will happen right around the time of that decree? The answer is the second attack on Israel, Jerusalem. This will then have them now all scattered. After the first attack, the majority will still remain in the land and will believe at the decree that all is good, peace and safety. However, that is when the Lion of Daniel 7, the first beast, will attack. The first attack was not yet part of the tribulation years because it will occur before the 14 years, but this second one will be. It will be followed very soon after by the second beast of Daniel 7, the bear. We can understand this from Jeremiah 4, 5 to 7. 5. Declare ye in Judah and publish in Jerusalem, and say, Blow ye the trumpet in the land. Cry, gather together, and say, Assemble yourselves and let us go into the defense cities. Set up the standard toward Zion. Retire, stay not, for I will bring evil from the north and a great destruction. 7. The lion is come up from his thicket, and the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. He is gone forth from his place to make thy land desolate, and thy cities shall be laid waste without an inhabitant. This is the lion coming from the north of Jerusalem to destroy it, in what it says will be a great destruction, and be left without an inhabitant the same destruction that will now remove them from the land for seven years. This will have happened right around the time of the decree to rebuild. Many people do not understand that this lion is going to be Syria's leader, Assad. As a side note, there is some very interesting information about his family name. When his family took over in politics, the family's name meant beast. It was either his father or grandfather who realized it was not a good name to rule with, so he had it changed to Assad. Assad means, you guessed it, lion. Consider the evidence. From the north, hates Israel. Last name was the beast and changed to lion. Israel being weakened at the first attack will easily be destroyed when Syria moves in to end it. And we find this in 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles 24, 23-24. 23, and it came to pass at the end of the year that the host of Syria came up against him, 
and they came to Judah and Jerusalem, and destroyed all the princes of the people from among the people, and sent all the spoil of them unto the king of Damascus. For the army of the Syrians came with a small company of men, and the Lord delivered a very great host into their hand, because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. So they executed judgment against Joash. This was allowed to happen to them, even though Syria's army is small in comparison to Israel's, because the Jews' Jerusalem have forsaken the Lord God. We have also learned that they have forsaken God's law of rest for the land every seventh year, since having had the land of their fathers, Jerusalem. What was shall be again. In the book of Jeremiah, we read about the second beast, the bear, the destroyer of the Gentiles. This is the second beast of Daniel 7, and the bear, many would agree, will be Russia, who is a close ally with Syria. Going back to Revelation 6, what time would these two represent? The second seal. Let's see what it tells us when this horseman is released. Revelation 6, 3-4-3 And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. We see that the peace that was decreed was short-lived. And as the peace is removed, the great sword is given that causes WW3, so that they begin to kill one another. This is where we read in the discourses of Luke, Mark, and Matthew that the tribulation begins on the whole earth. Here is Mark's version. Mark 13, 8, 8. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be earthquakes in divers places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. What is incredible about what this says is that these things are only the beginnings of sorrows. We also notice in these beginnings of sorrows that it includes famine. This falls in line with WW3 having broken out on the earth. Famine will most certainly soon follow. Also a great place to show how there is this overlapping that will happen between some of the seal judgments. WW3 will not have ended yet when the famine begins. The time of the red horse rider, second seal judgment, W3, will continue most likely for two to three years. Yet famine will not wait for it to end. It will happen during, meaning that while the second seal is taking place, the third seal will begin its portion. They continue together for a while. So now let us have a look at the third seal. Revelation 6, 5-6, 5. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. We see that famine follows right on time, according to Scripture. How does this connect to Daniel 7's third beast, the leopard? I do not believe it will be instant. As I just explained, the famine will begin very shortly after WW3 breaks out. However, once things are in place, this famine period of time will be a time where food and all systems of the world will be controlled. As Daniel 7 says about this third beast, he will be given dominion, H7985, or control over the world systems. Dominion, H79, from H7981. Empire, H7981, have the mastery, have power, bear rule, and to dominate, that is, govern. This third beast, the leopard from Daniel 7, I believe will be Germany that will also dominate with a small group of nations. Germany has been known for having excellent systems of control in history that were able to have control over whole countries. We only have to look back at WW1 and WW2. All of it to this point is what we read in Mark 13 being only the beginning of sorrows. What follows is going to be even more terrible, especially for Christians from this point forward to the end of the seal's judgments. This brings us to the fourth seal, Revelation 6, 7, 8, 7. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. We see here that this pale horse rider being sent out has been given great authority to cause death over all the earth, not only with the sword, 
but also famine, etc. Almost as if this one has the authority over the ones before it? Which would certainly have us thinking it lines up with the fourth beast in Daniel 7. Again, not saying they are the same, but the timing of both would appear to be in line as to when their portion really comes into play. Remember, they were released closely together, but some were still building up until their time. Who is this fourth beast at this time in Daniel 7 that would bring us more or less to about the middle of the seal's judgments? Even though I would say it is more likely about 2.5 years into the seal's judgments. At this point, what we read in Mark 13 as the beginning of sorrows is coming to an end. It is the end of the beginning of sorrow which is in line with what we just read about the fourth seal by all its devastation. This is because this beast is the one now taking it all over. Let's read in Daniel again because as mentioned, this is going to be a very important time. Daniel 7, 7. 7. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. You are about to understand why this is now the time that will be even more dreadful and terrible than everything that had just taken place before it. Knowing from the chapter who the Gospels are speaking to, you will understand this to be during Mark's group, the sleeping church time. There has also been great news during the first half of seals, during this devastation. At this time of world war and devastation, it will also be the greatest time of revival in all human history. Just as September 11, 2001, caused millions and millions to return to church to seek the Lord, although not lasting more than six weeks. If that kind of devastation caused so many to go to church, how much more will World War III's devastation, famine, and all that will take place cause them to truly come to the Lord and seek Him in forgiveness and repentance? This is God's mercy in the midst of the seal's judgments. One final wake-up call for the church that remains. What a devastating wake-up call. Let's look closely into this time period. First, if we go back and look into Mark 13 some more, we find this is the time where the fleeing into the wilderness is going to take place for the church that is now awake. And we find this here, Mark 13, teen through 19. 14. But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand. Then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains. And let him that is on the housetop not go down into the house, neither enter therein, to take anything out of his house. And let him that is in the field not turn back again, for to take up his garment. But woe to them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. 18. And pray ye that your flight be not in the winter. For in those days shall be affliction, such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created unto this time, neither shall be. This period is after all the devastation of WU3 and famine during the beginning of sorrows that is now about to get much worse. You will recall that we spoke earlier in the book how Mark had one abomination of desolation and Matthew had another. Well, this is the time of Mark's, the sleeping church, abomination of desolation taking place, right on time. This fourth beast is better known as the Antichrist. We see his description in Daniel 7 having ten horns and that he will stamp the residue with the feet. If we go to the book of Revelation, we find his description there. Revelation 13, 1-2 And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. We see the same description of the ten horns and understand he has been given power and authority over the three previous, the lion, bear, and leopard. As we continue, we will see how long he is going to have this power for. Revelation 13, 4-8 4. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? 
And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. I want to go to verse 7 before we get to the timing of it. We see here that he's going to be going after the saints and will be able to overcome them. Who are these saints? Believers in Jesus Christ, of course. This is exactly in line with when Mark 13 tells them about the abomination of desolation now about to begin and for the Christians to flee. God will lead them as they seek Him in prayer, and they will not be left alone. There will also be workers for the Lord, as mentioned, who will be helping them during this period as well, with safe places around the world in the wildernesses. However, we know not all will make it. Some will be captured and be given the choice to receive the mark of this beast at this time. Those who refuse to take it and not follow this beast leader or worship him will be killed. He will not be alone when he comes to power at this time. There will also be another who will be like his promoter, getting everyone to believe in this Antichrist and that everyone should take his mark and worship him. He will be able to do some pretty crazy wonders to get people to believe. This other one with him is known as the false prophet. You will remember that we discussed this also in the chapter called The Forty Days of the Son of Man. Revelation 13, 11 to 18. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. 14 and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. 18. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. We can see how powerful this false prophet is going to be, and will control all to the point that they will not be able to buy or sell. But whatever the cost, do not take that mark, his name, number, nor worship him, even if it means death. Fear not, for if this is you during that time, you are mentioned in Revelation 6 at the fifth seal as to where you will be if you do not bow down to the beast. In Revelation 7 at the rapture, and again in Revelation 20, when those who become martyrs are raised to live again, with him, for the 1,000 years. Revelation 6, 9 to 11. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them, that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also and their brethren, that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. And here they are after rapture in chapter 7. Revelation 7, 9. 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, and kindreds, and people, and tongues, stood before the throne, and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, and palms in their hands. We read here of his power that will last 42 months. 
There is another place that tells us a little more about what will be happening during this same time, directly in line with what we have just discussed. Unless you had the word definitions from the Strong's Concordance showing the Greek and Hebrew, as you have seen shared throughout the book, you would not think that it is saying to us what it is really saying. These definitions at our fingertips, with the online tools mentioned, are what help make the greatest difference in understanding and revealing so much more. This is one of those places. Revelation 11, 1 to 2. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. Two, but the court, G83, which is without empty five, the temple, leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. We can see that this is the same period of time of forty two months that was given to the beast Antichrist in Revelation 13, which is also the same wording from Daniel 7 about this beast and what he would be doing. He stamped the residue with the feet, which means to trample, and here in verse 2 we read, tread under foot. G31, to trample, literally or figuratively, tread down underfoot. The same word only one is Hebrew and the other Greek. So now we see that it is the same timing as when Christians are captured and are being killed. What then about this court or temple of God to measure and yet leave the outer part? Let's start with the word meaning for court. Court, G833, by implication a mansion. Court, fold, hall, palace. Remember, this is still the church age until the end of seals. Where does the Lord dwell? He dwells in the body or the inside of a believer, which is the mansion. This will be until they are taken to paradise in the rapture to the place prepared, as Jesus told us in John 14. We revealed this in the chapter, when the years just don't add up. And now let us look at the word without to seal this understanding. Without, G in 55, from G in 54. External, G in 54. Away, forth, without, of, ward, strange. That is an interesting word for the meaning of without. It turns out we can understand what this word strange can mean, written in Jude 1.7, going after strange flesh. This scripture is telling us that this temple being measured is the spirit of those believers on the inside of their body slash flesh that is being trampled on by the enemy for 42 months. Remember earlier I mentioned how I believed the first portion of sorrows would last about 2.5 years? Well, if you add it to the 42 months, you get to the end of the six years of seals tribulation. And if we go to Revelation 6, what do we see at the end of it? Revelation 6, 12 to 17. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. 15. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. 17. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? At the end of the six years of seals, also the end of the sixth seal, we see that the Lord is coming down, as we spoke about earlier in the book, as the time when he will be coming down on Mount Zion. Look at what we see happens in Daniel 7 after that fourth beast has had his time to reign. Daniel 7, 9-11 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain, and his body destroyed, and given to the burning flame. Just as at the end of the sixth seal, 
at the end of the sixth year, the Lord God shows up and destroys that beast. Jesus will be there too. As we read, the time of his wrath is about to begin. When we spoke about this previously, we explained how his reign would begin after the final seventh year of seals ended. That is because during that final year there are a few things happening. First off, let's finish off this portion that is so clearly connected to all this time of seals from Daniel 7. After the Ancient of Days, who is God the Father, is seen, we then read, Daniel 7, 13-14, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion, and glory, and a kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. We see the Son of Man, Jesus, coming with the clouds of heaven. This is all still that time at the end of the sixth year of seals, shortly before the rapture will happen. We read in Mark 13 about Jesus who will come at this time, which by the way is not said in Luke's discourse. In Luke 21, he says, Cloud, singular, Mark 13, 4 to 27. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the cloud, with great power and glory. And then shall he send his angels, and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Not only do we see him here coming in the clouds as Daniel 7, but we also see events of the sixth seal with the sun and the moon, and especially the stars of heaven falling. Now that that tribulation has ended and the first six years are past, let's see what is going to be taking place during the seventh year of seals. We can understand that approximately the first half of that year is what is told to us in Revelation 7. We see a group being chosen and sealed. This group is known as the 144,000, and their work is going to be during Trumpet's judgment. Following this group being sealed, the rapture of the great multitude take place. When we get to the seventh seal, you see why I say it is about six months. Revelation 7, 1-4 And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, three, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. For and I heard the number of them, which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. We can understand what is going to follow next by what the four winds are commanded not to do until this group is sealed. These four winds are going to be destroying parts of the earth, trees, and sea. These are all associated with the events of the first four trumpets' judgments. This 144,000 group, as you will recall, are the very same we see in Revelation 14, 1, standing on Mount Zion with the Lamb. This is something many have questioned for a long time. How is it that the Lamb is on Mount Zion with the 144,000 about to be sent out to work? People have said that it must be in heaven and not on earth, because Jesus does not return until the end of tribulation, feet down on the Mount of Olives. This thinking, as stated before, all comes because for generations the foundation of all teaching have come from Matthew's Gospel. So it could never be properly understood that in fact it is the Lamb here on Mount Zion with them during this final year of seals before their work in trumpets begins. Revelation 7, 9-12 After this I beheld, and lo a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, and kindreds, and people, and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, ten and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, 
and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing, and glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might be unto our God for ever and ever. Amen. Here we clearly see the rapture of the great multitude. As we know, Jesus has come down on Mount Zion as described earlier. What did he tell them in John 14, the exact chapter to year of John that we shared in the previous chapter? Jesus told them he would go to prepare a place for them, and that when he returned he would receive them unto himself, that where he was, so shall they be. If you recall, we shared that only in Mark's version when they went to make ready the Passover meal were the words said, a large upper room furnished and prepared, there make ready for us. Mark 15, 14. And finally the seals end with the seventh seal. Revelation 8, verse 1. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. That is all of it. However, it leaves us with something that must be understood with a little more discernment. What is a half an hour in heaven? I believe it is pretty clear that we can understand this as a type and shadow of about six months. By no means is this hard to really understand when we consider what has happened in chapter 7, which is the Lord coming down on Mount Zion at the end of the sixth seal, the end of six years. This makes what happens in chapter 7 part of the seventh year, but it is before the seventh seal, which indicates half of a time. I believe this is that time where the Lord will be making his covenant with all people, we spoke about previously. This brings us to the end of seals and the end of Mark's time, the church age. The end of the first seven days years after the dove was sent, the second time in Noah's story in Genesis 8-9. The end of the first seven weeks years of Daniel 9-25. I would like to share with you an incredible piece of revelation before we jump into the Matthew portion of Trumpet's Judgment. It yet again brings more confirmation to these revelations. I am sharing it between the two so you can have it in your thoughts as we move into the trumpets. All of this information shared thus far is a lot to take in. I believe what I am about to share will help you with what will happen in the future. We read of an Olivet Discourse in all three the Gospels of Luke, Mark, and Matthew. The Olivet Discourse is when Jesus was asked about what it was going to be like at the end times or at his coming. We know now that Luke's group, the bride, is already gone before the 14 years begin. So we're going to look at Mark 13 and Matthew 24's Olivet Discourse to show you this revelation. Of course, none of the Olivet Discourse is found in Luke, which is what we should expect, seeing that it is not applicable to the bride. In Mark's version, we see no mention of false Christs or false prophets before he mentions the abomination of desolation. It is only mentioned after it. We read about this in Mark 13, Mark 13, 22. For false Christs and false prophets shall rise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. The Antichrist and false prophet do not come truly onto the scene until he is given that power for 42 months, as read in Revelation 13, right at the time the first abomination of the mark of the beast comes. What do we know happens at the end of the sixth year slash seal, the coming of the Ancient of Days that destroys the Antichrist, just as we read and covered in Daniel 7? It also told us that the Lord did not kill the others that ruled, but only took away their kingdoms, and they lived a little longer. This means that the false prophet was not gone, only the Antichrist, false Christ. So now let's see how Matthew's version tells us the story. We see in Matthew's Olivet Discourse, that before the abomination of desolation is mentioned, that will happen to this group during trumpets, only the false prophets is mentioned. No false Christs. Matthew 24, 11. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Interesting, is it not? Especially knowing what you've come to understand about the Gospels and their portions of time. Now we're going to look at after the abomination in Matthew. Guess what we see written therein? Matthew 24, 24, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Now all of the sudden it is false Christs and false prophets again? When would this time frame equal in the end-time understanding? This is about mid-trumpets, when Messiah is cut off. 
as shown in Daniel 9 verse 26, or Zechariah 11, and other scriptures discussed. This is exactly when the fifth trumpet and first woe comes, when the pit is opened. To summarize, let's see what we have discovered. Second half of seals, false Christ and false prophets show up. End of the sixth seal, years only false Christ is killed, but false prophet gets to live. First half of trumpets, only false prophet on the scene. Mid trumpets, at the opening of the pit and cutting off of Messiah, both false Christ and false prophet are there again, until finally the Lord returns, once and for all, feet down on the Mount of Olives, and the Antichrist and false prophet are cast into the lake of fire. First, not only was this proven in all the revealing of end time scriptures, but it is also the answer to what was, is not, and shall be, Revelation 17, 8, 8. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. He was, is the forty-two months, the second portion of seals, the is not, is the twelve hundred and sixty days of Messiah during the first half of trumpets, and the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the temple, and shall, is when the pit is opened at the fifth trumpet, which is mid-trumpets. How incredible is it that we are now able to see and understand this? With the keys, as revealed in this book, you are able to make sense of it all, and it all comes into view. The Trumpet's Judgment At this point, we now know and understand that the Lord has come down on Mount Zion. The mystery that remains of Him being on Mount Zion is what will it look like. I can only imagine what seeing something like that coming will be like. Where will it be, and how? In the clouds over Jerusalem. I do not believe anyone can know that yet. So knowing this, let's have a look at what the scriptures do tell us about this time, through to the end of trumpets. Let's begin with some of the scriptures we have come to understand are speaking directly to this time of the eighth year of the fourteen, or the first year of trumpets. I have not shared this one, in the books have opened chapters to years, but it is another scripture to show you that this indeed is the understood time. Psalms 126, 1 through 3. First, when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter, and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. The Lord is bringing them back from their captivity to Him. We see how happy they are. This chapter of Psalms 126 is represented as the eighth year or first year of trumpets on the tribulation timeline chart or the chapter to year graph found in the appendix. Zechariah 8 verse 3 5. 3 Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, There shall yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem, and every man with his staff in his hand for very age. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. As you read the rest of Zechariah 8, it goes on to talk about rebuilding the temple, and that it could not happen before this time. Zechariah 8, 9 through 10. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Let your hands be strong, ye that hear in these days these words by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid, that the temple might be built. For before these days there was no hire for man, nor any hire for beast, neither was there any peace to him that went out or came in because of the affliction. For I set all men, every one, against his neighbor. Just as we have read in Daniel 9, 25-26, when the Messiah will be here and the rebuilding of the streets and wall will begin. There is, however, something I particularly want to share that will bring us back to the first few trumpets in Revelation. In Daniel 9, verse 25, the verse ends with, Even in troublous times. We might say, how can it be in troublous times, when the Messiah is here, and they are all happy to finally have returned to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple? The answer is in what is still happening around the earth as the time of trumpets begins. Let's not forget how seals ended with not only a peace, 
but things were also still and quiet. That does not last long, because if you recall at the seventh seal, the angel had commanded the four winds to not yet blow on the earth with what they were about to begin. What were those things they were asked to hold back from doing for a little bit? He cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till. This was at the start of the seventh year of seals, where there is still peace. During this period of peace, they have been brought back into the land, and this building is about to begin. The trumpet judgments are about to begin, which is the reason Daniel told us, even in troublous times. Revelation 8, 6-12, 6. To 12, 6. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died and the third part of the ships were destroyed. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers, and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters, because they were made bitter. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. Just like the seals, it is not one, one year, one the next year, but until completed. They may happen pretty close to each other in time. However, I do not believe they will. This total period of time for all four trumpets to happen is going to be 3.5 years. This will be the first half of the trumpet judgments, during which time Jerusalem is being rebuilt, even during troublous times. When we look at these judgments, we can see they were the ones held back until the group was sealed and trumpets were to begin. In fact, for the third trumpet, we see the star coming called Wormwood. I believe in 2019, a well-known brother in Christ who travels the world giving talks and doing research about the scriptures shared a vision he had that the Lord revealed to him that the coming comet, Apophis, that was coming in 2029 was indeed the third trumpet star called Wormwood. Here is a little information about it. The closest known approach of Apophis comes on April 13, 2029, when Apophis will pass Earth closer than geosynchronous communication satellites, but will come no closer than 31,600 kilometers, 19,600 above Earth's surface. That is seriously close, and we can understand how the Earth's gravity can pull it in being so close. Can we discern this to actually be Wormwood? Yes, I most certainly do believe we can and already have. The year 2029 is in the second year of trumpets. Remember, they will happen over the 3.5 year period of the first half of trumpets. This would be exactly when it is coming. I personally do believe the Lord spoke to him and revealed it to him. I like to say it this way, for the Bible told me so. Let's face it, this is a whole lot of destruction happening on the earth in the first half of trumpets. What about Jerusalem during all this? It is being protected by the Lord God as he said he would do. We read in Zechariah 2 that after Jerusalem had first been attacked and destroyed, there is someone referred to as a young man who goes, at what would appear to be about a year later in the understanding, to measure it all. But then, we read an angel is told to go tell this man. Zechariah 2, 4-5 For and said unto him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls, for the multitude of men and cattle therein. Five, for I, saith the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about, and will be the glory in the midst of her. What else is taking place during this time? For one, the hundred and forty-four thousand have been sent out to evangelize with healing power and the ability to cast out demons, and there is a battle in heaven that begins. Let's not forget the two witnesses protecting Jerusalem during this rebuilding time. We know the end of seals equals the end of Mark's time. 
It might also make sense to see if we can find something about this at the end of Mark's Gospel. Just as the Great Commission at the end of each Gospel is different, so too does it equal the group it is speaking to that will work next. At the end of Luke, there were workers for seals who Jesus chose during the 40 days. So too does Mark reveal the next group that will work trumpets, the 144,000. Mark 16, 15 to 18, 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. 17. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. 18. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. In fact, this reminds me of another scripture I would like to share with you to help understand these worker groups very clearly. Those chosen during the Lord's 40 days, working during the seal's tribulation, is the group represented as the apostles who bring about the coming great revival, beginning early seals. They are also referred to as the foundation layers. They lay the foundation spiritually for the temple of God during seals, but around the midpoint, there will also be a foundation laid for the new temple that will be built during the first half of trumpets. What is interesting is that during the 144,000's time, the walls are being rebuilt, just as we read in Daniel 9, 25-26, meaning they are representing the spiritual walls being built, and the physical walls will be going up during their time as well. Then there is still Matthew. We know the end of Matthew means the end of trumpets, with a group that will be chosen from among them as we read at the end of Matthew. They are the ones who will go out during the 1,000-year reign of Christ on earth to teach the world the ways of the Lord. They will no longer preach, because the world will know that Christ has returned and rules from Jerusalem. This final group who are chosen are from the twelve tribes, and they represent the gates by which people will enter into the kingdom. Exactly how a building project works. Foundation first, then walls on top of them, and finally gates in the walls to allow people in. Scriptures in Revelation 21 literally confirm this all to us. Revelation 21, 12, 14, 17. And had a wall, great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he measured the wall thereof, an hundred and forty and four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. This is the description of spiritual New Jerusalem coming down from heaven at the end of it all. Amazing! For some reason, it seems when some people read Scripture, they think, because reading something and suddenly the next verse is something else, that the event must happen quickly. This is rarely the case. This is often how people have come to understand Revelation 12. Revelation 12, verse 7 to 9. 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, called the devil, and Satan which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. When reading this, it sounds like a quick battle, but that is not the case. You may ask, but is Michael not the most powerful angel? Yes, he is, but that does not make it easy or quick. The fact is, this battle between the good and bad angels is going to last the first half of trumpets for 1260 days. This is the period of time given to us in the verse before it. Revelation 12, 6, 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. We have come to understand that the first five verses in Revelation 12 is the time of seals right up to the man-child being born. This birth represents Jesus having returned on Mount Zion, and finally her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Giving us the time period right up to the rapture of the great multitude, the was caught up group we have covered. Then we see this 1260 days clearly, making it the first half of trumpets. 
We also see this 1260 days in another place. Revelation 11, 3-7-3 And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. For these are the two olive trees, and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. This scripture gives us a lot of information. It confirms when the 1260 days will begin. If you recall, the verse before, it was about the fact that for 42 months, the trampling underfoot would have been going on. Another confirmation that this 1260 days comes after the 42 months. We are told the work the two witnesses are doing during this period of time is to prophesy, meaning for the first half of trumpets, these two very powerful witnesses will be doing just that. Anyone who tries to prevent them will pay dearly for it. Each of these situations or grouping of events are all taking place during the first half of trumpets or the 1260 days until the beast ascends out of the bottomless pit. When is this beast going to come out of the bottomless pit? At about mid-trumpets, once Satan has been cast down. Daniel 12 actually tells just a little about it, but it is enough to put fear into those reading it. Daniel 12:1. 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was, since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Here we read that Michael has won the war in heaven, and Satan has been cast down to the earth at what is being referred to as the greatest time of trouble that ever has been or will ever be. This is a very hard time to try and even imagine how terrible it is going to be. It is literally going to be Satan and his fallen angels. There is a lot happening during this time, and we are given quite a bit of information in Scripture about it. Let's finish with what Revelation 12 has to say about it. Revelation 12, 12-17 12. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea! For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time, and times and half a time, from the face of the serpent. 15. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth, and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The first thing we see is that those in heaven are rejoicing because Satan has finally been cast out, but then we read they say woe to those on the earth. This woe at that time is the first woe and with three trumpets that remain. Revelation 8, 13, teen. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. The first woe will be at the fifth trumpet. Revelation 11, 1 2. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Terrible creatures will come out of the pit, like scorpions that will sting all the people except those sealed with God's seal on their foreheads. 
These that are sealed are the 144,000. Their work will not be finished after the first half of trumpets, but they will be given more power by Jesus before he is cut off at that time. You see this explained to us in Luke 10. Remember, in Luke 1, he tells us he knew all things and he knew them in order. This means that we do find information about other groups in Luke as well because of his understanding. Luke 10, 17-20 And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. 19. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice, because your names are written in heaven. The fact that Satan is seen falling from heaven is confirming to us the timing. We then see that they are given power that will allow them to tread on serpents and scorpions. This is exactly what we read happens at the fifth trumpet when the pit opens. Satan was cast to the earth, and out of the pit came scorpions that will sting everyone except those with the seal of God. This group is told they will tread on the scorpions and not be hurt by them. These are the 144,000 being given great power before Jesus is cut off at this time. This is the same time connected to Psalms 90.10 after the 10.5-year point when they will fly away. Just as in Revelation 12.14 and Zechariah 11.10-11, where we are told that he will break the covenant he made with all people, and on that day it was broken. Verse 9 before this tells us those who will be left will eat each other's flesh. Just as Michael and all those in heaven said to the people remaining on earth, Woe to you now! Let's not forget this is also Daniel 9 verse 26, the time that when Messiah gets cut off, which is also the point of Revelation 12, 15, when Satan will go after the woman with a flood. The same portion from Daniel 9, 26 we covered in the Daniel 9 chapter earlier, when he says, And the end thereof shall be with a flood. All of this is at mid-trumpets, fifth trumpet. The last verse of Revelation 12 tells us Satan was so wroth or angry, and because he could not get the woman, he went after the remnant of her seed to make war with them. We know who this group is, and they cannot be killed. However, there will be two others who will be prophesying for 1260 days that will then have come to an end. We read in Revelation 11 that when they had finished, Satan makes war with them and kills them. Revelation 11, 7, 7, and when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them, and kill them. Here again is one of those places where people have assumed they were killed right away. However, if that was the case, why say he war against them? If there would not be a period of war, it would have simply said, and he killed them. So, we are to understand there is a war for some period of time. We spoke about this from Daniel 9 verse 26 as well. As we keep reading down Revelation 11, the two witnesses do get killed, but not until the end of the sixth trumpet, or I should say about 3.5 days before the end of the sixth trumpet. In Revelation 12 verse 12, we see that his time was short. So how short of a time is it from making war with them at the fifth trumpet to the end of the sixth trumpet or second woe? This answer should be quite clear for all who have read from the start of the book until now. This starting point of the war is mid-trumpets, which we know equals about 10.5 years and leaves us a total of 3.5 years to the end of the 14 years. We have understood that it will last until the end of the sixth trumpet, when they will be seen rising to their feet after the 3.5 days and taken into heaven with a great earthquake following. It then tells us this is the end of the second woe. We read the following in Daniel 12. Daniel 12, verse 7. 7. And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth for ever, that it shall be for a time, times, and in half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. We covered how this reference of time, times, and in half 
equals 2.5 years of the final 3.5 years of trumpets. We see once this period of time is over, it tells us it will be finished. This is what we are given in Revelation 10 as well, revealing how long this war will be. Revelation 10, 5-7 5. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, 6. And swear by him that liveth for ever and ever, who created heaven, and the things that therein are, and the earth, and the things that therein are, and the sea, and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. The mystery is over at this point, because at the very beginning of the seventh trumpet, the world will see the Lord returning feet down on the Mount of Olives. This is that final one-week year from Daniel 9.27, which means Satan's time of rule on earth and the length of the war he will make against the two witnesses will last 2.5 years. Let's go into more detail of the sixth trumpet that we have only now touched on briefly. We know now that this war will end at the end of the sixth trumpet. What happens next will be terrible. A group of 200 million army of horsemen will be released to kill a third of man on the earth, and they being so wicked at this point, still do not repent. Revelation 9, 13 to 17. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, 14, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates, 15. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, and a day, and a month, and a year, for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were two hundred thousand thousand, and I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire, and of jacinth, and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. Wow! To think at this point that there could be any that still survived. However, as we get to Zechariah 14, we will see there certainly were, leaving only the final seventh trumpet. Revelation 11:15 to 17 And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign for ever and ever. And the four and twenty elders, which sat before God on their seats, fell upon their faces and worshipped God, seventeen, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and waste and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. You will recall that Jesus told them in Luke 17.24 that when he comes it will be as lightning from one end of the earth to the other in his day. He went on to speak about those things that would come first when he said in verse 25, but first. This point is all of those but first that have come to an end, and this is now what he started his answer with, Luke 17, 24. 24. For as the lightning that lighteneth out of the one part under heaven shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. In this final year, we are told in Daniel 9, 27, that Jesus will renew the covenant he had made with all people and then break it in that one day. In Zechariah 14, we are told what he will do to all those who came against Jerusalem. Zechariah 14, 4, 8, 9, 12, 4. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea, and half of them toward the hinder sea. In summer and in winter shall it be. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord, and his name one. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. That is quite the finish. The tribulation has ended. 
the 14 years are over. The only thing remaining is to bring those back who had been protected in the wilderness until the end of the final 3.5 years of trumpets, or end of the 14 years. When that happens, it will be the time of the final jubilee. This is where all the tribes will receive their inheritance. Here is what Psalms 33 and in 133 have to tell us about this jubilee year. Psalms 33, 8. 8. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. Psalms 133.1.1 Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. They have received their promised inheritance of land and are now dwelling together in unity in the Jubilee until the end of the world with the Lord. Matthew 28.20 20. 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Revealing Revelation as 2.5 years beginning of sorrows, 42 months Antichrist and false prophet, final year seals, 1260 days Messiah on Mount Zion rebuilding during first four trumpets, time, times and a half of Satan's rule at Messiah's cutoff, and the time and times and a half safe in the wilderness, final year when the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. Jesus destroys all who came against Jerusalem. It equals 14 years plus Jubilee. From Genesis to Revelation, the books have opened and prophecy of the end times revealed. God is good. How amazing is it to understand that this book is revealing what the book of all truth, the Bible, has given to us to understand for such a time as this, that is just about upon the world. If you are reading this and you have not yet given your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, do not delay. Call out to Him, ask Him to forgive you your sins, and turn from them. Then read the revelations of the next chapter and understand that now you need to be baptized in Jesus Christ's name for the remission of sins and receive the Holy Spirit. This is to be done whether you are reading this before or after it has all begun. Please do not delay. I look forward to meeting you one day, very soon, in the presence of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God bless. Chapter 9. Seeing or Entering the Kingdom At first glance, one might be tempted to skip this chapter or even hasten through it, but I can promise you that you will see the gospel in a whole new revelation as to the repentance, baptism, and being filled with the Holy Ghost. As I said before, there will be a great harvest once the tribulation of seals have started, and those that will be going through the seals' judgment will have to clean their hands, as we read in Psalm 24, purified with fire, which is the tribulation. The reality is also that there will be many that thought they were ready, being saved, but have not allowed the Holy Spirit to prepare them, being ignorant or either willfully disobedient to walking and living a sanctified life. In other words, they did not live holy lives, but compromised with the world and have not truly laid their lives down for Him. However, they will still need to have an understanding of this teaching, even if they have been saved for many years. The revelation of the water baptism, the way He intended, is crucial to our understanding. We have all been taught that once we have given our lives to the Lord that our garments are spotless and clean. But are our garments clean and spotless? We need to understand in these final moments what we may individually be needing to be assured our garments are clean and bright and that our robes are gorgeous. Should you be reading this before the tribulation has started, you can still be saved and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Also, please do not pass this chapter by because you feel you are already saved and think that you will already have the necessary understanding. There is much more to this revelation. The time is very short. Let's start with where it all begins, taking into account that there is very possibly someone that will read this and have no idea what it means to be saved. Saved from who or what? You must be born again. We read in John 3 about the interaction between Jesus and Nicodemus. John 3, 1, 4. One, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Two, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Third, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
Firstly, Jesus is addressing the true need that Nicodemus has, which is he must be born again. You may ask, how do I get born again? I cannot get back into my mother's womb. And this is exactly what Nicodemus said. For Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? We have to understand that God is spirit, and the truth is, so are we. We tend to think that we are a soul who have a spirit and we live in a body. The reality is that we are spirit who have a soul that lives in a body. We are first and foremost spirit. So having been born of the flesh, we now need to be born of the spirit. John 3, 6 to 8, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Said marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. 8. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. In verse 6, Jesus in a sense is saying, Yes, you have been born of the flesh, but you still need to be born of the Spirit. Being born of the flesh is one thing, and being born of the Spirit is quite another. This is not something you can do, but something only the Spirit of God can do. You just have to agree with it. You must want to be born again. So the question is, why should you? Some people are perfectly happy with where they are, but some are desperate for answers. I am guessing that you may very well be of the latter. The Word of God says that we were all born in sin. It does not seem fair, however, it does not change the reality. You only have to look at a toddler to know that nobody has to teach them to manipulate, throw tantrums, lie, steal, or any sin, really. It comes naturally. We sin. As we go through life, we start to get good at it. There may even be someone out there that says, well, I'm a good person. I don't deserve to go to hell. Well, let me ask you, have you ever stolen something? Have you ever looked after a woman with lust? Have you ever lied in your life? Have you hated someone? The chances are good that you would say, yes, of course. Now, let me ask you something hypothetical. If you were going out to buy something for your wife at the store and you see that the light is turning yellow, but thought you would rather speed it up, ending up going over the red. Would that be breaking a law? Of course it would. You would be guilty of a law that says that we are not to drive through a red light. Very simple. What if an officer saw you, caught up with you, and started writing you a fine? Would it work to tell him anything else other than what he saw with his own two eyes? Would you not have to admit that you did take a chance being caught red-handed? The reality is that God by they were made commandments written, shortened it for us. Commandments has given us laws to abide for our protection. The 10 in Exodus 20. In fact, he, he summed it up in 2 Matthew 22, 36 to 40. 36 master, which is the great commandment in the law. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. 39 and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. 40. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You can use simple logic to see how this would basically cover the Ten Commandments we are all familiar with. Maybe you would say at this stage, but I love God and I love my neighbors. Well, this may be true to your standards, but what are his standards? You see, Jesus said that if you only look at a woman with lust, you are an adulterer. If you hate someone, you are a murderer. We cannot ask God to meet our standards. He is God after all. We have to meet His. Because we have broken His law from birth, we have to answer for that sin. Just like you would then have to pay for that fine when you went through the red light. Somebody has to pay. You may think at this stage, why can He not give me a break? Well, if God gave you a break, He would then have to give everyone a break. The word says that he is a righteous judge. That means he is fair. He does not have favorites, and he judges fairly. Let's read what 1 John 3 says about the law. 1 John 3, 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. Now the word says that there is a terrible punishment for sin. Romans 6, 23, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Did you see that? Death. We know God keeps his word. 
This means, if you break his laws, and we have now successfully concluded that you most definitely have had since birth, then your punishment is death. God is holy, and he is pure and righteous. However, he says that he does not delight in the death of anyone. 2 Peter 3 9 9 The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There you have it. He does not want you to perish, but he wants you to come to repentance. However, just like any other judge, should you have to stand before one, would want more than just sorry. Sorry is a good place to start, but that just will not cut it. And if a human judge would not be okay with that, why would the Almighty God, who is not only the judge, but the one whom you have transgressed against? David said the following when he repented, Psalm 51, 4 through 5. For against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. For I behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. He says, I have sinned against you. That is the first acknowledgement we have to make. You have sinned against him, and you stand guilty before him, and because you are guilty, he would be justified in sentencing you to death, which is eternal damnation in hell forever. A lot of people think that to repent is to change our minds, but it is in fact making a 180 degree turn into the opposite direction of how you used to live. It is not just changing your mind, it is changing your life. In your sin you walked away from God, but when you repent, you walk towards God. Jesus came to save us from our sin. Repent is G3340, which means change your mind, change the inner man, to think differently. When you repent, it means to change your mind, to ask God for forgiveness for your sins against Him and others. If you change your mind from doing something, will you be doing it? No, it speaks of a change of heart and actions. God knew that you would never be able to make up for sinning against Him. What could you possibly do to make right the wrongs you have done to others and to Him? Even though He said the wages of sin is death, He also said something else after that. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Picture this scenario if you will. You are standing in the court of law before the judge, ready to be sentenced on the basis of your guilt. You have indeed gone through the red light, but you have no way of paying that fine. But the judge says to you, I know you cannot pay this, so I will help you out. My son will pay your debt. We have done much more against God than just driving through a red light. The word says that we have all sinned. At this juncture, I have to caution you about the two-sided coin of forgiveness. Jesus said that when we pray, the Our Father, that we must ask him to forgive us, in the same way as we have forgiven those who have trespassed against us. He then also later spoke to his disciples after they asked him how often they need to forgive, telling them 70 by 7, which basically means that there is no limit. Then he tells them this story of a ruler who had this man that owed him an extravagant amount of money. His men brought this man who owed him this great debt to him, and when asked to pay, the man begged for mercy. He had no way of ever paying this debt. The ruler had pity on this man and told him that he is pardoned of this debt. Well, it did not take long for this very same man, in fact whilst he was leaving the ruler's house, to stop someone who owed him money, grabbed him by the neck, and demanded that he pay him. This man forgot the great debt that he owed the ruler, that was pardoned. He did not show the same mercy that was given to him, in fact he cast him into prison. This ruler did not take kindly to this when his men came to tell him about this. He confronted this unforgiving man and asked him whether he should not have also shown the same mercy than what he received. This story is written in Matthew 18. Let's read what his end was. Matthew 18, 34, 35. 34. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Your repentance and asking for forgiveness will simply fall on deaf ears. God will not hear you if you hold a grudge or are unforgiving towards another. It does not matter whether that person is an unbeliever. He says in his word, Be angry, but do not sin in your anger, 
and also do not let the sun go down on your anger. Ephesians 4, 26. In Romans 12, he says that we must leave room for vengeance, because vengeance is his. With this, I caution you to make sure that you have forgiven all. In Hebrews 12, we are told that we are to follow peace with all man and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Romans 3, 23, 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now the debt we owe God is our life. Remember, the wages of sin is death. God, the Heavenly Father, says, I will pay your debt. I will send my Son to die on a cross for your sin. He will die in your place so that you may go free. However, you have to accept the price he paid, knowing that when he gave his life for your life so that you do not have to die, he also bought you with his blood. 1 Corinthians 6, 20, 20. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. I would be giving you half a gospel if I did not give you all of it, which would not make it the gospel at all. So, being bought with the price of his blood means that you cannot now anymore go out and do as you want. You now no longer belong to yourself. You are his. When you accept this price, he paid for you. You, in fact, give your life to him, to live for him. A life for a life. With this blood of his son, he bought you. He is saying to you, I want you to know that I bought you out of slavery to sin. Not that you would be my slave, but that you would be my son or daughter. I love you, and I do not want sin to separate us, but it does. The only way to me is through my son, so that when you stand before me, you will be washed, because I am holy. This is what repentance is, to embrace his death, and to lay your life down and turn towards him with your whole being. A lot of people call this works, but when you repent, you are actually saying, I am going to stop sinning. How is stopping to sin works? If I stop something, that means I am not doing it. John 3, 16, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God loves you. He formed you in your mother's womb and has always desired a personal relationship with you. He wants you to be his son daughter, and he wants to be your father, a real father. He wants you to be with him, but because he is holy, you too have to be holy. The question is, how do I get saved? Just like you were born of the flesh and water had to break, so you too in the spirit are born when you go through the water. And what water is this? Jesus was talking about being baptized. He is saying here that those who are only born of the spirit but were never baptized will only see the kingdom of God. This means that they will live in paradise. These are those who will be going through the seal's judgment of six years, who will be raptured in the seventh year of rest, as we have discussed in this book. This is the place he has prepared for you that we read in John 14. But should you still have time and the tribulation has not started, you can enter his kingdom if you are born again and baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. To enter his kingdom is to enter into the third heaven. This is great news. Not only are you being washed with the blood of his son, but you are washed with water too. When we enter the waters of baptism, we are proclaiming the gospel message, which is that Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and lives again. Baptism is identification of ourselves with him. Romans 6, 3-4 Three, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? For therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. If you believe that baptism in water is not really that important, this scripture shows you that there is no other way to be buried with Christ. When you go down into the water, it is like being buried. The old you, or the old man, is being buried under the water. So you being born by the Spirit is your first step. Being born of water is your second. It is both a burial and a birth. When you come out of the water, a new man, like Jesus when he was raised from the dead, is risen. In this way, you are identifying with his death, burial, and resurrection. This is an open declaration to the world and to the forces of darkness that you are no longer the same man and no longer belong to them, but to the one that bought you with his blood. Being raised up out of the water expresses our new life in Christ and our union with him. Romans 6, 1-2 
One, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Romans 6, 6-8-11. 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. 7. For he that is dead is freed from sin. 8. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. This does not mean we are perfect and no longer sin. What it means is that sin no longer has dominion over us. Remember, he came to save you from your sin. Sin was your slave master, but he came and bought you with his blood. You are now no longer under the control and dominion of sin, but under the grace of God. Listen to what it says in Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, 26-27, 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, 27, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. This is not an occasional sin, but a continuous and habitual willful sin. However, when we do this occasional sin, the Bible says that we have an advocate with the Father. 1 John 2, 1. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. This is not about the initial repentance. That repentance was in conjunction with the water baptism unto the remission of sin. This is for when you occasionally sin after that, and not habitual willful sin. Here we are told to confess our sin, not to repent, having already repented at the start of our new life in Him. This we read in 1 John. 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Once we have repented of our sins and have been baptized in water, we no longer have to repent, but now confess our sins also to one another and die daily. That is different to repentance. Now we walk by the Spirit and no longer by the flesh. Therefore we purify ourselves daily as we read in 1 John 3. 1 John 3, 5-9, 3. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. This purifieth is G53, which means to make clean, purify self. This is dying to self daily, our covenant with Christ, when he gave his life for us through his death, burial, and resurrection, and we now give our life daily to him. So let's read further. Five and ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. He was not manifested to forgive our sins, he was manifested to take away our sins. Then it says something beautiful, in him is no sin. Are we not when we are baptized in Jesus' name, being buried in his death, and are we not in him? 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. As little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. What? Do you see that? Remember, this is not talking about those occasional sins that we confess. This is specifically talking about those who willfully sin on a habitual basis. They are not of God, but of the devil. This is a very harsh word, especially if we think of how many Christians who say they are born again keep on sinning without a care and do so habitually. God is not mocked. We read further 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. If we truly embrace Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and not just say we believe it, but have truly changed our ways, we will still have an occasional sin, but not willfully do it. However, if we are filled with the Spirit, we will find that our life of sin will not be there anymore. It does not mean I will not make a mistake, but I am not living that life of sin anymore. I am united with His death, buried with Him in baptism, and have received the gift of holiness and righteousness, which is the Holy Ghost. In Acts 22, Paul was giving his testimony of what happened to him in Acts 9 at his conversion. The Lord gives Ananias instructions to go to Paul and lay his hands on him, that he may receive his sight. Then Ananias tells him the following, Acts 22:16. 16. And now why tarriest thou? 
Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. We can receive the Holy Spirit without being baptized. Many people have experienced this, but God still requires the baptism of water for the remission of sin in the name of Jesus Christ. Cornelius is an example who was the first Gentile to receive the Holy Ghost. Peter was sitting on the roof, and he received the vision of the sheet with all the unclean animals, which was God saying that he desires that all would come to salvation, which included the Gentiles. So then Peter says something profound in Acts 10, Acts 10, 47-48. Can any man forbid water, that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. How baptism relates to Jesus. 1. It means we have turned from the old life of sin to a new life in Jesus Christ. 2. It means we are publicly identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. 3. It means we are openly joining the ranks of those who believe in Christ. In summary, as you are standing in the water, your old man died on the cross through repentance. Being lowered in the water, you become dead to sin. As you are raised out of the water, you are raised up by the Holy Spirit, a new man. In whose name? In this section, I would like to show you the revelation of whose name we are to be baptized in. Should you wonder, it does make a difference. We find in Luke 3.3 how before Jesus came onto the scene, John the Baptist was baptizing people. Luke 3.3.6 3. And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. For as it is written in the book of the words of Esaias the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth. 6. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. This seeing of the salvation of God is speaking of the end of the sixth seal, where the Ancient of Days and the Lamb of God will be coming down on Mount Zion. This is when they will see it. What was John doing to prepare them to see the salvation of God? He was calling everyone to repentance and to be baptized. Let's read what the Lord said of John the Baptist. Luke 1, 76-79, 76, And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, 77, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins, 78, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, 79, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. We have to remember what happens during the tribulation of seals, which is the Gospel of Mark, Rapture Group. Mark 13, 12. Now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father the son, and children shall rise up against their parents, and shall cause them to be put to death. The ministry of John the Baptist, which will be those chosen to work during this time, will not only be to call people to repentance and to be baptized, but also to turn the fathers and sons, mothers and daughters to each other, and bring restitution. This is what will be required among other things, of those who will be left behind, having to be purified with the fire of the tribulation to prepare them for his coming on Mount Zion and the rapture. We find, however, that John refused to baptize those who have not repented and did not have the fruit worthy of repentance. Luke 3, 7, 8. 7 Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come, Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you, that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. The reality is, that if you get baptized without truly repenting, all you will really get is wet. We have to have repentance before water baptism for the remission of sin. When we repent of our sins, the blood of Jesus covers our sin, and the robe we have on will have his blood on it will not be white even though our sins are covered. We have to wash our robe to make it gorgeous white with the water of baptism. This baptism with water is done in Jesus Christ's name for the remission of sins. What does the word remission mean? 
This is Strong's word, G859, which means pardon, forgiveness, freedom, and liberty. Forgiveness. This is why when we are baptized, the flesh is circumcised by faith and we no longer walk in sin. Jesus did not only come to forgive us of our sin, but destroy sin in our lives. If I have a stain on my robe and I cover the stain with blood, would I still see the stain? No, I would not. It would be under the blood. When we repent, immediately and supernaturally, the blood of Jesus is applied to your life. God can no longer see your sin. He atones for your sin. The blood cleanses us. But do we want the stains covered with blood left there, even spiritually? No. Although our sins are cleansed, we are still wearing the same garment. This is the baptism of repentance that John the Baptist preached. But Jesus comes to bring remission of sins, not just through repentance, but water baptism as well, by being buried with Christ. When we go in with our garment with the blood stains, in the water of baptism, all stains are removed and we are made white and clean. All has been removed. John 5, 14, 14. Afterward Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. This is the definition of repentance. Once you repent, you sin no more. When you do, a worse thing will come unto you. This is why people who have repented before and have sinned again, their state was worse than before. Without the shed blood of Jesus, which is his grace, there is no remission. There is no forgiveness. However, you need to see that it is not just repentance that is required, but also water baptism for the remission of sins. Remember what the water baptism stands for. It is your identification with the burial of Christ, which is the circumcision of the flesh. The difference between those who repent and do not get baptized and those who repent and get baptized is that according to John 3, the one will only see the kingdom of God, which means they will go to paradise, and the other will enter into the kingdom of God, which is the third heaven. In that scripture, a distinction was made by the Lord himself to Nicodemus, saying clearly what the result of each will be. Let's read further about in whose name we are to be baptized in. Acts 2, 38, 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I want you to consider the time period and the type and shadow that it is for us. This is right after Pentecost, which according to our understanding is right about when the tribulation will start. So this would make this the beginning of Seal's judgment, which is the Mark Left Behind group. This baptism that we see next in Matthew 28 is different. Matthew 28, 19, 19, Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. But let's just first confirm why baptism in this period is so important. When did the gospel of repent, be baptized, and receive the Holy Ghost begin? At Pentecost. Jesus first had to die and be raised for this to be applicable. The gospel was being fulfilled and preached by these three different acts. Repentance, baptism, and receiving the Holy Ghost. But in whose name? In the name of Jesus, and not in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You will not find the same wording in Luke or Mark of being baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Remember, Acts is the time period of Mark, the left-behind group, which speaks of being baptized only in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, but Matthew is written to the Jews. Once Jesus returns in the end, feet down on the Mount of Olives, it will then be in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Because everybody has been taught from Matthew, they are adamant that this is the only way. Every time someone was baptized in the book of Acts, it was in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. This is why baptism is a type and shadow of being circumcised in the flesh. The sin nature dies within the burial into the water. If there is one person synonymous to the word baptism, it is John the Baptist. John the Baptist is spoken of in Luke. We have to remember that Luke says in chapter 1 that he has perfect understanding and that he knows all things in order. Luke 3, 7, 7. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. He is preparing them all to repent before the wrath to come. What is this wrath to come? 
This wrath to come, G3709, is exactly the same wrath that we read about in Revelation 6, 16, with exactly the same Strong's Concordance number. Revelation 6, 16, 16, And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, proving to us that this time period is at the end of the sixth seal, when the Lamb of God shall return on Mount Zion with the Ancient of Days. Just as John the Baptist began his ministry about six months before Jesus came to be baptized, so shall this end-time John type and shadow prophet show up about six months before the end of the sixth year of the seal's judgment. He will restore families before the rapture. As we read in Malachi, Malachi 4, 5-6, Five, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. This is just as Jesus' ministry never truly or officially began until after John was beheaded. Almost exactly one year later, it shows us the exact same timing in the end. That one year later, the time of the seventh year rest is the time the 144,000 will be sealed, the rapture then happening, and finally the seventh seal of about six months. This will be before Christ having come on Mount Zion and officially begin his final 3.5 years of ministry during the first half of trumpets. Right after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, the people came to Peter and said, What must we do? To which he said in chapter 2, 38, Repent and be baptized, every one one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. After you have been buried, you have to be raised out of the water or the tomb into new life, resurrection life. Jesus was raised by the power of the Holy Ghost. We see in Jesus' baptism, the heavens opened, and John saw the Holy Spirit as a dove come upon Jesus. Receive the Holy Spirit. God does not leave us to our own to stop sinning and reckoning ourselves dead to sin, as we read in Romans 6. He has promised to give us a helper, the Holy Spirit. Jesus did not only come to forgive us our sins, but destroy it. We read in John 1 the following. John 1, 29-34. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel, therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. 33. And I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending, and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. 34. And I saw, and bear record, that this is the Son of God. John said two things about Jesus. 1. He is coming to take away the sin of the world. Verse 29. 2. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. John the Baptist did two things. 1. He preached repentance. 2. Remission of sins through water baptism. For us, our acceptance is not only believing this, but we have to follow through with this. This is not a work. Jesus makes this clear right through the scriptures. If you want remission of sins, you need to repent and be baptized. We read about Philip in Acts 8 that we're baptizing people after they have repented. Acts 8, 12 to 17, 12. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip, and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. 15. Who, when they were come down, prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Ghost. You have to understand, just because you believe does not automatically mean that you have received the Holy Ghost. There are some that believed with repentance and did receive the Holy Ghost. But just because you believe it does not mean you have received it. It has to be accompanied with repentance. They sent for the apostles to come and pray for them. 
16, for as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Repent, be baptized and receive. It can also be repent, receive, be baptized, but none can be omitted. Acts 18, 24-26, 24, and a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man, and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. 25. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. This man was mighty in scriptures, fervent in the Spirit, and spoke and taught the things of the Lord. This was a man of God. It says something interesting, knowing only of the baptism of John. Clearly, letting us know that there is a big difference between the baptism of John and the baptism of Jesus. Remember, John said that Jesus will come and baptize with fire. When you read on, you will see that what it says in the next verse is exactly what we are doing here. 26. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them, and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. It is not that we know everything, but we are expounding more perfectly as the Lord reveals to us in his word. In Acts 19, Paul was in Ephesus where they were teaching John's baptism. As Paul was walking, he saw these men and knew that they were disciples. He asked them something very important. Acts 19, 1-6, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul having passed through the upper coasts came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, second he said unto them, have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. For then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people, that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So Paul first asks whether they have been baptized with the Holy Spirit, and when they said they did not know anything about that, he took a step back and wanted to know what baptism they received, which was the baptism of John. This was Paul's answer as to why they have not, which means he knew that they had repented, but they needed to take it further. 6. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. The whole basis of this chapter is not just the fact that we have to repent, receive the Holy Spirit, and be baptized, but that we have to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. This is what we are told to do. This is not what we as a ministry are saying, but the scriptures are commanding it. A man with the name of Justin Martyr in the Roman Catholic Church in the third century changed water baptism into the name of the Father. Son and Holy Ghost, as we read in Matthew 28, where the early church only preached baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. So the question is, who do we want to follow, man or God? We have a responsibility to be faithful to Scripture. We are looking at what the Word is saying to us. But let's read a bit more about the infilling of the Holy Spirit. John 7, 37, 39, 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me, and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. This is Jesus' promise to us, that when we receive the Holy Spirit, it will not be like a dam or a well, but living water. It is a continual flow of the Holy Spirit within you. You sense this when others speak to you by the anointing as well as the authority with what they are speaking. So let's go to Luke 11 again. Luke 11, 10 to 13, 10. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, Will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? 
Do not think that someone has to lay their hands on you to receive the Holy Ghost. He is saying that you must ask, believe, and you will receive. It is good to have someone praying for you that is already filled with the Holy Ghost, but not necessary. It is not what is spoken over you when you are baptized, but what is actually happening when you are baptized. It may be that many people will not have someone to baptize them. What matters is that you go under the water, because it is in the action that you are being buried with Christ, and it is in the rising that you come up as a new man. Some may not have enough water to fill a tub or a river nearby, or pool, but if you can have enough water to make yourself completely wet, you have not been sprinkled, but baptized. God knows the sincerity of your heart, and He knows that you are doing it in obedience in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, having repented first. He knows the times that we are in. The Lord will fill you when you ask Him, and remember, He is the baptizer, not man. Look to Him and believe, and when you obey, do it with all your heart. 1 John 5, 7, 9 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he hath testified of his Son. If we omit any of these three, is there still an agreement? Just like you cannot take away from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the same way you cannot take away from the Spirit, infilling, the water, baptism, and the blood, repentance. They are one. If there is anybody reading this and you have not given your life to God, now is the time to do so and to repent of all your sin. Read this chapter again if you must. It is important that you understand that it is not God who wants you to go to hell, it is the enemy. God has made a way through His Son by dying on the cross for your sins so that you may have a living relationship with Him and be free from sin. He says in His Word that He wants you to be where He is. Repent of your sins with a sincere heart, believe in His Son, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and ask Him to fill you with His Holy Ghost and with fire. He will never leave or forsake you. And should you be one of those who are here during the seal's judgment, know that you cannot take the mark of the beast or worship him or have his name. You will have to die for your faith. Remember what Jesus told the thief on the cross next to him. The thief asked him to remember him, and Jesus, hearing the man's cry for salvation, told him that on the same day he will be with him in paradise. Paul said to die is gain, because absence of the body is to be present with the Lord. In one instance, your life will be taken, only for you to receive everlasting life with Him. Many prayers are before the Father for those who will be left behind, done not only through this ministry, but many family members and Christians all around this world. God will not ignore the prayers of the righteous. He has not forgotten you, although you may feel that way. He has purposed you to receive this book so that you may know that He has made a way for you, to prepare you, and now to use you, if you will let him. May the grace of God be upon you, and may you enter his kingdom. And if you are in the seal's judgment, may you see the kingdom of God and be in paradise. Amen. Proverbs 14, 26, 27. In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. 27. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, to depart from the snares of death. For a complete library of hundreds of free, one-click downloadable videos of all ministry-revealed in-depth teachings on the revelations contained in this book, and more, and many other resources, visit the Ministry Revealed website at www.ministryrevealed.com. Revelation 22.1 And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Second the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, 
for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign for ever and ever. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. 7. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things, and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. 13. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs, and sorcerers, and whoremongers, and murderers, and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, and the bright and morning star. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, and out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. 21. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.